The Riding Kid from Powder River. By Henry Herbert Nibs. Narrated by Storytime Audiobooks. Chapter 1. Young Pete. With the inevitable pinto or calico horse in his string the horse trader drifted toward the distant town of Cuncho, accompanied by a lazy cloud of dust, a slat-ribbed dog, and a knock-kneed foal that insisted on getting in the way of the wagon team. Strung out behind this indolently moving aggregation of desert adventurers plotted an indifferent lot of cayuses, their heads lowered and their eyes filled with dust. Young Pete, perched on a saddle much too large for him, hazed the tired horses with a professional high. Yah! Get in there, you doggone, honorary, three-legged polecat you! A gratuitous command, for the three-legged polecat referred to had no other ambition than to shuffle wearily along behind the wagon in the hope that somewhere ahead was good grazing, water, and chance shade. The trader was lean, rat-eyed, and of a vicious temper. Comparatively, the worst horse in his string was a gentleman. Horse trading and whiskey go arm in arm, accompanied by their co-partners, profanity and tobacco chewing. In the right hand of the horse trader is guile and in his left hand is trickery. And this squalid, slovenly booted, and sombrero gentleman of the outlands lived down to and even beneath all the vicarious traditions of his kind, a pariah of the waste places, tolerated in the environs of this or that desert town chiefly because of young Pete, who was popular. Despite the fact that he bartered profanely for Chuck at the stores, picketed the horses in pasturage already preempted by the natives, watered the horses where water was scarce and for local consumption only, and lied eloquently as to the qualities of his master's caviar when a trade was in progress. For these manful services young Pete received scant rations and much abuse. Pete had been picked up in the town of Enright, where no one seemed to have a definite record of his immediate ancestry. He was quite willing to go with the trader, his only stipulation being that he be allowed to bring along his dog, another denizen of Enright whose ancestry was as vague as were his chances of getting a square meal a day. Yet the dog, despite lean rations, suffered less than young Pete, for the dog trusted no man. Consequently he was just out of reach when the trader wanted to kick something. Young Pete was not always so fortunate. But he was not altogether unhappy. He had responsibilities, especially when the trader was drunk and the horses needed attention. Pete learned much profanity without realizing its significance. He also learned to chew tobacco and realized its immediate significance. He mastered the art, however, and became in his own estimation a man grown, a twelve-year-old man who could swear, chew, and show horses to advantage when the trader could not, because the horses were not afraid of young Pete. When Pete got kicked or cuffed he cursed the trader heartily. Once, after a brutal beating, young Pete backed to the wagon, pulled the rifle from beneath the seat, and threatened to kill the trader. After that the rifle was never left loaded. In his tough little heart Pete hated his master, but he liked the life, which offered much variety and promised no little romance of a kind. Pete had barely existed for twelve years. When the trader came along with his wagon and ponies and cajoled Pete into going with him, Pete gladly turned his face toward wider horizons and the great adventure. Yet for him the great adventure was not to end in the trading of horses and drifting from town to town all his life. Old man Annersley held down a quarter section on the Blue Mesa chiefly because he liked the country. Incidentally he gleaned a living by hard work and thrift. His homestead embraced the only water for miles in any direction water that the upland cattlemen had used from time immemorial. When Annersley fenced this water he did a most natural and necessary thing. He had gathered together a few head of cattle, some chickens, two fairly respectable horses, and enough timber to build a comfortable cabin. He lived alone, a gentle old hermit whose hand was clean to every man, and whose heart was tender to all living things despite many hard years in desert and range among men who dispensed such law as there was with a quick forefinger and an uncompromising eye. His gray hairs were honorable and that he had known no wastrel years. Nature had shaped him to a great, rugged being fitted for the simplicity of mountain life and toil. He had no argument with God and no petty dispute with man. What he found to do he did heartily. The horse trader camped near Kuncho, came to realize this. Old man Annersley was in need of a horse. One of his team had died that winter. So he unhooped the pole from the buckboard, 
rigged a pair of shafts, and drove to Kincho, where he heard of the trailer and finally located that worthy drinking at Tony's place. Young Pete, as usual, was in camp looking after the stock. The trader accompanied Annersley to the camp. Young Pete, sniffing a customer, was immediately up and doing. Annersley inspected the horses and finally chose a horse which young Pete roped with much swagger and unnecessary language, for the horse was gentle, and quite familiar with young Pete's professional vocabulary. This here animal is sound, safe, and a child could ride him asserted young Pete as he led the languid and underfed pony to the wagon. He's got good action. Pete climbed to the wagon wheel and mounted bareback. He don't pitch, bite, kick, or balk. The horse, used to being shown, loped a few yards, turned and trotted back. He neck reins like a cow hoss, said Pete, and he can turn in a ten cent piece. You can rope from him and he'll hold anything you get your rope on. Reckon he would, said Annersley and his eyes twinkled. Specially a hitch and rail. Get your rope on a hitch and rail and I reckon that hitch and rail would never get away from him. He's broke right, reasserted young Pete. He's none of your ornery, half-broke cayuses. You ought to seen him when he was a colt. Say, Kiwa and he no time afore he could outwork and outrun any hoss in our bunch. How old be you? queried Andersley. Twelve, going on thirteen. Huh. And the hoss? Oh, he's got a little age on him, but that don't hurt him none. Annersley's beard twitched. He must have been a colt for quite a spell. But I ain't looking for a cow hoss. What I want is a hoss that I can work. How does he go in harness? Harness. Say, mister, this here hoss can pull the kingpin out of a wagon without sweat and a hair. Hook him onto a plow and he sure can make the Olay plow smoke. Annersley shook his head. That's a mite too fast for me, son. I'd hate to have to stop at the end of every furrow and pour water on it there plow point to keep her cool. Course if you're looking for a cheap hoss, said young Pete, nothing abashed, why, we got him. But I was showing you the best in the string. Don't know that I want him. What you say he was worth? He's worth a hundred, to any man. But we're selling him cheap, for cash, forty dollars. Fifty, said the trader, and if he ain't worth fifty, he ain't worth putting a halter on. Fifty is giving him to you. So? Then I reckon I don't want him. I wa and he looking for a present. I was looking to buy a hoss. The trader saw a real customer slipping through his fingers. You can put a halter on him for a forty. Cash. Nope. Your partner here said forty, and Annersley smiled at young Pete. I'll look him over again for thirty. Young Pete knew that they needed money badly, a fact that the trader was apt to ignore when he was drinking. You said I could sell him for forty, or maybe less, for cash, complained young Pete, slipping from the pony and tying him to the wagon wheel. You go lay down. Growled the trader, and he launched a kick that jolted Pete into the smoldering campfire. Pete was used to being kicked, but not before an audience. Moreover, the hot ashes had burned his hands. Pete's dog, hitherto asleep beneath the wagon, rose bristling, anxious to defend his young master, but afraid of the traitor. The cowering dog and the cringing boy told Annersley much. Young Pete, brushing the ashes from his overalls, rose and shaking with rage, pointed a trembling finger at the traitor. You're a doggone liar. You're a doggone coward. You're a doggone thief. Just a minute, friend said Annersley as the trader started toward the boy. I reckon the boy is right, but we was talking hosses. I'll give you just forty dollars for the hoss, and the boy. Make it fifty and you can take em. The kid is no good, anyhow. This was too much for young Pete. He could stand abuse and scant rations, but to be classed as no good, when he had worked so hard and lied so eloquently, hurt more than mere kick or blow. His face quivered and he bit his lip. Old man Annersley slowly drew a wallet from his overalls and counted out forty dollars. That hoss ain't sound, he remarked and he recounted the money. He's got a couple of wind puffs, and he's old. He needs feeding and resting up. That boy your boy. That kid. Huh. I picked him up when he was starving to death over to and right. I've been feeding him and his no-account dog for a year, 
and neither of them is worth what he eats. So? Then I reckon you won't be missing him none if I take him along up to my place. The horse trader did not want to lose young Pete, but he did want Annersley's money. I'll leave it to him, he said, flattering himself that Pete dare not leave him. What do you say, son? And old man Annersley turned to Pete. Would you like to go along up with me and help me to run my place? I'm kinder lonesome up there, and I was thinking of getting a partner. Where do you live? queried Pete, quickly drying his eyes. Why, up in those hills, which don't no way smell of liquor and are telling the truth from sunup to sunup. Like to come along and give me a hand with my stock? You bet I would. Here's your money, said Annersley, and he gave the trader forty dollars. Get right in that buckboard, son. Hold on. Exclaimed the trader, the kid stays here. I said fifty for the outfit. I'm going asserted young Pete. I'm sick of getting kicked and cussed every time I come near him. He licked me with the rawhide last week. He did, eh? For why? Cause he was drunk, that's why. Then I reckon you come with me. Such as him ain't fit to raise young uns. Young Pete was enjoying himself. This was indeed revenge, to hear someone tell the traitor what he was, and without the fear of a beating. I'll go with you, said Pete. Wait till I get my blanket. Don't you touch nothing in that wagon. Stormed the trader. Get your blanket, son, said Annersley. The horse trader was deceived by Annersley's mild manner. As young Pete started toward the wagon, the trader jumped and grabbed him. The boy flung up his arms to protect his face. Old man Annersley said nothing, but with ponderous ease he strode forward, seized the trader from behind and shook that loose-mouthed individual till his teeth rattled and the horizon line grew dim. Get your blanket, son, said Annersley, as he swung the trader around, deposited him face down in the sand, and sat on him. I'm waiting. Going to kill him? queried young Pete, his black eyes snapping. Shucks, no. Can I kick him, jest honked, while you hold him down? Nope, son. That's too much like his way. You run along and get your blanket if you're going with me. Young Pete scrambled to the wagon and returned with a tattered blanket, his sole possession, and his because he had stolen it from a Mexican camp near and right. He scurried to the buckboard and hopped in. Annersley rose and brought the trader up with him as though the latter were a bit of limp tie rope. And now we'll be driftin', he told the other. Murder burned in the horse trader's narrow eyes, but immediate physical ambition was lacking. Annersley bulked big. The horse trader cursed the old man in two languages. Annersley climbed into the buckboard, gave Pete the lead rope of the recent purchase, and clucked to his horse, paying no attention whatever to the volley of invectives behind him. He'll get his gun and shoot you in the back, whispered young Pete. Nope, son. He'll just go and get another drink and tell everybody in Kincho how he's going to kill me, someday. I've handled folks like him frequent. You sure can fight! exclaimed young Pete enthusiastically. Never hit a man in my life. I never dast to, said Annersley. You just said on him, eh? Just said on him, said Annersley. You keep tight hold to that rope. That fool hoss acts like he wanted to go back to your camp. Young Pete braced his feet and clung to the rope, admonishing the horse with outland eloquence. As they crossed the arroyo, the lead horse pulled back all but unseating young Pete. Here, you! cried the boy. You quit that, afore my new pop takes you by the neck and the, pants and sits on you. That's the idea, son. Only next time, just tell him without cussing. He always cusses the hosses, said young Pete. Everybody cusses him. Most everybody. But a man what cusses a hoss is only cussin' his self. You're some young to get that, but maybe you'll recollect I said so. Some day. Didn't you cuss him when you set on him? queried Pete. For why, son? Why ain't you mad? Shucks, no. Don't you ever cuss? Not frequent, son. Cussin never pitched any hay for me. Young Pete was a bit disappointed. Didn't you never cuss in your life? Annersley glanced down at the boy. Well, if you promise you won't tell nobody, I did cuss onked when I struck the plow into a yellow jacket's nest which I wa and t aim and to hit, know how. 
had the reins round my neck, not expecting visitors, when them hornets come at me and the house without even ringing the bell. That team drugged me quite a spell afore I got loose. When I got enough dirt out of my mouth so as I could holler, I sat to and said what I thought. Cussed the hosses and the dog on a lay plow and them hornets, and everything. Exclaimed Pete. Nope, son, I cussed myself for hanging them reins round my neck. What you say your name was? Pete. What was the traitor calling you, any other name besides Pete? Yes, I reckoned he was. When he is good and drunk he would be calling me a doggone little, never mind, I know about that. I was meanin' your other name. My other name? I ain't got none. I'm Pete. Annersley shook his head. Well, partner, you'll be Pete Annersley now. Watch out that hoss don't jerk you out of your jacket. This here hill is a enterprising hill and leads right up to my place. Hang on. As I was saying, we're partners, you and me. We're going up to my place on the blue and tend to the critters and get washed up and have supper, and maybe after supper we'll mosey around so you can get acquainted with the ranch. Where'd you say your pop come from? I dunno. He ain't my real pop. Annersley turned and looked down at the lean, bright little face. You hungry, son? You bet. What you say if we kill a chicken for supper, and celebrate? You're Josh and me. Nope. I like chicken. And I got one that needs killin, a no account to lay hen what won't set and won't lay. Then we'll wring her doggone head off, eh? Something like that, only I ain't just hatin' that there hen. She ain't no good, that's all. Young Pete pondered, watching Annersley's grave, bearded face. Suddenly he brightened. I know. Nobody can tell when you're Josh in em, cause your whiskers hides it. Guess I'll grow some whiskers and then I can fool everybody. Old man Annersley chuckled, and spoke to the horses. Young Pete, happier than he had ever been, wondered if this good luck would last, if it were real, or just a dream that would vanish, leaving him shivering in his tattered blanket, and the horse trader telling him to get up and rustle wood for the morning fire. The buckboard topped the rise and leveled to the tree-girdled mesa. Young Pete stared. This was the most beautiful spot he had ever seen. Ring drowned by a great forest of spruce, the blue mesa lay shimmering in the sunset like an emerald lake, beneath a cloudless sky tinged with crimson, gold, and amethyst. Across the mesa stood a cabin, the only dwelling in that silent expanse. And this was to be his home, and the big man beside him, gently urging the horse, was his partner. He had said so. Surely the great adventure had begun. Annersley glanced down. Young Pete's hand was clutched in the old man's coat sleeve, but the boy was gazing ahead, his bright black eyes filled with the wonder of new fortunes and a real home. Annersley blinked and spoke sharply to the horse, although that good animal needed no urging as he plodded sturdily toward the cabin. Chapter 2 Firearms and New Fortunes For a few days the old man had his hands full. Young Pete used to thinking and acting for himself, possessed that most valuable but often dangerous asset, initiative. The very evening that he arrived at the homestead, while Annersley was milking the one tame cow out in the corral, young Pete decided that he would help matters along by catching the hen which Annersley had pointed out to him when he drove into the yard. Milking did not interest young Pete, but chasing chickens did. The hen, a slate-colored and maternal-appearing biddy, seemed to realize that something unusual was afoot. She refused to be driven into the coop, perversely diving about the yard and circling the outbuildings until even young Pete's ambition flagged. Out of breath he marched to the house. Annersley's rifle stood in the corner. Young Pete eyed it longingly, finally picked it up and stole gingerly to the doorway. The slate-colored hen had cooled down and was at the moment contemplating the cabin with head sideways exceedingly suspicious and ruffled, but standing still. Just as young Pete drew a bead on her, the big red rooster came running to assure her that all was well, that he would protect her, that her trepidation was unfounded. He blustered and strutted, declaring himself Lord High Protector of the hen yard and just about the handsomest thing in feathers, Bloom. Young Pete blinked, and rubbed his shoulder. The slate-colored hen sprinted for parts unknown. The big red rooster flopped once or twice and then gave up the ghost. 
He had strutted across the firing line just as young Pete pulled the trigger. The cow jumped and kicked over the milk pail. Old Annersley came running. But young Pete, the lust of the chase spurring him on, had disappeared around the corner of the cabin after the hen. He routed her out from behind the haystack, herded her swiftly across the clearing to the lean-to stable, and corralled her, so to speak, in a manger. Just as Annersley caught up with him, Pete leveled and fired, at close range. What was left of the hen, which was chiefly feathers, he gathered up and held by the remaining leg. I got her. He panted. Annersley paused to catch his breath. Yes, you got her. Gosh amity, son, I thought you had started in to clean out the ranch. You downed my rooster and you like to plug me in that heifer there. The bullet come singing along and plunked into the rain barlin most scared me to death. What in the Olay scratch started you on the war path, anyhow? Pete realized that he had overdone the matter slightly. Why, nothing, only you said we was to eat that hen for supper, and I couldn't catch the dog on a lace walker, so I just set to and plugged her. This here gun over and kicks something fierce. Well, I reckon you was meaning all right. But gosh amity. You might a killed the cow or me or something. Well, I got her, anyhow. I got her plum center. Yes, you sure did. And the old man took the remains of the hen from Pete and hefted those remains with a critical finger and thumb. One leg left, and a piece of the breast. He sighed heavily. Young Pete stared up at him, expecting praise for his marksmanship and energy. The old man put his hand on Pete's shoulder. It's all right this time, son. I reckon you wasn't meaning to murder that rooster. I only got one, and, he just run right in front of the hen when I cut loose. He might a knowed better. We'll go see. And Annersley plodded to the yard, picked up the defunct rooster and entered the cabin. Young Pete cooled down to a realization that his new pop was not altogether pleased. He followed Annersley, who told him to put the gun back in the corner. Got to clean her first, asserted young Pete. You look out you don't shoot yourself, said Annersley from the kitchen. Huh, came from the ambitious, young hunter of feathered game. I know all about guns, and this hero lay musket sure needs clean and bad. She liked to kick my dog on head off. They ate what was left of the hen, and a portion of the rooster. After supper Rannersley sat outside with the boy and talked to him kindly. Slowly it dawned upon young Pete that it was not considered a good form in the best families of Arizona to slay law-abiding roosters without explicit directions and permission from their owners. The old man concluded with a promise that if young Pete liked to shoot, he should someday have a gun of his own if he, in turn, would agree to do no shooting without permission. The promise of a real gun of his own touched young Pete's tough little heart. He stuck out his hand. The compact was sealed. Get a 30-30, he suggested. What do you know about 30-30s? Huh, I know lots. My other pop was telling me you could get a man with a 30 a whole heap farther than you could with any Olay 44 or them guns. I shot heaps of rabbits with his. Well, we'll see. But you want to get over the e day of getting a man with any gun. That goes with horse trading and liquor and such. But we sure aim to live peaceful, up here. Meanwhile, young Pete, squatting beside Annersley, amused himself by spitting tobacco juice at a procession of red ants that trailed from nowhere in particular toward the doorstep. Makes him sick, he chuckled as a lucky shot dissipated the procession. It's sure wasting cartridges on mighty small game, remarked Annersley. Don't cost nothing to spit on them, said young Pete. Not now. But when you get out of chewing tobacco, then where you going to get some more? To the store, I reckon. Huh. But where are you going to get the money? He was giving me all the chewing I wanted, said Pete. Huh. Well, I ain't got no money for chewing tobacco. But I tell you what, Pete. Now, say I was to give you a dollar a week for, for your wages. And say I was to get you one of them guns like you said, you couldn't shoot chewing tobacco in that gun, could you? Most anybody knows that. Laughed Pete. But you could buy cartridges with that dollar and shoot lots. Would you lick me if I bought you in? Shucks, no. I was just leaving it to you. When do I get that dollar, the first one? Annersley smiled to himself. P. 
Pete was shrewd and in no way inclined to commit himself carelessly. Horst Rating had sharpened his wits to a razor edge in dire necessity and hunger had kept those wits keen. Annersley was amused and at the same time wise enough in his patient, slow way to hide his amusement and talk with Pete as man to man. Why, you ain't been working for me a week yet. And come to think, that rooster was worth five dollars, every cent. What you say if I was to charge that rooster up to you? Then after five weeks you was to get a dollar, eh? Pete pondered this problem. Huh! He exclaimed suddenly. You ate more than half the truster, and some of the hen. All right, son. Then say I was to charge you two dollars for what you ate? Then, I guess beans is good enough for me. Anyhow, I never stole your rooster. I just shot him. Which is correct. Reckon we'll forget about that rooster and start fresh. The old man fumbled in his pocket and brought up a silver dollar. Here's your first week's wages, son. What you aim to do with it? Buy cartridges. Exclaimed Pete. But I ain't got no gun. Well, we'll be going to town right soon. I'll get you a gun, and maybe a scabbard so you can carry it on the saddle. Can I ride that hoss I seen out there? Queried Pete. What about riding the hoss you sold me? From what you said, I reckon they ain't no hoss can touch him, in this country. Pete hesitated on the thin edge of committing himself, tottered and almost fell, but managed to retain his balance. Sure, he's a good hoss. Got a little age on him, but that don't hurt none. I was thinking maybe you'd like that other cayuse of yours broke right. Looks to me like he needs some handling to make a first-class saddle hoss. The old man smiled broadly. Pete, like a hungry mosquito, was hard to catch. You can ride him, said Annersley course, if he pitches you, and the old man chuckled. Pitch me? Say, partner, I'm a ridin' son of a gun from Powder River and my middle name is Stick. I can ride em comin' and goin', crawl em on the run and bust em wide open every time they bit the dirt. Turn me loose and hear me howl. Just give me room and see me split the air. You want to climb the fence when I am a comin'? Where did you get that little song? Queried Annersley. Why, why? That's how the fellas shoot her over to the roundup at Magdalena and Flag. Reckon I been there. Well, don't you bust to lay Apache too hard, son. He's a mighty forgiving hoss, but he's got feelings. Huh. You're a Josh and me again. I seen your whiskers kinda wiggle. You think I'm scared of that hoss? Just a little mite, son. Or you wouldn't a sung that there high chin song. There's some good riders that talk lots. But the best riders I ever seen, just rode em, and said nothing. Like when you set on my other pop, eh? That's the E-Day. Pete, used to a rough and tumble existence, was deeply impressed by the old man's quiet outlook and gentle manner. While not altogether in accord with Annersley's attitude in regard to profanity and chewing tobacco, still, young Pete felt that a man who could down the horse trader and sit on him and suffer no harm was somehow worth listening to. Chapter 3. A Warning. That first and unforgettable year on the homestead was the happiest year of Pete's life. Intensely active, tireless, and resourceful, as are most youngsters raised in the West, he learned to milk the tame cow, manipulate the hayrake, distinguish potato vines from weeds and hoe accordingly, and through observation and Annersley's thrifty example, take care of his clothing and few effects. The old man taught Pete to read and to write his own name, a painful process, for young Pete cared nothing for that sort of education and suffered only that he might please his venerable partner. When it came to the plating of rawhide into bridle reins and reeds, the handling of a rope, packing for a hunting trip, reading a dim trail when tracking a stray horse, or any of the many things essential to life in the hills, young Pete took hold with boyish enthusiasm, copying Annersley's methods to the letter. Pete was repaid a thousandfold for his efforts by the old man's occasional, couldn't a done it any better myself, pardner. For Annersley seldom called the boy Pete now, realizing that pardner meant so much more to him. Pete had his rifle, an old carbine, much scratched and battered by the brushing rock, a 30-30 the old man had purchased from a cowboy in Kuncho. Pete spent most of his spare time cleaning and polishing the gun. 
he had a fondness for firearms that almost amounted to a passion. Evenings, when the work was done and Annersley sat smoking in the doorway, young Pete invariably found excuse to clean and oil his gun. He invested heavily in cartridges and immediately used up his ammunition on every available target until there was not an unpunctured tin can on the premises. He was quick and accurate, finally scorning to shoot at a stationary mark and often riding miles to get to the valley level where there were rabbits and jacks, that he occasionally bowled over on the run. Once he shot a coyote, and his cup of happiness brimmed, for the time being. All told, it was a most healthful and happy life for a boy, and young Pete learned, unconsciously, to ride, shoot, and tell the truth, as against reading, writing, and arithmetic for which he cared nothing. Pete might have gone far, become a well-to-do cattleman or rancher, had not fate, which can so easily wipe out all plans and precautions in a flash, stepped in and laid a hand on his bridle rein. That summer occasional riders stopped at the cabin, were fed and housed and went on their way. They came chiefly from the T-Bar T Ranch, some few from Kincho, a cattle outfit of the lower country. Pete intuitively disliked these men. Despite the fact that they rode excellent horses, sported gate wrappings, and joshed with him as though he were one of themselves. His instinct told him that they were not altogether friendly to Annersley. They frequently drifted into warm argument as to water rights and nesters in general, matters that did not interest young Pete at the time, who failed, naturally, to grasp the ultimate meaning of the talk. But the old man never seemed perturbed by these arguments, declining, in his good-natured way, to take them seriously, and feeling secure in his own rights, as a hard-working citizen, to hold and cultivate the allotment he had earned from the government. The T. Bar T. outfit especially grudged him the water that they had previously used to such good advantage. This water was now under fence. To make this water available to cattle would disrupt the homestead. It was at this time that young Pete first realized the significance of these hard-riding visitors. He was cleaning his much-polished carbine, sitting cross-legged round the corner of the cabin, when two of the chance visitors, having washed and discarded their chaps, strolled out and squatted by the doorway. Old man Annersley was at the back of the cabin preparing supper. One of the riders, a man named Gary, said something to his companion about running the old man out of the country. Young Pete paused in his task. You can't bluff him so easy, offered the companion. But a 30-30 keen talk business, said the man Gary, and he laughed. Pete never forgot the remark nor the laugh. Next day, after the riders had departed, he told his pop what he had heard. The old man made him repeat the conversation. He shook his head. Mostly talk, he said. They dasn't to start running us off, das they? queried young Pete. Mostly talk, reiterated Dannersley, but Pete saw that his pop was troubled. They can't bluff us, eh, Pop? I reckon not, son. How many cartridges you got? Young Pete thrilled to the question. Got ten out of the last box. You got any? Some. Reckon we'll go to town tomorrow. To get some cartridges? Maybe. This was young Pete's first real intimation that there might be trouble that would occasion the use of cartridges. The idea did not displease him. They drove to town bought some provisions and ammunition, and incidentally the old man visited the sheriff and retailed the conversation that Pete had overheard. Bluff, said the sheriff, whose office depended upon the vote of the cattlemen. Just bluff, Annersley. You hang on to what you got and they won't be no trouble. I know just how far those boys will go. Well, I don't, said Annersley. So I was just putting what you call bluff on record, case anything happened. The sheriff, secretly in league with the cattlemen to crowd Annersley off the range, took occasion to suggest to the T-Bar T foreman that the old man was getting cold feet, which was a mistake, for Annersley had simply wished to keep within the law and avoid trouble if possible. Thus it happened that Annersley brought upon himself the very trouble that he had honorably tried to avoid. Let the most courageous man even seem to turn and run and how soon his enemies will take up the chase. But nothing happened that summer, and it was not until the following spring that the T. Bar T. outfit gave any hint of their real intent. The anonymous litter was a vile screed, because it was anonymous and also because it threatened, an innuendo, 
to burn out a homestead held by one man and a boy. Annersley showed the letter to Pete and helped him spell it out. Then he explained gravely his own status as a homesteader, the law which allowed him to fence the water, and the labor which had made the land his. It was typical of young Pete that when a real hazard threatened he never said much. In this instance the boy did not know just what to do. That evening Annersley missed him and called, What you doin', partner? From the cabin, Annersley, as usual, was seated outside, smoking, came the reply, Countin' my cartridges. Annersley knew that the anonymous letter would be followed by some hostile act if he did not vacate the homestead. He wasted no time worrying as to what might happen, but he did worry about young Pete. If the cattlemen raided his place, it would be impossible to keep that young and ambitious fire-eater out of harm's way. So the old man planned to take Pete to Kincho the next morning and leave him with the storekeeper until the difficulty should be solved, one way or the other. This time they did not drive to Kincho, but saddled up and rode down the hill trail. And during the journey young Pete was unusually silent, wondering just what his pop plans to do. At the store Annersley privately explained the situation to the storekeeper. Then he told young Pete that he would leave him there for a few days as he was going over north a spell. Young Pete studied the old man with bright, blinking eyes that questioned the truth of this statement. His pop had never lied to him, and although Pete suspected what was in the wind, he had no ground for argument. Annersley was a trifle surprised that the boy consented to stay without demur. Annersley might have known that young Pete's very silence was significant. But the old man was troubled and only too glad to find his young partner so amenable to his suggestion. When Annersley left the store young Pete's so long, Pop, was as casual as sunshine, but his tough little heart was thumping with restrained excitement. He knew that his Pop feared trouble and wished to face it alone. Pete allowed a reasonable length of time to elapse and then approached the storekeeper. Give me a box of 3030s, he said fishing up some silver from his overall pocket. Where'd you get all of that money, Pete? Why, I done stuck up the famine of the tea bar tea on payday and made him shell out, said Pete. The storekeeper grinned. Here you be. Goin' hunt? Huh. Huntin' snakes. Honest, now. Where'd you get the change? My wages. Said young Pete proudly. Pop is giving me a dollar a week for helping him. We're partners. Your pop is right good to you, ain't he? You bet. And he can lick any ole bunch of cow chasers in this country. Somebody's going to get hurt if they monkey with him. Where'd you get the idea anybody was going to monkey with your dad? Young Pete felt that he had been incautious. He refused to talk further, despite the storekeeper's friendly questioning. Instead, the boy roamed about the store, inspecting and commenting upon saddlery, guns, canned goods ready-made clothing, and showcase trinkets, his ears alert for every word exchanged by the storekeeper and a chance customer. Presently two cowboys clumped in, joshed with the storekeeper, bought tobacco and ammunition, a most usual procedure, and clumped out again. Young Pete strolled to the door and watched them enter the adobe saloon across the way, Tony's place, the rendezvous of the riders of the high mesas. Again a group of cowboys arrived jesting and roughing their mounts. They entered the store, bought ammunition, and drifted to the saloon. It was far from payday, as Pete knew. It was also the busy season. There was some ulterior reason for so many riders assembling in town. Pete decided to find out just what they were up to. After supper he meandered across to the saloon, passed around it, and hid in an empty barrel near the rear door. He was uncomfortable, but not unhappy. He listened for a chance word that might explain the presence of so many cowboys in town that day. Frequently he heard Gary's name mentioned. He had not seen Gary with the others. But the talk was casual, and he learned nothing until someone remarked that it was about time to drift along. They left in a body, taking the Mesa Trail that led to the Blue. This was significant. They usually left in groups of two or three, as their individual pleasure dictated. And there was a business-like alertness about their movements that did not escape young Pete. The Arizona stars were clear and keen when he crept round to the front of the saloon and pattered across the road to the store. The storekeeper was closing for the night. Young Pete, 
restlessly anxious to follow the T-bar or T-men, invented an excuse to leave the storekeeper, who suggested that they go to bed. Got to see if my hoss is all right, said Pete. The Olay fools like to get tangled up in that there drag rope I done left on him. Reckon I'll take it off. Why, your dad was telling me you was a regular buckaroo. Thought you knew better than to leave a rope on a hoss when he's in a corral. I forgot, invented Pete. Won't take a minute. Then I'll wait for you. Run along while I get my lantern. The storekeeper's house was but a few doors down the street, which, however, meant quite a distance, as Concho straggled over considerable territory. He lighted the lantern and sat down on the steps waiting for the boy. From the corral back of the store came the sound of trampling hoofs and an occasional word from young Pete, who seemed to be a long time at the simple task of untying a drag rope. The storekeeper grew suspicious and finally strode back to the corral. His first intimation of Pete's real intent was a glimpse of the boy astride the big bay and blinking in the rays of the lantern. What you up to? queried the storekeeper. Young Pete's reply was to dig his heels into the horse's ribs. The storekeeper caught hold of the bridle. You get down and come home with me. Where are you going anyhow? Take your hand off that bridle, blustered young Pete. The trader had to laugh. Got spunk, ain't you? Now you get down and come along with me, Pete. No use you riding back to the mesa tonight. Your dad ain't there. You can't find him tonight. Pete's lip quivered. What right had the storekeeper, or any man, to take hold of his bridle? See here, Pete, where do you think you are going? Home. Shrilled Pete as he swung his hat and fanned the horse's ears. It had been many years since the pony had had his ears fanned, but he remembered early days and rose to the occasion, leaving the storekeeper in the dust and young Pete riding for dear life to stay in the saddle. Pete's hat was lost in the excitement, and next to his rifle, the old sombrero inherited from his pop was Pete's dearest possession. But even when the pony had ceased to pitch, Pete dared not go back for it. He would not risk being caught a second time. He jogged along up the Mesa Trail, peering ahead in the dusk, half frightened and half elated. If the T-Bar T outfit were going to run his pop out of the country, young Pete intended to be in at the running. The feel of the carbine beneath his leg gave him courage. Up to the time Annersley had adopted him, Pete had had to fight and scheme and dodge his way through life. He had asked no favors and expected none. His pop had stood by him in his own deepest trouble and he would now stand by his pop. That he was doing anything especially worthy did not occur to him. Partners always stuck. The horse, anxious to be home, took the long grade quickly, restrained by Pete, who felt that it would be poor policy to tread too closely upon the heels of the T-Bar T-Men. That they intended mischief was now only too evident. And Pete would have been disappointed had they not. Although sophisticated beyond his years and used to the hazards of a rough life, this adventure thrilled him. Perhaps the men would set fire to the outbuildings and the haystack, or even try to burn the cabin. But they would have a sorry time getting to the cabin if his pop were really there. Up the dim, starlit trail he plodded, shivering and yet elate. As he topped the rise he thought he could see the vague outlines of horses and men, but he was not certain. That soft glow against the distant timber was real enough, however. There was no mistaking that. The log stable was on fire. The horse fought a bit as young Pete trained him into the timber. Pete could see no men against the glow of the burning building, but he knew that they were there somewhere, bushed in the brush and waiting. Within a few hundred years of the cabin he was startled by the flat crack of a rifle. He felt frightened and the blood sang in his ears. But he could not turn back now. His pop might be besieged in the cabin alone and fighting a cowardly bunch of cowpunchers who dare not face him in the open day, but what if his pop were not there? The thought struck him cold. What would he do if he made a run for the cabin and found it locked and no one there? All at once Pete realized that it was his home and his stock and hay that were in danger. Was he not a partner in Pop's homestead? Then a thin red flash from the cabin window told him that Annersley was there. Following the flash came the rip and roar of the old rifle. Concealed in the timber, Pete could see the flames licking up the stable. Presently a long tongue of yellow shot up the haystack. The doggone snake stun fired our hay. He cried, 
and his voice caught in a sob. This was too much. Hay was a precious commodity in the high country. Pete yanked out his carbine, loosed a shot at nothing in particular, and rode for the cabin on the run. We're coming Pop, he yelled, followed by his shrill yip. Yip. We're all here. Several of the outlying cowpunchers saw the big bay rear and stop at the cabin as young Pete flung out of the saddle and pounded on the door. It's me, Pop. It's Pete. Let me in. Annersley's heart sank. Why had the boy come? How did he know? How had he managed to get away? He flung open the door and dragged Pete in. What you doing here? He challenged. I done lost my hat, gasped Pete. I, I was looking for it. Your hat? You gone loco? Get in there and lay down. And though it was dark in the cabin young Pete knew that his pop had gestured toward the bed. Annersley had never spoken in that tone before, and young Pete resented it. Pete was easily led, but mighty hard to drive. Nothing doin', said Pete. You can't boss me round like that. You said we was partners, and that we was both boss. I knowed they was comin' and I fanned it up here to tell you. I reckon we kin lick the hull of him. I got plenty cartridges. Despite the danger, old man Annersley smiled as he choked back a word of appreciation for Pete's stubborn loyalty and grit. When he spoke again Pete at once caught the change in tone. You keep away from the window, said Annersley. Them coyotes out there most like came to rush me when the blaze dies down. Reckon they'll risk setting fire to the cabin. I don't want to kill nobody, but, you keep back, and if they get me, you stay right still in here. They won't hurt you. Not if I get a beat on any of them," said young Pete, taking courage from his pop's presence. Did you shoot any of them yet, pop? I reckon not. I cut loose on or twicked, to scare them off. You keep away from the window. Young Pete had crept to the window and was gazing out at the sinking flames. Say, ain't we partners? He queried irritably. You said we was when you brung me up here. And partner stick, don't they? I reckon if it was my shack that was gettin' rushed, you'd stick, and not go belly in under the bunk and hidin' like a dog on prairie dog. That's all right, said Dan Ursley. But there's no use talking chances. You keep back till we find out what they're goin' to do next. Standing in the middle of the room, well back from the southern window, the old man gazed out upon the destruction of his buildings and carefully hoarded hay. He breathed hard. The riders knew that he was in the cabin that they had not bluffed him from the homestead. Probably they would next try to fire the cabin itself. They could crawl up to it in the dark and set fire to the place before he was aware of it. Well, they would pay high before they got him. He had fed and housed these very men, and now they were trying to run him out of the country because he had fenced a waterhole which he had every right to fence. He had toiled to make a home for himself, and the boy, he thought as he heard young Pete panting about the cabin. The cattlemen had written a threatening letter hinting of this, yet they had not dared to meet him in the open and have it out face to face. He did not want to kill, yet such men were no better than wolves. And as wolves he thought of them, as he determined to defend his home. Young Pete, spider-like in his quick movements, scurried about the cabin making his own plan of battle. It did not occur to him that he might get hurt or that his pop would get hurt. They were safe enough behind the thick clogs. All he thought of was the chance of a shot at what he considered legitimate game. While drifting about the country he had heard many tales of gunmen and border raids, and it was quite evident, even to his young mind, that the man who suffered attack by a gun was justified in returning the compliment in kind. And to this end he carefully arranged his cartridges on the floor, knelt and raised the window a few inches and cocked the old carbine. Annersley realized what the boy was up to and stepped forward to pull him away from the window. And in that brief moment young Pete's career was shaped, shaped beyond all question or argument by the wanton bullet that sung across the open, cut a clean hole in the window, and dropped Annersley in his tracks. The distant, flat report of the shot broke the silence, fired more in the hope of intimidating Annersley than anything else. Yet the man who had fired it must have known that there was but one place in the brush from where the window could be seen, and to that extent the shot was premeditated, with the possibility of its killing someone in the cabin. 
Young Pete heard his pop gasp and saw him stagger in the dim light. In a flash Pete was at his side. You hit, Pop? He quavered. There came no reply. Annersley had died instantly. Pete fumbled at his chest in the dark, called to him, tried to shake him, and then, realizing what had happened threw himself on the floor beside Annersley and sobbed hopelessly. Again a bullet whipped across the clearing. Glass tinkled on the cabin floor. Pete cowered and hid his face in his arms. Suddenly a shrill yell ripped the silence. The men were rushing the cabin. Young Pete's fighting blood swelled his pulse. He and Pop had been partners. And partners always stuck. Pete crept cautiously to the window. Halfway across the clearing the blurred hulk of running horses loomed in the starlight. Young Pete rested his carbine on the window sill and centered on the bulk. He fired and thought he saw a horse rear. Again he fired. This was much easier than shooting deer. He beard a cry and the drumming of hooves. Something crashed against the door. Pete whirled and fired point blank. Before he knew what had happened men were in the cabin. Someone struck a match. Young Pete cowered in a corner, all the fight oozing out of him as the lamp was lighted and he saw several men masked with bandanas. The old man's done for, said one of them, stooping to look at Annersley. Another picked up the two empty shells from Annersley's rifle. Where's the kid? asked another. Here, in the corner, said a cowboy. Must have been him that got right in Bradley. The old man only cut loose twicked, afore the kid come. Look at this. And dragging young Pete to his feet, the cowboy took the carbine from him and pointed to the three thirty-thirty shells on the cabin floor. The men were silent. Presently one of them laughed. Despite Pete's terror, he recognized the laugh. He knew that the man was Gary, he who had once spoken of running Annersley out of the country. It's a damn bad business, said one of the men. The kid knows too much. He'll talk. Will you keep your mouth shut, if we don't kill you? Queried Gary. Cut that out. Growled another. The kid's got sand. He downed two of us, and we take our medicine. I'm for fanning it. Pete, stiff with fear, saw them turn and clump from the cabin. As they left he heard one say something which he never forgot. Must have been Gary's shot that downed the Owani man. Gary knowed the layout and where he could get a line on the window. Pete dropped to the floor and crawled over to Annersley. Pop! He called again and again. Presently he realized that the kindly old man who had made a home for him, and who had been more like a real father than his earlier experiences had ever allowed him to imagine, would never again answer. In the yellow haze of the lamp, young Pete rose and dragging a blanket from the bed, covered the still form and the upturned face half in reverence for the dead and half in fear that those dead lips might open and speak. Chapter 4. Justice. Dawn bared the smoldering evidence of that dastardly attack. The stable and the lean-to, where Annersley had stored his buckboard and a few farm implements when winter came, the corral fence, the haystack, were feathery ashes, which the wind stirred occasionally as a raw red sun shoved up from behind the eastern hills. The chicken coop, near the cabin, had not been touched by the fire. Young Pete, who had fallen asleep through sheer exhaustion, was awakened by the cackling of the hens. He jumped up. It was time to let those chickens out. Strange that his pop had not called him. He rubbed his eyes, started suddenly as he realized that he was dressed, and then he remembered. He trembled, fearful of what he would see when he stepped into the other room. Pop! He whispered. The hens cackled loudly. From somewhere in the far blue came the faint whistle of a hawk. A board creaked under his foot and he all but cried out. He stole to the window, scrambled over the sill, and dropped to the ground. Through habit he let the chickens out. They rushed from the coop and spread over the yard, scratching and clucking happily. Pete was surprised that the chickens should go about their business so casually. They did not seem to care that his pop had been killed. He was back to the cabin before he realized what he was doing. From the doorway he saw that still form shrouded in the familiar old gray blanket. Something urged him to lift a corner of the blanket and look, something stronger held him back. He tiptoed to the kitchen and began building a fire. Pop would be getting breakfast, he whispered. Pete fried bacon and made coffee. He ate hurriedly, 
occasionally turning his head to glance at that still figure beneath the blanket. Then he washed the dishes and put them carefully away, as his pop would have done. That helped to occupy his mind, but his most difficult task was still before him. He dared not stay in the cabin, and yet he felt that he was a coward if he should leave. Paradoxically he reasoned that if his pop were alive, he would know what to do. Pute knew of only one thing to do, and that was to go to Kincho and tell the sheriff what had happened. Trying his best to ignore the gray blanket, he picked up all the cartridges he could find, and the two rifles, and backed from the room. He felt ashamed of the fear that drove him from the cabin. He did not want his pop to think that he was a coward. Partners always stuck, and yet he was running away. Goodbye, pop, he quavered. He choked and sobbed, but no tears came. He turned and went to look for the horses. Then he remembered that the corral fence was burned, that there had been no horses there when he went to let the chickens out. He followed horse tracks to the edge of the timber and then turned back. The horses had been stampeded by the flames and the shooting. Pete knew that they might be miles from the cabin. He cut across the mesa to the trail and trudged down toward Concho. His eyes burned and his throat ached. The rifles grew heavy but he would not leave them. It was significant that Pete thought of taking nothing else from the cabin, neither clothing, food, nor the money that he knew to be in Annersley's wallet in the bedroom. The sun burned down upon his unprotected head, but he did not feel it. He felt nothing save the burning ache in his throat and a hope that the sheriff would arrest the men who had killed his pop. He had great faith in the sheriff, who, as Annersley had it told him, was the law. The law punished evil doers. The men who had killed Pop would be hung, Pete was sure of that. Hatless, burning with fever and thirst, he arrived at the store in Concho late in the afternoon. A friendly cowboy from the low country joshed him about his warlike appearance. Young Pete was too exhausted to retort. He marched into the store, told the storekeeper what had happened, and asked for the sheriff. The storekeeper saw that there was something gravely wrong with Pete. His face was flushed and his eyes altogether too bright. He insisted on going at once to the sheriff's office. Now, you sat down and rest. Just stay right here and keep your eye on things out front, and I'll go get the sheriff. And the storekeeper coaxed and soothed Pete into giving up his rifles. Promising to return at once, the storekeeper set out on his errand, shaking his head gravely. Annersley had been a good man a man who commanded affection and respect from most persons. And now the tea bar tea men had got him. The storekeeper was not half so surprised as he was grieved. He had had an idea that something like this might happen. It was a cattle country, and Annersley had been the only homesteader within miles of Concho. I wonder just how much of this the sheriff knows already, he soliloquized. It's mighty tough on the kid. When Sheriff Sutton and the storekeeper entered the store they found young Pete in a stupor from which he did not awaken for many hours. He was put to bed and a doctor summoned from a distant town. It would have been useless, even brutal, to have questioned Pete, so the sheriff simply took the two rifles and the cartridges to his office, with what information the storekeeper could give him. The sheriff, who had always respected Annersley, was sorry that this thing had happened. Yet he was not sorry that young Pete could give no evidence. The cattlemen would have time to pretty well cover up their tracks. Annersley had known the risks he was running when he took up the land. The sheriff told his own conscience that it was just plain suicide. His conscience, being the better man, told him that it was just plain murder. The sheriff knew, and yet what could he do without evidence, except visit the scene of the shooting, hold a post-mortem and wait until young Pete was well enough to talk? One thing puzzled Sheriff Sutton. Both rifles had been used. So the boy had taken a hand in the fight? Several shots must have been fired, for Annersley was not a man to suffer such an outrage in silence. And the boy was known to be a good shot. Yet there had been no news of anyone having been wounded among the raiders. Sutton was preparing to ride to the blue and investigate when a T-Bar team man loped up and dismounted. They talked a minute or two. Then the cowboy rode out of town. The sheriff was no longer puzzled about the two rifles having been used. The cowboy had it told him that two of the T-Bar team men had been killed. That in each instance a 30-30, soft-nosed slug had done the business. 
Annersley's rifle was an old 48 I-2, shooting a solid lead bullet. When Sheriff Button arrived at the cabin he found the empty shells on the floor, noted the holes in the window, and read the story of the raid plainly. Annersley shot to scare him off, but the kid shot to kill, he argued. And damn if I blame him. Later, when young Pete was able to talk, he was questioned by the sheriff. He told of the raid, of the burning of the outbuildings, and how Annersley had been killed. When questioned as to his own share in the proceedings, Pete refused to answer. When shown the two guns and asked which was his, he invariably replied, both of them, nor could he be made to answer otherwise. Finally Sheriff Sutton gave it up, partly because of public opinion, which was in open sympathy with young Pete, and partly because he feared that in case arrests were made, and Pete were called as a witness, the boy would tell in court more than he had thus far divulged. The sheriff thought that Pete was able to identify one or more of the men who had entered the cabin, if he cared to do so. As it was, young Pete was crafty. Already he distrusted the sheriff's sincerity. Then, the fact that two of the T-Bar team men had been killed rather quieted the public mind, which expressed itself as pretty well satisfied that old man Annersley's account was squared. He or the boy had got two of the enemy. In fact, it was more or less of a joke on the T-Bar T outfit, they should have known better. An inquest decided that Annersley had come to his death at the hands of parties unknown. The matter was eventually shunted to one of the many legal sidings along the single-track law that operated in that vicinity. Annersley's effects were sold at auction and the proceeds used to bury him. His homestead reverted to the government, there being no legal heir. Young Pete was again homeless, save for the kindness of the storekeeper, who set him to work helping about the place. In a few months Pete was seemingly over his grief but he never gave up the hope that some day he would find the man who had killed his pop. In cow camp and sheep camp, in town and on the range, he had often heard reiterated that unwritten law of the outlands, if a man tried to get you, run or fight. But if a man kills your friend or your kin, get him. A law perhaps not as definitely worded in the retailing of incident or example, but as obvious nevertheless as was the necessity to live up to it or suffer the everlasting scorn of one's fellows. Some nine or ten months after the inquest young Pete disappeared. No one knew where he had gone, and eventually he was more or less forgotten by the folk of Kuncho. But two men never forgot him, the storekeeper and the sheriff. One of them hoped that the boy might come back someday. He had grown fond of Pete. The other hoped that he would not come back. Meanwhile the T-Bar T herds grazed over Annersley's homestead. The fence had been torn down, cattle wallowed in the mud of the waterhole, and drifted about the place until little remained as evidence of the old man's patient toil save the cabin. That young Pete should again return to the cabin and there unexpectedly meet Gary was undreamed of as a possibility by either of them, yet fate had planned this very thing, otherwise, argues the fatalist, how could it have happened? Chapter 5. A Change of Base. To say that young Pete had any definite plan when he left Concho and took up with an old Mexican sheep herder would be stretching the possibilities. And Pete Annersley's history will have to speak for itself as illustrative of a plan from which he could not have departed any more than he could have originated and followed to its final ultimatum. Life with the storekeeper had been tame. Pete had no horse, and the sheriff, taking him at his word had refused to give up either one of the rifles unless Pete would declare which one he had used that fateful night of the raid. And Pete would not do that. He felt that somehow he had been cheated. Even the storekeeper Roth discouraged him from using firearms, fearing that the boy might someday cut loose at somebody without word or warning. Pete was well fed and did not have to work hard, yet his ideas of what constituted a living were far removed from the conventions of Concho. He wanted to ride to hunt, to drive team, to work in the open with lots of elbow room and under a wide sky. His one solace while in the store was the array of rifles and six guns which he almost reverenced for their suggestive potency. They represented power, and the only law that he believed in. Some time after Pete had disappeared, the storekeeper, going over his stock, missed a heavy caliber six shooter. He wondered if the boy had taken it. Roth did not care so much for the loss of the gun as for the fact that Pete might have stolen it. 
Later Roth discovered a crudely printed slip of paper among the trinkets in the showcase. I took a gun and cartridges for my was. You never give me wages. Which was true enough, the storekeeper figuring that Pete's board and lodging were just about offset by his services. In paying Pete a dollar a week, Annersley had established a precedent which involved young Pete's pride as a wage earner. In making Pete feel that he was really worth more than his board and lodging, Annersley had helped the boy to a certain self-respect which Pete subconsciously felt that he had lost when Roth, the storekeeper, gave him a home and work but no pay. Young Pete did not dislike Roth, but the contrast of Roth's close methods with the large, free-handed dealings of Annersley was ever before him. Pete was strong for utility. He had no boyish sense of the dramatic, consciously. He had never had time to play. Everything he did, he did seriously. So when he left Kuncho at dusk one summer evening, he did not run away in any sense. He simply decided that it was time to go elsewhere, and he went. The old Mexican, Montoya, had a band of sheep in the high country. Recently the sheep had drifted past Kuncho, and Pete, alive to anything and everything that was going somewhere, had waited on the Mexican at the store. Sugar, coffee, flour, and beans were packed on the shaggy burrows. Pete helped carry the supplies to the doorway and watched him pack. The two sharp-nosed sheepdogs interested Pete. They seemed so alert, and yet so quietly satisfied with their lot. The last thing the old Mexican did was to ask for a few cartridges. Pete did not understand just what kind he wanted. With a secretiveness which thrilled Pete clear to the toes, the old herder, in the shadowy rear of the store, drew a heavy six-shooter from under his arm and passed it stealthily to Pete, who recognized the caliber and found cartridges for it. Pete's manner was equally stealthy. This smacked of adventure. Cattlemen and sheepmen were not friendly, as Pete knew. Pete had no love for the woolies, yet he hated cattlemen. The old Mexican thanked him and invited him to visit his camp below Kincho. Possibly Pete never would have left the storekeeper, or at least not immediately, had not that good man, always willing to cater to Pete's curiosity as to guns and gunmen, told him that old Montoya, while a Mexican, was a dangerous man with a six-gun, that he was seldom molested by the cattlemen, who knew him to be absolutely without fear and a dead shot. Huh. That old herder reigned no gunfighter. Pete had said, although he believed the storekeeper. Pete wanted to hear more. Most Mexicans ain't, replied Roth, for Pete's statement was half a challenge, half a question. But Jose Montoya never backed down from a fight, and he's had plenty. Pete was interested. He determined to visit Montoya's camp that evening. He said nothing to Roth, as he intended to return. Long before Pete arrived at the camp he saw the tiny fire, a dot of red against the dark, and he heard the muffled trampling of the sheep as they bedded down for the night. Within a few yards of the camp the dogs challenged him, charging down the gentle slope to where he stood. Pete paid no attention to them, but marched up to the fire. Old Montoya rose and greeted him pleasantly. Another Mexican, a slim youth, bashfully acknowledged Pete's presence and called in the dogs. Pete, who had known many outland camp fires, made himself at home sitting cross-legged and affecting a mature indifference. The old Mexican smoked and studied the youngster, amused by his evident attempt to appear grown up and disinterested. That gun, he poke you in the rib, hey? And Montoya chuckled. Pete flushed and glanced down at the half-concealed weapon beneath his arm. Tied her on with string, ain't got no shoulder holster, Pete explained in an offhand way. What you do with him? The old Mexican's deep-set eyes twinkled. Pete studied Montoya's face. This was a direct but apparently friendly query. Pete wondered if he should answer evasively or directly. The fact was that he did not know just why he had taken the gun, or what he intended to do with it. After all, it was none of Montoya's business, yet Pete did not wish to offend the old man. He wanted to hear more about gunfights with the cattlemen. Well, seen it's you, senor. Pete adopted the grand air as most befitting the occasion, I'm packin' this here gun to fight cowpunchers with. Reckon you don't know some cowpunchers killed my dad. I was just a kid then. Pete was now nearly fourteen, someday I'm going to get the man what killed him. Montoya did not smile. This muckacho evidently had spirit. Pete's invention, 
made on the spur of the moment, had hit plum center, as he told himself. For Montoya immediately became gracious, proffered pea tobacco and papers, and suggested coffee, which the young Mexican made while Pete and the old man chatted. Pete was deeply impressed by his reception. He felt that he had made a hit with Montoya, and that the other had taken him seriously. Most men did not, despite the fact that he was accredited with having slain two T. Barty cowboys. A strange sympathy grew between this old Mexican and the lean, bright-eyed young boy. Perhaps Pete's swarthy coloring and black eyes had something to do with it. Possibly Pete's assurance, as contrasted with the bashfulness and timidity of the old Mexican's nephew, had something to do with Montoya's immediate friendliness. In any event, the visit ended with an invitation to Pete to become a permanent member of the sheep camp, Montoya explaining that his nephew wanted to go home, that he did not like the loneliness of a herder's life. Pete had witnessed too many horse trades to accept this proposal at once. His face expressed deep cogitation, as he flicked the ashes from his cigarette and shook his head. I dunno. Roth is a pretty good boss. Course, he ain't no gunfighter, and that's kind of in your favor, what hombre say I make fight with gun? queried Montoya. Why, everybody? I reckon they's mighty few of them want to stack up against you? Montoya frowned. I don't talk like that, he said, shrugging his shoulders. Pete felt that he was getting in deep, but he had a happy inspiration. You don't have to talk. Your lay 44 is the talking I reckon. You come and cook? queried Montoya, coming straight to the point. I dunno, amigo. I'll think about it. Bueno. It is dark, I will walk with you to Concho. You think I'm a kid? flared Pete. If was dark when I come over here and it ain't any darker now. I ain't no doggone cowpuncher what's got to get on a hoss afore he dast go anywhere. Montoya laughed. You come tomorrow night, eh? Reckon I will. Then the camp will be over there, in the cannon. You will see the fire. I'll come over and have a talk anyway, said Pete, still unwilling to let Montoya think him anxious. Buenos noches. Montoya nodded. He will come, he said to his nephew. Then it is that you may go to the home. He is small, but of the very great courage. The following evening Pete appeared at the herder's camp. The dogs ran out, sniffed at him and returned to the fire. Montoya made a place for him on the thick sheepskins and asked him if he had eaten. Yes, he had had supper, but he had no blankets. Could Montoya let him have a blanket until he had earned enough money to buy one? The old herder told him that he could have the nephew's blankets, Pedro was to leave camp next day and go home. As for money, Montoya did not pay wages. Of course, for tobacco, or a coat or pants he could have the money when he needed them. Pete felt a bit taken aback. He had burnt his bridges, he could not return to Concho, yet he wanted a definite wage. I can pack, make and break camp, and sure cook the frijoles. Pop learned me all that, but he was paying me a dollar a week. He said I was just as good as a man. A dollar a week ain't much. The old herder shook his head. Not until I sell the wool can I pay. When do you sell that wool? when the pay for it is good. Sometimes I wait. Well, I can see where I don't get rich herdin' sheep. We shall see. Perhaps, if you are a good boy, you got me wrong, senor. Roth he said I was the limit, and even my old pop said I was a tough kid. I ain't doing this for my health. I hooked up with you cause I kinda thought, see? Well, Roth was telling as how you could make a six-gun smoke faster than most any hombre a livin'. Now, I was figuring if you would show me how to work this Olay smoke wagon here and Pete touched the huge lump beneath his shirt, why, that would kinda be like wages, but I ain't got no money to buy cartridges. I, Jose de la Crux Montoya, will show you how to work him. It is a big gun for such a chico. Oh, I reckon I can hold her down. When do we start the shootin' match? Montoya smiled. Manana, perhaps. Then that's settled. Pete heaved a sigh. But how am I going to get them cartridges? From the store. That's all right. But how many do I get for working for you? Montoya laughed outright. You will become a good man with the sheep. 
you will not waste the flour and the beans and the coffee and the sugar, like Pedro here. You will count and not say, oh, I think it's so much, and because of that I will buy you two boxes of cartridges. Two boxes, a hundred a month. Even so. You will waste many until you learn. Shake. Said Pete. That suits me. And if any dog on no lay brush cats or a lion or bear come poking around this here camp, we'll sure smoke em up. And if any of them cow chasers from the mountain or the concho starts monkeying with our sheep, there's sure going to be a cowboy funeral in these parts. You done hired a good man when you hired me. We shall see, said Montoya, greatly amused. But there is much work to be done as well as the shooting. I'll be there. Exclaimed Pete. What makes them sheep keep a moanin' and a bawlin' and a shufflin' round? Don't they never get to sleep? See, but it is a new camp. Tomorrow night they will be quiet. It is always so. Well, they sure make enough noise. When do we get going? Pedro, he will leave manana. In two days we will move the camp. All right. I don't reckon Roth would be looking for me in any sheep camp anyhow. Young Pete was not afraid of the storekeeper, but the fact that he had taken the gun troubled him, even though he had left a note explaining that he took the gun in lieu of wages. He shared Pedro's blankets, but slept little. The sheep milled and bawled most of the night. Even before daybreak Pete was up and building a fire. The sheep poured from the bedding ground and pattered down to the cannon stream. Later they spread out across the wide cannon bottom and grazed, watched by the dogs. Full fed and happy, young Pete helped Pedro clean the camp utensils. The morning sun, pushing up past the cannon rim, picked out the details of the camp one by one, the smoldering fire of cedar wood, the packs, saddles and ropes, the water cask, the lazy burrows waiting for the sun to warm them to action, the blankets and sheepskin bedding, and farther down the cannon a still figure standing on a slight rise of ground and gazing into space. The figure of Jose de la Crux Montoya, the sheep herder whom Roth had said feared no man and was a dead shot. Pete knew Spanish, he had heard little else spoken in Concho, and he thought that Joseph of the Cross was a strange name for a recognized gunman. But Mexicans always stick crosses over graves, soliloquized Pete. Maybe that's why he's got that fancy name. Gee. But this sure beats Tendon Store. Chapter 6. New Vistas. Much that Annersley had taught Pete was undone in the lazy, listless life of the sheep camp. There was a certain slow progressiveness about it, however, that saved it from absolute monotony. Each day the sheep grazed out, the distance being automatically adjusted by the coming of night, when they were bunched and slowly drifted back to the bedding ground. A day or two, depending on the grazing, and they were bedded in a new place as the herder worked toward the low country followed by a recurrent crispness in the air that presaged the coming of winter in the hills. Pete soon realized that, despite their seeming independence, sheepmen were slaves of the seasons. They followed the grass and fled from cold weather and snow. At times, if the winter was severe in the lower levels, they even had to winter feed to save the band. Lambs became tired or sick, unable to follow the use and Pete often found some lone lamb hiding beneath a clump of brush where it would have perished had he not carried it onto the flock and watched it until it grew stronger. He learned that sheep were gregarious, that a sheep left alone on the mesa, no matter how strong, through sheer loneliness would cease to eat and slowly starve to death. Used to horses, Pete looked upon sheep with contempt. They had neither individual nor collective intelligence. Let them once become frightened and if not immediately headed off by the dogs, they would stampede over the brink of an arroyo and trample each other to death. This all but happened once when Montoya was buying provisions in town and Pete was in charge of the band. The camp was below the rim of a cannon. The sheep were scattered over a mile or so of mesa, grazing contentedly. The dogs, outposted on either side of the flock, were resting, but alert. To the left. Some distance from the sheep, was the cannon rim and the trail, gate away by two huge boulders, man-high, with about enough space between them for a burrow to pass. A horse could hardly have squeezed through. Each night the sheep were headed for this pass and worked through, one at a time, stringing down the trail below which was steep and sandy. At the cannon bottom was water and across the shallows were the bedding grounds and the camp. 
feet, drowsing in the sun, occasionally glanced up at the flock. He saw no need for standing up, as Montoya always did when out with the band. The sheep were all right, and the day was hot. Presently Pete became interested in a mighty battle between a colony of red ants which seemed to be attacking a colony of big black ants that had in some way infringed on some international agreement, or overstepped the color line. Pete picked up a twig and hastily scraped up a sand barricade, to protect the red ants, who, despite their valor, seemed to be getting the worst of it. Black ants scurried to the top of the barricade to be grappled by the tiny red ants, who fought valiantly. Pete saw a red ant meet one of the enemy who was twice his size, wrestle with him and finally best him. Evidently this particular black ant, though deceased, was of some importance, possibly an officer, for the little red ant seized him and bore him bodily to the rear where he in turn collapsed and was carried to the adjoining ant hill by two of his comrades evidently detailed on ambulance work. Everybody scraps, even the bugs, said Pete. Them little red cusses sure ain't scared o' nothin'. Stream after stream of red ants hastened to reinforce their comrades on the barricade. The battle became general. Pete grew excited. He was scraping up another barricade when he heard one of the dogs bark. He glanced up. The sheep, frightened by a buzzard that had swooped unusually close to them, bunched and shot toward the cannon in a cloud of dust. Pete jumped to his feet and ran swiftly toward the rock gateway to head them off. He knew that they would make for the trail, and that those that did not get through the pass would trample the weaker sheep to death. The dog on the cannon side of the band raced across their course, snapping at the foremost in a sturdy endeavor to turn them. But he could not. He ran, nipped a sheep, and then jumped back to save himself from being cut to pieces by the blundering feet. Young Pete saw that he could not reach the pass ahead of them. Out of breath and half sobbing as he realized the futility of his effort, he suddenly recalled an incident like this when Montoya, failing to head the band in a similar situation, had coolly shot the leader and had broken the stampede. Pete immediately sat down, and rested the barrel of his six-shooter on his knee. He centered on the pass. A few seconds, and a big ram, several feet ahead of the others, dashed into the notch. Pete grasped his gun with both hands and fired. The ram reared and dropped just within the rocky gateway. Pute saw another sheep jump over the ram and disappear. Pute centered on the notch again and as the gray mass bunched and crowded together to get through, he fired. Another sheep toppled and fell. Still the sheep rushed on, crowding against the rocks and trampling each other in a frantic endeavor to get through. Occasionally one of the leaders leaped over the two dead sheep and disappeared down the trail. But the first force of their stampede was checked. Dropping his gun, Pute jumped up and footed it for the notch, waving his hat as he ran. Bleeding and bawling, the band turned slowly and swung parallel to the cannon rim. The dogs, realizing that they could now turn the sheep back, joined forces, and running a ticklish race along the very edge of the cannon, headed the band toward the safe ground to the west. Pete, as he said later, cussed him a plenty. When he took up his station between the band and the cannon, wondering what Montoya would say when he returned. When the old Mexican, hazing the burrows across the mesa, saw Pete wave his hat, he knew that something unusual had happened. Montoya shrugged his shoulders as Pete told of the stampede. So it is with the sheep, said Montoya casually. These we will take away, for the sheep will smell the blood and not go down the trail. And he pointed to the ram and the ewe that Pete had shot. I will go to the camp and unpack. You have killed two good sheep, but you have saved many. Pete said nothing about the battle of the ants. He knew that he had been remiss, but he thought that in eventually turning the sheep he had made up for it. And because Pete was energetic, self-reliant, and steady, capable of taking the burrows into town and packing back provisions promptly, for Pete, unlike most boys, did not care to loaf about town. The old herder became exceedingly fond of him, although he seldom showed it in a direct way. Rather, he taught Pete Mexican, colloquialisms and idioms that are not found in books, until Pete, who already knew enough of the language to get along handily, became thoroughly at home whenever he chanced to meet a Mexican, herder, cowboy, or storekeeper. Naturally, Pete did not appreciate the value of this until later, 
when his familiarity with the language helped him out of many a tight place. But what Pete did appreciate was the old herder's skill with the six-gun, his uncanny ability to shoot from any position on the instant and to use the gun with either hand with equal facility. In one of the desert towns Pete had traded a mountain lion skin for a belt and holster and several boxes of cartridges to boot, for Pete was keen at bargaining. Later the old Mexican cut down the belt to fit Pete and taught him how to hang the gun to the best advantage. Then he taught Pete to draw, impressing upon him that while accuracy was exceedingly desirable, a quick draw was absolutely essential. Pete practiced early and late, more than disgusted because Montoya made him practice with an empty gun. He threw down on moving sheep, the dogs, and occasional distant horsemen, and even on Montoya himself but never until the old herder had examined the weapon and assured himself that he would not be suddenly bumped off into glory by his ambitious assistant. As some men play cards, partly for amusement and partly to keep their hands in, so Pete and Montoya played the six-gun game, and neither seemed to tire of the amusement. Montoya frequently unloaded his own gun and making sure that Pete had done likewise, the old herder would stand opposite him and count, Una, Duo, Trey and the twain would go for their guns to see who would get in the first theoretical shot. At first Pete was slow. His gun was too heavy for him and his wrist was not quick. But he stuck to it until finally he could draw and shoot almost as fast as his teacher. Later they practiced while sitting down, while reclining propped on one elbow, and finally from a prone position, where Pete learned to roll sideways, draw and shoot even as a sidewinder of the desert strikes without coiling. Montoya taught him to throw a shot over his shoulder, to roll his gun, to pretend to surrender it, and, handing it out but first, flip it over and shoot the theoretical enemy. He also taught him one trick which, while not considered legitimate by most professional gunmen, was exceedingly worthwhile on account of its deadly unexpectedness, and that was to shoot through the open holster without drawing the gun. Such practice allowed of only a limited range never higher than a man's belt, but as Montoya explained, a shot belt high and center was most effective. Pete took an almost vicious delight in perfecting himself in this trick. He knew of most of the other methods, but shooting with the gun in the holster was difficult and for close-range work. And just in proportion to its difficulty Pete persevered, he was fond of Montoya in an offhand way. But with the lessons in gunmanship his fondness became almost reverence for the old man's easy skill and accuracy. Despite their increasing friendliness, Pete could never get Montoya to admit that he had killed a man, and Pete thought this strange, at that time. Pete's lessons were not always without grief. Montoya, ordinarily genial, was a hard master to please. Finally, when Pete was allowed to use ammunition in his practice, and insisted on sighting at an object, Montoya reproved him sharply for wasting time. It is like this, he would say, illustrating on the instant he would throw a shot into the chance target without apparent aim. Once he made Pete put down his gun and take up a handful of stones. Now shoot, he said. Pete, much chagrined, belted the stones rapidly at the empty can target. To his surprise he missed it only once. Now shoot him like that, said Montoya. Pete, chafing because of this kid stuff as he called the stone throwing, picked up his gun and threw five shots at the can. He was angry and he shot fast, but he hit the can twice. From that minute he caught on. Speed tended toward accuracy, premising one was used to the feel of a gun. And accuracy tended toward speed, giving one assurance. Even as one must throw a stone with speed to be accurate, so one must shoot with speed. It was all easy enough, like everything else when you had the hang of it. How often a hero of fiction steps into a story, or rides into it, whose deadly accuracy, lightning-like swiftness, appalling freedom from accident, ostrich-like stomach and camel-like ability to go without water, earn him the plaudits of a legion of admiring readers. Apropos of such a hero, your old-timer will tell you, that there ain't no such animal. If your old-timer is a friend, perchance carrying the never-mentioned scars of cattle wars and frontier raids, he may tell you that many of the greatest gunmen practiced early and late, spent all their spare money on ammunition, never showed off before an audience, always took careful advantage of every fighting chance, 
saved their horses and themselves from undue fatigue when possible, never killed a man when they could avoid killing him, bore themselves quietly, didn't know the meaning of romance, but were strong for utility, and withal worked as hard and suffered as much in becoming proficient in their vocation as the various artisan of the cities. Circumstances, hazard, untoward event, even inclination toward excitement, made some of these men heroes, but never in their own eyes. There were exceptions, of course, but most of the exceptions were buried. And young Pete, least of all, dreamed of becoming a hero. He liked guns and all that pertained to them. The feel of a six-shooter in his hand gave him absolute pleasure. The sound of a six-shooter was music to him and the potency contained in the polished cylinder filled with blunt-nosed slugs was something that he could appreciate. He was a born gunman, as yet only in love with the tools of his trade, interested more in the manipulation than in eventual results. He wished to become expert, but in becoming expert he forgot for the time being his original intent of eventually becoming the Avenger of Annersley. Pride in his ability to draw quick and shoot straight, with an occasional word of praise from old Montoya pretty well satisfied him. When he was not practicing he was working, and thought only of the task at hand. Pete was generally liked in the towns where he occasionally bought provisions. He was known as Montoya's boy, and the townsfolk had a higher respect for the old Mexican. One circumstance, however, ruffled the placid tenor of his way and tended to give him the reputation of being a bronco muckacho a rough boy, literally a bad boy as white folks would have called him. Montoya sent him into town for some supplies. As usual, Pete rode one of the burrows. It was customary for Pete to leave his gun in camp when going to town. Montoya had suggested that he do this, as much for Pete's sake as for anything else. The old man knew that slightly older boys were apt to make fun of Pete for packing such a disproportionately large gun, or, in fact, for packing any gun at all and Montoya also feared that Pete might get into trouble. Pete was pugnacious, independent, and while always possessing enough humor to hold his own in a wordy argument, he had much pride, considering himself the equal of any man and quite above the run of youths of the towns. And he disliked Mexicans, Montoya being the one exception. This morning he did not pack his gun, but hung it on the cross tree of the pack saddle. There were many brush rabbits on the mesa and they made interesting targets. About noon he arrived at the town, Laguna. He bought the few provisions necessary and piled them on the ground near his burrows. He had brought some cold meat and bread with him which he ate, squatted out in front of the store. Several young loafers gathered round and held high argument among themselves as to whether Pete was a Mexican or not. This in itself was not altogether pleasing to Pete. He knew that he was stand to a swarthy hue was naturally of a dark complexion, and possessed black hair and eyes. But his blood rebelled at even the suggestion that he was a Mexican. He munched his bread and meat, tossed the crumbs to a stray dog and rolled a cigarette. One of the Mexican boys asked him for tobacco and papers. Pete gladly proffered the makings. The Mexican youth rolled a cigarette and passed the sack of tobacco to his companions. Pete tied this breach of etiquette sternly, and received the sack back all but empty. But still he said nothing, but rose and entering the store, a rambling, flat-roofed adobe, bought another sack of tobacco. When he came out the boys were laughing. He caught a word or two which drove the jest home. In the vernacular, he was an easy mark. Maybe I am, he said in Mexican. But I got the price to buy my smokes. I ain't no doggone loafer. The Mexican youth who had asked for the tobacco retorted with some more or less vile language, intimating that Pete was neither Mexican nor white, an insult compared to which mere anathema was as nothing. Pete knew that if he started a row he would get properly licked, that the boys would all pile on him and chase him out of town. So he turned his back on the group and proceeded to pack the burrows. The Mexican boys forgot their recent unpleasantness in watching him pack. They realized that he knew his business. But Pete was not through with them yet. When he had the burrows in shape to travel he picked up the stick with which he hazed them and faced the group. What he said to them was enough with some to spare for future cogitation. He surpassed mere invective with flaming innuendos as to the ancestry, habits, and appearance of these special gentlemen and of Mexicans in general. 
he knew Mexicans and knew where he could hit hardest. He wound up with gentle intimation that the town would have made a respectable pigsty, but that a decent pig would have a hard time keeping his self-respect among so many descendants of the Canine tribe. It was a beautiful, an eloquent piece of work, and even as he delivered it he felt rather proud of his command of the Mexican idiom. Then he made a mistake. He promptly turned his back and started the burrows toward the distant camp. Had he kept half an eye on the boys he might have avoided trouble. But he had turned his back. They thought that he was both angry and afraid. They also made a slight mistake. The youth who had borrowed the tobacco and who had taken most of Pete's eloquence to heart, for he had inspired it, called the dog that lay back of them in the shade and set him on Pete and the burrows. If a burrow hates anything it is to be attacked by a dog. Pete whirled and swung his stick. The dog, a huge, lean, coyote-faced animal, dodged and snapped at the nearest burrow's heels. That placid animal promptly bucked and ran. His brother Burrow took the cue and did likewise. Presently the immediate half-mile square was decorated with loose provisions, sugar, beans, flour, a few cans of tomatoes, and chilies broken from the sack and strung out in every direction. The burrows became a seething cloud of dust in the distance. Pew chased the dog which naturally circled and ran back of the group of the store. Older Mexicans gathered and laughed. The boys, feeling secure in the presence of their seniors, added their shrill yelps of pleasure. Pete, boiling internally, white-faced and altogether too quiet, slowly gathered up what provisions were usable. Presently he came upon his gun, which had been balked from the pack saddle. The Mexicans were still laughing when he strode back to the store. The dog, scenting trouble, bristled and snarled, burying his long fangs and standing with one forefoot raised. Before the assembly realized what had happened, Pete had whipped out his gun. With the crash of the shot the dog doubled up and dropped in his tracks. The boys scattered and ran. Pete cut loose in their general direction. They ran faster. The older folk, chattering and scolding, backed into the store. Montoya's boy was loco. He would kill somebody. Some of the women crossed themselves. The storekeeper, who knew Pete slightly, ventured out. He argued with Pete, who blinked and nodded, but would not put up his gun. The Mexicans feared him for the very fact that he was a boy and might do anything. Had he been a man he might have been shot. But this did not occur to Pete. He was fighting mad. His burrows were gone and his provisions scattered, save a few canned tomatoes that had not suffered damage. The storekeeper started toward him. Pete centered on that worthy's belt buckle and told him to stay where he was. I'll blow a hole in you that you can drive a team through if you come near me. Asserted Pete. I come in here peaceful, and you doggone killers wrecked my outfit and stampeded my burrows, but they ain't no Mexican can run a whizzer on me twicked. I'm white, see. It is not I that did this thing, said the storekeeper. No, but the doggone town did. I reckon when Jose Montoya comes in and wants his grub, you'll settle all right and he's coming. Then you will go and not shoot anyone? When I get ready. But you can tell your outfit that the first cola that follows me is going to run up against a slug that'll bust him wide open. I'm going, but I'm coming back. Pete satisfied that he had conducted himself in a manner befitting the occasion, backed away a few steps and finally turned and marched across the mesa. They had wrecked his outfit. He'd show them. Old Montoya knew that something was wrong when the burrows drifted in with their pack saddles askew. He thought that possibly some coyote had stampeded them. He righted the pack saddles and drove the burrows back toward Laguna. Halfway across the mesa he met Pete, who told him what had happened. Montoya said nothing. Pete had hoped that his master would rave and threaten all sorts of vengeance. But the old man simply nodded, and plodding along back of the burrows, finally entered Laguna and strode up to the store. All sorts of stories were afloat, stories which Montoya discounted liberally, because he knew Pete. The owner of the dog claimed damages. Montoya, smiling inwardly, referred that gentleman to Pete, who stood close to his employer hoping that he would start a real row, but pretty certain that he would not. That was Montoya's way. The scattered provisions as far as possible were salvaged and fresh supplies loaded on the burrows. 
When Montoya was ready to leave he turned to the few Mexicans in front of the store, when I send my boy in here for flour and the beans and the sugar, it will be well to keep the dogs away, and to remember that it is Jose de la Crux that has sent him. For the new provisions I do not pay. Adios, señores. P thought that this was rather tame, but still Montoya's manner was decidedly businesslike. No one controverted him, not even the storekeeper, who was the loser. A small crowd had assembled. Excitement such as this was rare in Laguna. While still in plain sight of the group about the store, and as Montoya plodded slowly along behind the burrows, Pew turned and launched his Parthian shot, that eloquently expressive gesture of contempt and scorn wherein is employed the thumb, the nose, and the outspread fingers of one hand. He was still very much a boy. About a year later, after drifting across a big territory of grazing land, winter feeding the sheep near Largo, and while preparing to drive south again and into the high country, Pute met young Andy White, a clean-cut, sprightly cowboy riding for the Concho outfit. Andy had ridden down to Largo on some errand or other and had tied his pony in front of the store when Montoya's sheep billowed down the street and frightened the pony. Young Pete, hazing the burrows, saw the pony pull back and break the reins, whirl and dash out into the open and circle the mesa with head and tail up. It was a young horse, not actually wild, but decidedly frisky. Pete had not been on a horse for many months. The beautiful pony, stamping and snorting in the morning sun, thrilled Pete clear to his toes. To ride, anywhere, what a contrast to plodding along with the burrows. To feel a horse between his knees again. To swing up and ride, ride across the mesa to that dim line of hills where the sun touched the blue of the timber and the gold of the quaking aspen burned softly on the far woodland trail that led south and south across the silent ranges. Pute snatched a rope from the pack and walked out toward the pony. That good animal, a bit afraid of the queer figure in the flapping overalls and flop-brimmed sombrero, snorted and swung around facing him. Dragging his rope, Pute walked slowly forward. The pony stopped and flung up its head. Pete flipped the loop and sat back on his heels. The rope ran taut. Pete was prepared for the usual battle, but the pony, instead, came to the rope and sniffed curiously at Pete, who patted his nose and talked to him. Assured that his strange captor knew horses, the pony allowed him to slip the rope round his nose and mount without even sidling. Pete was happy. This was something like. As for Montoya and the sheep, they were drifting on in a cloud of dust, the burrows following placidly. You sure caught him slick. Pete nodded to the bright-faced young cowboy who had stepped up to him. Andy White was older than Pete, heavier and taller, with keen blue eyes and an expression as frank and fearless as the morning itself. In contrast, young Pete was lithe and dark, his face was more mature, more serious, and his black eyes seemed to see everything at a glance, a quick indifferent glance that told no one what was behind the expression. Andy was light-skinned and ruddy. Pete was swarthy and black-haired. For a second or so they stood, then White genially thrust out his hand. Thanks. He said heartily. You say them. It was a little thing to say and yet it touched Pete's pride. Deep in his heart he was a bit ashamed of consorting with a sheep herder, a Mexican and to be recognized as being familiar with horses pleased him more than his countenance showed. Yes. I handled them some, Drayton, when I was a kid. Andy glanced at the boyish figure and smiled. You're wasting good time with that outfit, and he gestured with his thumb toward the sheep. Oh, I dunno. Jose Montoya ain't so slow, with a gun. Andy White laughed. Old Crux ain't a bad old scout, but you ain't a Mexican. Anybody can see that. Well, just for fun, suppose I was. It would be different, said Andy. You're white, all right. Mean in my catching your cayuse. Well, anybody do that. They ain't nothing to drink but belly wash in this town, said Andy boyishly. But you come along down to the store and I'll buy. I'll go you. I see you're riding for the concho. Uh, a year. Pete walked beside this new companion and Pete was thinking hard. What's your name? He queried suddenly. White, Andy White. What's yours? Pete Annersley, he replied proudly. 
They sat outside the store and drank bottled pop and swapped youthful yearns of their range in camp until Pete decided that he had better go. But his heart was no longer with the sheep. He rose and shook hands with Andy. If you get a chanked, ride over to our camp sometime. I'm going up the Largo. You can find us. Maybe and he hesitated, eyeing the pony, maybe I might get a chank to tie up to your outfit. I'm sick of the woolies. Don't blame you, amigo. If I hear of anything I'll come a fan in and tell you. So long. She's one lovely morning. Pete turned and plodded down the dusty road. Far ahead the sheep shuffled along, the dogs on either side of the bend and old Montoya trudging behind and driving the burros. Pete said nothing as he caught up with Montoya, merely taking his place and hazing the burros toward their first camp in the cannon. It was a nameless life, with little chance of excitement, but riding range, that was worthwhile. Already Pete had outgrown any sense of dependency on the old Mexican. He felt that he was his own man. He had been literally raised with the horses and until this morning he had not missed them so much. But the pony and the sprightly young cowboy, with his keen, smiling face and swinging chaps, had stirred longings in young Pete's heart that no amount of ease or outdoor freedom with the sheep could satisfy. He wanted action. His life with Montoya had made him careless but not indolent. He felt a touch of shame, realizing that such a thought was disloyal to Montoya, who had done so much for him. But what sentiment Pete had, ceased immediately, however, when the main chance loomed, and he thought he saw his fortune shaping toward the range in the cowponies. He had liked Andy White from the beginning. Perhaps they could arrange to ride together if he, Pete, could get work with a concho outfit. The gist of it all was that Pete was lonely and did not realize it. Montoya was much older, grave, and often silent for days. He seemed satisfied with the life. Pete, in his way, had aspirations, vague as yet but slowly shaping toward a higher plane than the herding of sheep. He had had experiences enough for a man twice his age, and he knew that he had ability. As Andy White had said, it was wasting good time, the sheep herding. Well, perhaps something would turn up. In the meantime there was camp to make, water to pack, and plenty of easy detail to take up his immediate time. Perhaps he would talk with Montoya after supper about making a change. Perhaps not. It might be better to wait until he saw Andy White again. In camp that night Montoya asked Pete if he were sick. Pete shook his head, just thinking, he replied. Old Montoya, wise in his way, knew that something had occurred, yet he asked no further questions, but rolled a cigarette and smoked, wondering whether young Pete were dissatisfied with the pay he gave him, for Pete now got two dollars a week and his meals. Montoya thought of offering him more. The boy was worth more. But he would wait. If Pete showed any disposition to leave, then would be time enough to speak. So they sat by the fire in the keen evening air, each busy with his own thoughts, while the restless sheep bedded down, bleeding and shuffling, and the dogs lay with noses toward the fire, apparently dozing, but ever alert for a stampede, alert for any possibility, even as were Montoya and Pete, although outwardly placid and silent. Next morning, after the sheep were out, Pete picked up a pack rope and amused himself by flipping the loop on the burrows, the clumps of brush, stubs, and limbs, keeping at it until the old herder noticed and nodded. He is thinking of the cattle, soliloquized Montoya. I will have to get a new boy some day. But he will speak, and then I shall know. While Pete practiced with the rope he was figuring how long it would take him to save exactly eighteen dollars and a half for that was the price of a colt scun such as he had taken from the store at Concho. Why he should think of saving the money for a gun is not quite clear. He already had one. Possibly because they were drifting back toward the town of Concho, Pete wished to be prepared in case Roth asked him about the gun. Pete had eleven dollars pinned in the watch pocket of his overalls. In three weeks, at most, they would drive past Concho. He would then have seventeen dollars. Among his personal effects he had two bobcat skins and a coyote hide. Perhaps he could sell them for a dollar or two. How often did Andy White ride the Largo Cannon? The Concho cattle grazed to the east. Perhaps White had forgotten his promise to ride over some evening. Pete swung his loop and roped a clump of brush. 
I'll sure forfeit you, you doggone longhorn. He said. I'll get my iron on you, you maverick. I'm the riding kid from Powder River, and I ride him straight up and come in. So he romanced, his feet on the ground, but his heart with the bawling herd in the charging ponies. Like to rope the lion, he told himself as he swung his rope again. Same as High Chan Bob. Just then one of the dogs, attracted by Pete's unusual behavior, trotted up. Pete's rope shot out and dropped. The dog had never been roped. His dignity was assaulted. He yelped and started straight away for Montoya, who stood near the band, gazing, as ever, into space. Just as the rope came taut, Pete's foot slipped and he lost the rope. The dog, frightened out of his wits, charged down on the sheep. The trailing rope startled them. They sagged in, crowding away from the terror-stricken dog. Fear, among sheep, spreads like fire and dry grass. In five seconds the band was running, with Montoya calling to the dogs and Pete trying to capture the flying cause of the trouble. When the sheep were turned and had resumed their grazing, Montoya, who had caught the rope dog, strode to Pete. It was a bad thing to do, he said easily. Why did you rope him? Pete scowled and stammered. Thought he was a lion. He came a tearin' up, and I was thinkin' a lions. So, I just knock early loops him. I was practicing. First it was the gun. Now it is the rope, said Montoya, smiling. You make a vaquero, someday, I think. Oh, maybe. But I sure won't quit you till you get him over the range, even if I do get a chink to ride for some outfit. But I ain't got a job, yet. I would not like to have you go, said Montoya. You are a good boy. Pete had nothing to say. He wished Montoya had not called him a good boy. That hurt. If Montoya had only scolded him for stampeding the sheep. But Montoya had spoken in a kindly way. Chapter 7 Plans Several nights later a horseman rode into Montoya's camp. Pete, getting supper, pretended great indifference until he heard the horseman's voice. It was young Andy White who had come to visit, as he had promised. Pete's heart went warm, and he immediately found an extra tin plate and put more coffee in the pot. He was glad to see White, but he was not going to let White know how glad. He greeted the young cowboy in an offhand way, taking the attitude of being so engrossed with cooking that he could not pay great attention to a stray horseman just then. But later in the evening, after they had eaten, the two youths chatted and smoked while Montoya listened and gazed out across the evening mesa. He understood. Pete was tired of the sheep and would sooner or later take up with the cattle. That was natural enough. He liked Pete, really felt as a father toward him. And the old Mexican, who was skilled in working leather, thought of the hand-carved holster and belt that he had been working on during his spare time, a present that he had intended giving Pete when it was completed. There was still a little work to do on the holster, the flower pattern in the center was not quite finished. Tomorrow he would finish it, for he wanted to have it ready. If Pete stayed with him, he would have it, and if Pete left he should have something by which to remember José de la Crux Montoya something to remember him by, and something useful, for even then Montoya realized that if young Pete survived the present hazards that challenged youth and an adventurous heart, someday, as a man grown, Pete would thoroughly appreciate the gift. A good holster, built on the right lines and one from which a gun came easily, would be very useful to a man of Pete's inclinations. And when it came to the fit and hang of a holster, Montoya knew his business. Three weeks later, almost to a day, the sheep were grazing below the town of Concho, near the camp where Pete had first visited Montoya and elected to work for him. On the higher level several miles to the east was the great cattle outfit of the Concho, the home buildings, corrals, and stables. Pete had seen some of the Concho boys, chance visitors at the homestead on the blue, and he had been thinking of these as the sheep drifted toward Concho. After all, he was not equipped to ride, as he had no saddle, bridle chaps, boots, and not even a first-class rope. Pete had too much pride to acknowledge his lack of riding gear or the wherewithal to purchase it, even should he tie up with the Concho boys. So when Andy White, again visiting the sheep camp, told Pete that the Concho foreman had offered no encouragement in regard to an extra hand, 
Pute nodded as though the matter were of slight consequence, which had the effect of stirring Andy to renewed eloquence and end the subject, as Pete had hoped. The boys discussed ways and means. There was much discussion, but no visible ways and means. Andy's entire wealth was invested in his own gay trappings. Pute possessed something like $17. But there is nothing impossible to youth. For when youth realizes the impossible, youth has grown a beard and fears the fire. Both boys knew that there were many poor Mexicans in the town of Cancho who, when under the expansive influence of wine, would part with almost anything they or their neighbors possessed, for a consideration. There were Mexicans who would sell horse, saddle, and bridle for that amount, especially when thirsty, for $17 meant unlimited vino and a swaggering good time, for a time. Pew knew this only too well. He suggested the idea to Andy, who concurred with enthusiasm. Gullas is no good anyhow, blurted Andy. You ain't robbing nobody when you buy a cola outfit. Let's go. Montoya, who sat by the fire, coughed. Course, I was mean in some colas, said Andy. The old herder smiled to himself. The boys amused him. He had been young once, and very poor and he had ridden range in his youthful days. A mild fatalist, he knew that Pete would not stay long, and Montoya was big enough not to begrudge the Muckacho any happiness. I'm going over to town for a spell, explained Pete. Montoya nodded. I'm coming back, Pete added, a bit embarrassed. Bueno. I shall be here. Pete, a bit flustered, did not quite catch the mild sarcasm but he breathed more freely when they were out of sight of camp. He's sure a white Mexican, he told Andy. I kinda hate to leave him, at that. You ain't left him yet, suggested Andy with the blunt candor of youth. Pete pondered. Tucked under his arm were the two bobcat skins and the coyote hide. He would try to sell them to the storekeeper, Roth. All told, he would then have about twenty dollars. That was quite a lot of money, in Kuncho. Roth was closing shop when they entered town. He greeted Pete heartily, remarked at his growth and invited him in. Pete introduced Andy, quite unnecessarily, for Andy knew the storekeeper. Pete gazed at the familiar shelves, boxes and barrels, the new saddles and rigs, and in fact at everything in the store save the showcase which contained the cheap watches, trinkets, and six-shooters. I got a couple of skins here, he said presently. Maybe you could buy them. Let's see him, Pete. Pete unfolded the stiff skins on the counter. Why, I'll give you two dollars for the lot. The cat skins are all right. The coyote ain't worth much. All right. I, I'm needin' the money right now, stammered Pete, or I'd give em to you. How you making it? Query Droth. Fine. But I was thinkin' of makin' a change. Sheep is all right, but I'm sick at the smell of him. Montoya is all right, too. It ain't that. Roth gazed at the boy, wondering if he would say anything about the six gun. He liked Pete and yet he felt a little disappointed that Pete should have taken him altogether for granted. Montoya was in, yesterday, said Roth. Uh huh. Said he was coming over here. He's back in camp. Me and Andy was looking for a cola that wants to sell a hoss. Mighty poor lot of cayuses round here, Pete. What you want with a horse? T ain't the hoss. It's the saddle and bridle I'm after. If I were to offer to buy a saddle and bridle I'd get stuck just as much from as I would if I was to buy the whole works. Might just as well have the hoss. I could trade him for a pair of chaps, maybe. Going to quit the sheep business? Maybe, if I can get a job right. Well, good luck. I got to close up. Come over and see me before you break camp. I sure will. Thank you for the, for buying them hides. Pete felt relieved, and yet not satisfied. He had wanted to speak about the six-shooter he had taken, but Andy was there, and, besides, it was a hard subject to approach gracefully even under the most favorable auspices. Perhaps, in the morning. Come on over to Tony's place and maybe we can run into a mex that wants to sell out, suggested Andy. Pete said goodnight to Roth. Don't you boys get into trouble, laughed Roth, as they left. He had not even hinted about the six-shooter. Pete thought that the storekeeper was sure white. The inevitable gaunt, ribby, 
dejected pony stood at the hitching rail of the saloon. Pete knew it at once for a Mexican's pony. No white man would ride such a horse. The boys inspected the saddle, which was not worth much, but they thought it would do. We could steal him, suggested Dandy, laughing. Then we could swipe the rig and turn the cayuse loose. For a moment this idea appealed to Pete. He had a supreme contempt for Mexicans. But suddenly he seemed to see himself surreptitiously taking the six-shooter from Roth's showcase, and he recalled vividly how he had felt at the time, just plumb mean, as he put it. Roth had been mighty decent to him. The Mexican, a wizened little man, cross-eyed and wrinkled, stumbled from the saloon. Want to sell your house? Pete asked in Mexican, see. How much you give? Said the other, coming right to the point. Ten dollars. He is a good horse, very fast. He is worth much more. I sell him for twenty dollars. See. Andy White put his hand on Pete's shoulder. Say, Pete, he whispered, I know this hombre. The poor cuss ain't hardly got enough sense to die. He comes into town regular and gets drunk and he's got a whole corral full of kids and a wife. Over to the flats. I'm game, but it's kinda tough, talking his hoss. It's about all he's got, except an amusely lay dog and a shack and the clothes on his back. That saddle ain't worth much, anyhow. Pete thought it over. It's his funeral, he said presently. That's all right, but damn if I want to bury him. And Andy, the sprightly, rolled a cigarette and died Pete, who stood pondering. Presently Pete turned to the Mexican. I was only Josh Anu, amigo. You fork your cayuse and fan it for home. Pete felt that his chance of buying cheap equipment had gone glimmering, but he was not unhappy. He gestured to Andy. Together they strode across to the store and sat on the rough wood platform. Pete kicked his heels and whistled a ranged tune. Andy smoked and wondered what Pete had in mind. Suddenly Pete rose and pulled up his belt. Come on over to Roth's house, he said. I want to see him. He's turned in suggested Dandy. That's all right. I got to see him. I'm on. You're going to pay something down on a rig, and get him to let you take it on time. Great eBay. Go to it. You got me wrong, said Pete. Roth had gone to bed, but he rose and answered the door when he heard Pete's voice. Can I see you alone? queried Pete. I reckon so. Come right in. Pete blinked in the glare of the lamp shuffled his feet as he slowly counted out eighteen dollars and a half. It's for the gun I took, he explained. Roth hesitated, then took the money. All right, Pete. I'll give you a receipt. Just wait a minute. Pete gazed curiously at the crumpled bit of paper that Roth fetched from the bedroom. I took a gun and cartridges for Wes. You never give me wages. Pete heaved a sigh. I reckon we're square. Roth grinned. Knowed you'd come back someday. Reckon you didn't find a Mexican with a horse to sell, eh? Yep. But I changed my mind. What made you change your mind? I dunno. Well, I reckon I do. Now, see here, Pete. You been up against it most all your life. You ain't so bad off with old Montoya, but I say how you feel about herding sheep. You want to get to riding. But first you want to get a job. Now you go over to the Concho and tell Bailey, he's the foreman, that I sent you, and that if he'll give you a job, I'll outfit you. You can take your time paying for it. Pete blinked and choked a little. I ain't a skin nobody to give me nothing, he said brusquely. Yes, you be. You're asking Bailey for a job. It's all right to ask for something you mean to pay for, and you'll pay for your job by working. That there rig you can pay for out of your wages. I was always intending to do something for you. Only you didn't stay. I reckon I'm kinda slow. Most everybody is in Kincho. And seeing as you come back and paid up like a man, I'm going to charge that gun up against wages you earned when you was working for me, and credit you with the 1850 on the new rig. Now you fan it back to Montoya and tell him what you aim to do and then if you got time, come over tomorrow and pick out your rig. You don't have to take it till you get your job. Pete twisted his hat in his hands. He did not know what to say. Slowly he backed from the room, turned, and strode out to Andy White. Andy wondered what Pete had been up to, but waited for him to speak. 
Presently Pete cleared his throat. I'm coming over to your wiki up tomorrow and strike for a job. I got the promise of a rig, all right. Don't want no second-hand rig, anyhow. I'm the riding kid from Powder River and I'm coming with head up and tail lay rolling. Whippy. Sang Andy, and swung to his pony. I may come in. Called Pete as Andy clattered away into the night. Pete felt happy and yet strangely subdued. The dim road flickered before him as he trudged back to the sheep camp. Pop would have done it that way, he said aloud. And for a space, down the darkening road he walked in that realm where the invisible walk, and beside him trudged the great, rugged shape of Annersley, the spirit of the old man who always played square, feared no man, and fulfilled a purpose in the immeasurable scheme of things. Pete knew that Annersley would have been pleased. So it was that young Pete paid the most honorable debt of all, the debt to memory that the debtor's own freehand may pay or not and none be the wiser, save the debtor. Pete had played square. It was all the more to his credit that he hated like the Dickens to give up his eighteen dollars and a half, and yet had done so. Chapter 8. Some Bookkeeping. While it is possible to approach the foreman of a cattle outfit on foot and apply for work, it is, as a certain Ulysses of the Outlands once said, not considered a good form in the best families in Arizona. Pete was only too keenly conscious of this. There is a prestige recognized by both employer and tentative employee in riding in, swinging to the ground in that deliberate and easy fashion of the western rider, and sauntering up as though on a friendly visit wherein the weather and grazing furnish themes for introduction, discussion, and the eventual wedge that may open up the way to employment. The foreman knows by the way you sit your horse, dismount, and generally handle yourself, just where you stand in the scale of ability. He does not need to be told. Nor does he care what you have been. Your saddle tree is much more significant than your family tree. Still, if you have graduated in some far eastern riding academy, and are, perchance, ambitious to learn the gentle art of roping, riding them as they come, and incidentally preserving your anatomy as an undislocated whole, it is not a bad idea to approach the foreman on foot and clothed in unpretentious garb. For, as this same Ulysses of the Outland said, rub grease on your chaps and look wise if you will, but the odor of tan bark will cling round you still. This information alone is worth considerably more than twenty cents. Young Pete, who had not slept much, arose and prepared breakfast, making the coffee extra strong. Montoya liked strong coffee. After breakfast Pete made a diagonal approach to the subject of leaving. Could he go to Concho? Montoya nodded. Would it be all right if he made a visit to the Concho outfit over on the Mesa? It would be all right. This was too easy. Pete squirmed internally. If Montoya would only ask why he wanted to go. Did Montoya think he could get another boy to help with the sheep? The old herder, who had a quiet sense of humor, said he didn't need another boy, that Pete did very well. Young Pete felt, as he expressed it to himself, just plumb mean. Metaphorically he had thrown his rope three times and missed each time. This time he made a wider loop. What I'm getting at is, Roth over to Concho said last night if I was to go over to Bailey, he's the foreman of the Concho outfit, and ask him for a job, I could maybe land one. Roth, he said he'd outfit me and leave me to pay for it from my wages. Andy White, he's plug in for me over to the ranch. I ain't said nothing to you, for I wa and he sure. But Roth he says maybe I could get a job. I reckon I'm getting kind of old to herd sheep. Montoya smiled. See, I am sixty years old. I know, but, doggone it. I want to ride a hoss and go somewhere. I will pay you three dollars a week, said Montoya, and his eyes twinkled. He was enjoying Pete's embarrassment. It ain't the money. You sure been square. It ain't that. I reckon I just got to go. Then it is that you go. I will find another to help. You have been a good boy. You do not like the sheep, but the horses. I know that you have been saving the money. You have not bought cartridges. I would give you, hold on, you give me my money day before yesterday. Then you have a little till you get your wages from the concho. It is good. Oh, I'm broke all right, said Pete. But that don't bother me none. I paid Roth for that gun I swiped, you steal the gun? Well, 
It wa'n't he just stealin' it. Roth he never paid me no wages, so when I lit out I took her along and read him it was for wages. Then why did you pay him? Pete frowned. I dunno. Montoya nodded. He stooped and fumbled in a pack. Pete wondered what the old man was hunting for. Presently, Montoya drew out the hand-carved belt and holster, held it up, and inspected it critically. He felt of it with his calloused hands, and finally gestured to Pete. It is for you, Mukacho. I made it. Stand so. There, it should hang this way. Montoya buckled the belt around Pete and stepped back. A little to the front. Bueno. Tie the thong round your leg, so. That is well. It is the present from Jose Montoya. Sometimes you will remember, Montoya glanced at Pete's face. Pete was frowning prodigiously. Ha! laughed Montoya. You do not like it, eh? Pete scowled and blinked. It's the best doggone holster in the world. I, I'm going to keep that there holster as long as I live. I, Montoya patted Pete's shoulder. With the sheep it is quiet, so. And Montoya gestured to the band that grazed nearby. Where you will go there will be the hard riding and the fighting, perhaps. It is not good to kill a man. But it is not good to be killed. The hot word, the quarrel, and some day a man will try to kill you. See. I have left the holster open at the end. I have taught you the trick, but do not tie the holster down if you would shoot that way. There is no more to say. Pete thought so, so far as he was concerned. He was angry with himself for having felt emotion and yet happy in that his break with Montoya had terminated so pleasantly with all. I'm going to town, he said, and get a boy to come out here. If I can't get a boy, I'll come back and stay till you get one. Montoya nodded and strode out to where the sheep had drifted. The dogs jumped up and welcomed him. It was not customary for their master to leave them for so long alone with the flock, their wagging tails and general attitude expressed relief. Pete, topping the rise that hides the town of Kincho from the northern vistas, turned and looked back. Far below, on a slightly rounded knoll stood the old herder, a solitary figure in the wide expanse of mesa and morning sunlight, Pete swung his hat. Montoya raised his arm in a gesture of goodwill and farewell. Pete might have to come back but Montoya doubted it. He knew Pete. If there was anything that looked like a boy available in Concho, Pete would induce that boy to take his place with Montoya, if he had to resort to force to do so. Youth on the hilltop. Youth pausing to gaze back for a moment on a pleasant vista of sunshine and long, lazy days, Pete brushed his arm across his eyes. One of the dogs had left the sheep, and came frisking toward the hill where Pete stood. Pete had never paid much attention to the dogs, and was surprised that either of them should note his going, at this time. Maybe the dog on cuss knows that I'm quitting for good, he thought. The dog circled Pete and barked ingratiatingly. Pete, touched by unexpected interest, squatted down and called the dog to him. The sharp-muzzled, keen-eyed animal trotted up and nosed Pete's hand. You're sure wise, said Pete affectionately. Pete was even more astonished to realize that it was the dog he had roped recently. Note I was only foolin', said Pete, patting the dog's head. The sheepdog gazed up into Pete's face with bright, unblinking eyes that questioned, why was Pete leaving camp early in the morning, and without the burrows? I'm quitting for good, said Pete. The dog's waving tail grew still. That's right, honest. And Pete rouse. The sheepdog's quivering joy ceased at the word. His alertness vanished. A veritable statue of dejection he stood as though pondering the situation. Then he lifted his head and howled, the long, lugubrious howl of the wolf that hungers. You said it all, muttered Pete, turning swiftly and trudging down the road. He would have liked to howl himself. Montoya's kindliness at parting, and his gift, had touched Pete deeply, but he had fought his emotion then too proud to show it. Now he felt a hot something spatter on his hand. His mouth quivered. Dog on a dog. He exclaimed. Dog on the whole dog on outfit. And to cheat his emotion he began to sing, in a ludicrous, choked way, that sprightly and inimitable range ballad, way high up in the Mokianas, among the mountain tops, a lion cleaned a yearling's bones and licked his thankful chops, when who upon the scene should ride, 
A trippin' down the slope, dog on the slope. Blurted Pete as he stubbed his toe on a rock. But when he reached Kincho his eyes had cleared. Like all good Americans he turned a keen, untroubled face home to the instant need of things, and after visiting Roth at the store, and though sorely tempted to loiter and inspect saddlery, he set out to hunt up a boy, for Montoya. None of the Mexican boys he approached cared to leave home. Things looked pretty blue for Pete. The finding of the right boy meant his own freedom. His contempt for the youth of Cancho grew apace. The Mexicans were a lazy lot, who either did not want to work or were loath to leave home and follow the sheep. Just kids. He remarked contemptuously as his fifth attempt failed. I could lick the whole bunch. Finally he located a half-grown youth who said he was willing to go. Pete told him where to find Montoya and exacted a promise from the youth to go at once and apply for the place. Pete hastened to the store and immediately forgot time, place, and even the fact that he had yet to get a job riding for the Kincho outfit, in the eager joy of choosing a saddle, bridle, blanket, spurs, boots and chaps, to say nothing of a new stetson and rope. The sum total of these unpaid for purchases rather staggered him. His eighteen odd dollars was as a fly speck on the credit side of the ledger. He had chosen the best of everything that Roth had in stock. A little figuring convinced him that he would have to work several months before his outfit was paid for. If I get a job I'll give you an order for my wages, he told Roth. That's all right, Pete, I ain't worrying. Well, I be, some, said Pete. Let me see, fifty for the saddle, seven for the bridle, and she's some bridle exclamation mark and eighteen for the chaps, fifteen for the boots, that's ninety dollars. Gee whiz. Then there's four for that blanket and ten for them spurs. That's a hundred and four. Course I could get along without a new lid. Rope is three fifty, and lid is ten. One hundred and seventeen dollars for four bits. Guess I'll make it a hundred and twenty. No use bothering about small change. Give me that pair of gloves. Roth had no hesitation in outfitting Pete. The Concho cattleman traded at his store. He had extended credit to many a rider whom he trusted less than he did Pete. Moreover, he was fond of the boy and wanted to see him placed where he could better himself. I've got you on the books for a hundred and twenty, he told Pete, and Pete felt very proud and important. Now. If I could borrow a hoss for a spell, I'd just fork him and ride over to see Bailey, he asserted. I sure can't pack this outfit over there. Roth grinned. Well, we might as well let the tail go with the hide. There's old Rowdy. He ain't much of a horse, but he's got three good legs yet. He starched a little forward, but he'll make the trip over and back. You can take him. Honest? Go ahead. Pete tingled with joyful anticipation as he strode from the store, his new rope in his hand. He would rope that cayuse and just about burn the ground for the concho. Maybe he wouldn't make young Andy White sit up. The riding kid from Powder River was walking on air when, thought he was going over to see Montoya. He challenged as he saw the Mexican youth, whom he had tentatively hired, sitting placidly on the store veranda employed solely in gazing at the road as though it were a most interesting spectacle. Oh, manana, drawled the Mexican. Manana, nothing. Volleyed Pete. You're going now. Get a move on, if you have to take your hands and lift your doggone feet off the ground. Get a going. Oh, maybe I go manana. You're dreaming, hombre. Pete was desperate. Again he saw his chance of an immediate job go glimmering down the vague vistas of many tomorrows. See here. What kind of a guy are you, anyhow? I come in here yesterday and offered you a job and you promised you'd get to work right away. You, it was today you speak of Montoya, corrected the Mexican. You're dreaming, reiterated Pete. It was yesterday you said you would go manana. Well, it's tomorrow, ain't it? You been asleep and don't know it. An expression of childish wonder crossed the Mexican youth's stolid face. Of a certainty it was but this very morning that Montoya's boy had spoken to him. Or was it yesterday morning? Montoya's boy had said it was yesterday morning. It must be so. The youth rose and gazed about him. Pete stood aggressively potent, frowning down on the other's hesitation. I go, said the Mexican. Pete heaved a sigh of relief. 
a fella's got to know how to handle him, he told the immediate vicinity. And because Pete knew something about handling him, he did not at once go for the horse, but stood staring after the Mexican, who had paused to glance back. Pete waved his hand in a gesture which meant, keep going. The Mexican youth kept going. I ain't wishing old Jose any hard luck, muttered Pete, but I said I'd send a boy, and that there walkin' dream looks like one, anyhow. Oh, manana. He snorted. Mexicans is mostly figuring out today what they're going to do tomorrow, and they never get through figuring. I dunno who my father and mother was, but I know one thing, they wa and he Mexicans. Chapter 9. Rowdy, and Blue Smoke. It has been said that necessity is the mother of invention, well, it goes without saying that the cowboy is the father, and Pete was closely related to these progenitors of that most necessary adjunct of success. Moreover, he could have boasted a coat of arms had he been at all familiar with heraldry and obliged to declare himself. A pinto cayuse rampant, a longhorn steer regardant, two sad-eyed, and branded calves couchant, one in each corner of the shield to kind of balance her up gules, several clumps of something representing sagebrush, and possibly a rattlesnake coiled beneath the sagebrush and described as repellent and holding in his open jaws a streaming mod reading, I may come in. Had it been essential that Pete's escutcheon should bear the bar sinister, doubtless he would have explained its presence with the easy assertion that the dark diagonal represented the vague ancestry of the two sad-eyed calves couchant. Anybody could see that the calves were part Longhorn and part Hereford. Pete rode out of Concho glittering in his newfound glory of shining bit and spur, wide-brimmed Stetson, and chaps studded with nickel-plated conches. The creak of the stiff saddle leather was music to him. His brand new and really good equipment almost made up for the horse, an ancient pensioner that never seemed to be just certain when he would take his next step and seemed a trifle surprised when he had taken it. He was old, amiable, and willing, internally, but his legs somewhat of the Chippendale order, had seen better days. Ease and good feeding had failed to fill him out. He was past taking on flesh. Roth kept him about the place for short trips. Roth's lively team of pintos were at the time grazing in a distant summer pasture. Rowdy, the horse, seemed to feel that the occasion demanded something of him. He pricked his ears as they crossed the cannon bottom and breasted the ascent as bravely as his three good legs would let him. At the top he puffed hard. Despite Pete's urging, he stood stolidly until he had gathered enough ozone to propel him farther. Get along, you doggone a lay cockroach! said Pete. But Rowdy was firm. He turned his head and gazed sadly at his rider with one mournful eye that said plainly, I'm doing my level best. Pete realized that the ground just traveled was anything but level, and curbed his impatience. I'll just kinda save him for the finish he told himself. Then I'll hook the spurs into him and ride an a-boilin'. Don't care what he does after that. He can sit down and rest if he wants to. Get along, old Soapfoot, he cried, Soapfoot possibly because Rowdy occasionally slipped. His antique legs didn't always do just what he wanted them to do. Topping the mesa edge, Pete saw the distant green that fringed the Kincho home ranch topped by a curl of smoke that drifted lazily across the gold of the morning. Without urging, Rowdy broke into a stiff trot, that sounded Pete's in most depths, despite his natural good scene in the saddle. Quit it! cried Pete presently. You'll be going on crutches a fortnight if you keep that up. And so I, he added. Rowdy immediately stopped and turned his mournful eye on Pete. If the trot had been the rhythmic one, two, three, four, Pete could have ridden and rolled cigarettes without spilling a flake of tobacco, but the trot was a sort of one, two, almost three, then, womp, three and a quick four, and so on, a decidedly irregular meter in Pete's lyrical journey toward new fields and fairer fortune. I'll sure make Andy sit up, he declared as the Concho buildings loomed beneath the cool, dark green outline of the trees. He dismounted to open and close a gate. A half mile farther he again dismounted to open and close another gate. From there on was a straightaway road to the ranch buildings. Pete gathered himself together, pushed his hat down firmly, it was new and stiff, and put Rowdy to a high lope. This was something like it. Possibly Rowdy anticipated a good rest, and hey! In any event, 
he did his best, rounding into the yard and up to the house like a true cowpony. All would have been well, as Pete realized later, had it not been for the pup. The pup saw in Rowdy a new playfellow, and charged from the doorstep just as that good steed was mentally preparing to come to a stop. The pup was not mentally prepared in any way, and in his excitement he overshot the mark. He caromed into Rowdy's one recalcitrant leg, it usually happens that way, and Rowdy stepped on him. Pete was also not mentally prepared to dismount at the moment, but he did so as Rowdy crashed down in a cloud of dust. The pup, who imagined himself killed, shrieked shrilly and ran as hard as he could to the distant stables to find out if it were not so. Pete picked up his hat. Rowdy scrambled up and shook himself. Pete was mad. Over on the edge of the bunkhouse veranda sat four or five of the Concho boys. They rocked back and forth and slapped their legs and shouted. It was a trying situation. The foreman, Bailey, rose as Pete limped up. We're living over here, said Bailey. Did you want to see someone? Pete wet his lips. The foreman. I, I, just rid over to see how you was making it. Why, we're doing right fair. How you making it yourself? I'm here, said Pete succinctly and without a smile. So we noticed, said the foreman mildly, too mildly, for one of the punchers began to laugh, and the rest joined in. Wished I had a hoss like that, said a cowboy. Always did hate to climb off in a hoss. I like to have em sat down and kinda let me step off easy like. Pete sorely wanted to make a sharp retort, but he had learned the wisdom of silence. He knew that he had made himself ridiculous before these men. It would be hard to live down this thing. He deemed himself sadly out of luck, but he never lost sight of the main chance for an instant. Bailey, through young Andy White, knew of Pete and was studying him. The boy had self-possession, and he had not cursed the horse for stumbling. He saw that Pete was making a fight to keep his temper. You look in for work? He said kindly. I was headed that way, replied Pete. Can you rope? Oh, some. I can keep from tangling my feet in a rope when it's hanging on the horn and I'm standing off a piece. Well, things are slack right now. Don't know as I could use you. What's your name, anyhow? I'm Pete Annersley. I reckon you know who my pop was. Bailey nodded. The tea bar tea, he said, turning toward the men. They shook their heads and were silent, gazing curiously at the boy, of whom it was said that he had bumped off two tea bar tea boys in a raid some years ago. Young Pete felt his ground firmer beneath him. The men had ceased laughing. If it had not been for that unfortunate stumble. You're sporting a right good rig, said the foreman. I aim to, said Pete quickly. If I hadn't gone broke by it, I'd ride up here on a real hoss. Things are pretty slack right now, said Bailey. Glad to see you, but they won't be nothing due until fall. Won't you sit down? We're going to eat right soon. Thanks. I ain't a missin' a chank to eat. And I reckon no lay rowdy there could do something in that line himself. Bailey smiled. Turn your horse into the corral. Better pack your saddle over here. That pup will chew them new latigos if he gets near it. That doggone pup come mighty nigh bustin' me, and Pete smiled for the first time since arriving. But the pup was having a good time, anyhow. Say, I want to shake with you. Said a big puncher, rising and sticking out a strong, hairy hand. Pete's face expressed surprise. Why, sure. He stammered not realizing that his smiling reference to the pup had won him a friend. He's sure a hard-boiled kid, said one of the men as Pete unsaddled and led Rowdy to the corral. Did you catch his eye? Black, and shining, plumb full of deviltry, down and deep. That kid had to hit some hard spots afore he growed to where he is. And he can take his medicine, asserted another cowboy. He was mad enough to kill that hoss and the bunch of us but he held her down and bellied up to us like a real one. Looks like he had kind of a inch and streak in him. Bailey nodded. Wish I had a job for the kid. He would make good. He's been drifting around the country with old man Montoya for a couple of years. Old man Annersley picked him up down to Concho. The kid was with a horse trader. He would have been all right with Annersley, but you boys know what happened. This ain't no orphan asylum, but, well, anyhow. 
Did you size up the rig he's sportin'? Some rig. And he says he went broke to buy her. Some kid. Going to string him along? Queried another cowboy. Nope, replied Bailey. The pup strung him plenty. Maybe we'll give him a whirl at a real horse after dinner. He's itching to climb a real one and show us, and likewise to break in that new rig. Or get busted, suggested one of the men. By his eye, I'd say he'll stick, said Bailey. Don't you boys go to rein him too strong about riding, for I ain't aimin' to kill the kid. If he can stick on blue smoke, I've a good mind to give him a job. I told Andy to tell him there wa and Tino chanked up here, but the kid comes to look see for himself. I kinda like that. You were getting soft in your hate, but, said a cowboy affectionately. Maybe, but I don't have to put cotton in my ears to keep my brains in, Bailey retorted mildly. The cowboy who had spoken was suffering from Eric and had an ear plugged with cotton. Pete swaggered up and sat down. Who's riding that blue out there? He queried, gesturing toward the corral. He's a pet, said Bailey. Nobody rides him. Huh. Well, I reckon the man who tries to be one of Olay Abraham's pets right off soon after, commented Pete. He don't look good to me. You say him? Queried Bailey and winked at a companion. Nope replied Pete. I can't tell a hoss from a hitchin' rail, lest he kicks me. Well, blue smoke ain't a hitchin' rail, asserted Bailey. What do you say if we go over and tell the missus we're starvin' to death? Send Pete over, suggested the cowboy. Bailey liked a joke. As he had said, things were dull, just then. Lope over and tell my missus we're sittin' out here starvin' to death, he suggested to Pete. Pete strode to the house and entered, hat in hand. The foreman's wife, a plump, cherry woman, liked nothing better than to joke with the men. Presently Pete came out bearing the half of a large, thick, juicy pie in his hands. He marched to the bunkhouse and sat down near the men, but not too near. He ate pie and said nothing. When he had finished the pie, he rolled a cigarette and smoked, in huge content. The cowboys glanced at one another and grinned. Well, said Bailey presently, what's the answer? Pete grinned. Mrs. Bailey says to tell you fellas to keep on starving to death. It'll save cooking. I move that we get one square before we cross over, said Bailey, rising. Come on, boys. I can smell twelve o'clock coming from the kitchen. Chapter 10. Turn him loose. Blue Smoke was one of those unfortunate animals known as an outlaw. He was a blue roan with a black stripe down his back, a tough, strong pony, with a white-trimmed eye as uncompromising as the muzzle of a cocked gun. He was of no special use as a cowpony and was kept about the ranch merely because he happened to belong to the Concho Caviar Yard. It took a wise horse and two good men to get a saddle on him when some aspiring newcomer intimated that he could ride anything with hair on it. He was the inevitable test of the new man. No one as yet had ridden him to a finish, nor was it expected. The man who could stand a brief ten seconds punishment to stride of the outlaw was considered a pretty fair rider. It was customary to time the performance, as one would time a race, but in the instance of riding blue smoke the man was timed rather than the horse. So far, Bailey himself held the record. He had stayed with the outlaw fifteen seconds. Pete learned this, and much more about Blue Smoke's disposition while the men ate and joked with Mrs. Bailey. And Mrs. Bailey, good woman, was no less eloquent than the men in describing the outlaw's unenviable temperament, never dreaming that the men would allow a boy of Pete's years to ride the horse. Pete, a bit embarrassed in this lively company, attended heartily to his plate. He gathered, indirectly, that he was expected to demonstrate his ability as a rider, sooner or later. He hoped that it would be later. After dinner the men loafed out and gravitated lazily toward the corral, where they stood eyeing the horses and commenting on this and that pony. Pute had eyes for no horse but blue smoke. He admitted to himself that he did not want to ride that horse. He knew that his rise would be sudden and that his fall would be great. Still, he sported the habiliments of a full-fledged buckaroo, and he would have to live up to them. A man who could not sit the hurricane deck of a pitching horse was of little use to the ranch. In the busy season each man caught up his string of ponies and rode them as he needed them. There was neither time nor disposition to choose. 
Peter wished that Blue Smoke had a little more of Rowdy's equable disposition. It was typical of Pete, however, that he absolutely hated to leave an unpleasant task to an indefinite future. Moreover, he rather liked the Kincho boys and the foreman. He wanted to ride with them. That was the main thing. Any hesitancy he had in regard to riding the outlaw was the outcome of discretion rather than of fear. Bailey had said there was no work for him. Pete felt that he had rather risk his neck a dozen times than to return to the town of Kincho and tell Roth that he had been unsuccessful in getting work. Yet Pete did not forget his shrewdness. He would bargain with the foreman. How long can a fella stick on that there blue smoke hoss? He queried presently. Depends on the man, said Bailey, grinning. Bailey here stayed with him fifteen seconds oct, said a cowboy. Pete pushed hack his hat. Well, I ain't no bronco twister, but I reckon I could ride him a couple of jumps. Who's keeping time on the doggone cayuse? Anybody that's got a watch, replied Bailey. Pete hitched up his chaps. I got a watch and I'd hate to bust her. If you'll hold her till I get through and he handed the watch to the nearest cowboy. If you'll throw my saddle on him, I reckon I'll walk him round a little and see what kind of action he's got. Shucks! exclaimed Bailey, that hoss would just not carefully pitch you so high you wouldn't get back in time for the fall roundup, kid. He's bad. Well, you said they wa and he no job till fall, anyhow, said Pete. Maybe I'd get back in time for a job. Bailey shook his head. I was joshin', this mornin'. Bowed my riding that hoss? Well, I ain't. I'm kind of a stranger up here, and I reckon new fellas think, because that dog on a lace oak foot fell down with me, that I can't ride em. Oh, maybe some of em, laughed Bailey. Pete's black eyes flashed. To him the matter was anything but a joke. You give me a job if I stick on that hoss for fifteen seconds? Why, I'm game to crawl him and see who wins out. If I get pitched, I lose. And I'm taking all the chances. Throw a saddle on him and give the kid a chank, suggested the cowboy. Bailey turned and looked at Pete, whose eyes were alight with the hope of winning out, not for the sake of any brief glory, Pete's compressed lips denied that, but for the sake of demonstrating his ability to hold down a job on the ranch. Rope him, Monty, said Bailey. Take the sorrel. I'll throw the kid's saddle on him. Do I get the job if I stick? queried Pete nervously. Maybe, said Bailey. Now Pete's watch was a long-suffering dollar watch that went when it wanted to and ceased to go when it felt like resting. At present the watch was on furlough and had been for several days. A good shake would start it going, and once started it seemed anxious to make up for lost time by racing at a delirious pace that ignored the sun, the stars, and all that makes the deliberate progress of the hours. If Pete could arrange it so that his writing could be timed by his own watch, he thought he could win, with something to spare. After a wild battle with the punchers, Blue Smoke was saddled with Pete's saddle. He still fought the men. There was no time for discussion if Pete intended to ride. Go to him! cried Bailey. Pete hitched up his chaps and crawled over the bars. Just time him for me, said Pete, turning to the cowboy who held his watch. The cowboy glanced at the watch, put it to his ear, then glanced at it again. The darn thing stopped. He asserted. Shake her, said Pete. Pete slipped into the saddle. Turn him loose. He cried. The man jumped back. Blue smoke lunged and went at it. Pete gritted his teeth and hung to the rope. The corral revolved and the buildings teeter drunkenly. Blue smoke was not a running bucker, but did his pitching in a small area, and viciously. Pete's head snapped back and forth. He lost all sense of time, direction, and place. He was jolted and jarred by a grunting cyclone that flung him up and sideways, met him coming down and racked every muscle in his body. Pete dully hoped that it would soon be over. He was bleeding at the nose. His neck felt as though it had been broken. He wanted to let go and fall. Anything was better than this terrible punishment. He heard shouting, and then a woman's shrill voice. Blue smoke gave a quick pitch and twist. Pete felt something crash up against him. Suddenly it was night. All motion had ceased. When he came to, Mrs. Bailey was kneeling beside him and ringed around were the curious faces of the cowboys. I'm the riding kid from Powder River, muttered Pete. 
Did I make it? That horse liked to kill you, said Mrs. Bailey. If Ida knew the boys was up to this, and him just a boy. Jim Bailey, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Ma Bailey wiped Pete's face with her apron and put her motherly arm beneath his head. If he was my boy, Jim Bailey, I'd, I'd, show you. Pete raised on his elbow. I'm all right, ma'am. It wa and he his fault. I said I could ride that hoss. Did I make it? According to your watch here, said the puncher who held Pete's irresponsible timepiece, you rid him for four hours and sixteen minutes. The hands was a fanning it round like a windmill in a cyclone. But she's quit, now. Do I get the job? queried Pete. You get right to bed. It's a wonder every bone in your body ain't broke. exclaimed Ma Bailey. Bed snorted Pete. He rose stiffly. His hat was gone and one spur was missing. His legs felt heavy. His neck ached, but his black eyes were bright and blinking. Goodness! exclaimed Mrs. Bailey. Why, the boy is coming to all right. You bet! said Pete, grinning, although he felt far from all right. He realized that he rather owed Mrs. Bailey something in the way of an expression of gratitude for her interest. I, you, you sure can make the best pie ever turned loose. He asserted. Pie. Gasped the foreman's wife, and him almost killed by that blue devil there. You come right in the house, wash your face, and I'll fix you up. The kid's all right, mother, said Bailey placatingly. Mrs. Bailey turned on her husband. That's not your fault, Jim Bailey. Such goings on. You great, lazy hulk, you to go set a boy to ride that hoss that you dasn't ride yourself. If he was my boy, well, I'm willin', said Pete, who began to realize the power behind the throne. Bless his heart. Mrs. Bailey put her arm about his shoulders. Pete was mightily embarrassed. No woman had ever caressed him, so far as he could remember. The men would sure think him a softy, to allow all this strange mothering, but he could not help himself. Evidently the foreman's wife was a power in the land, for the men had taken her berating silently and respectfully. But before they reached the house Pete was only too glad to feel Mrs. Bailey's arm round his shoulders, for the ground seemed unnecessarily uneven, and the trees had a strange way of rocking back and forth, although there was no wind. Mrs. Bailey insisted that he lie down, and she spread a blanket on her own white bed. Pete did not want to lie down. But Mrs. Bailey insisted, helping him to unbuckle his chaps and even to pull off his boots. The bed felt soft and comfortable to his aching body. The room was darkened. Mrs. Bailey tiptoed through the doorway. Pete gazed drowsily at a flaming lithograph on the wall, a basket of fruit such as was never known on land or sea, placed on a highly polished table such as was never made by human hands. The colors of the chromo grew dimmer and dimmer. Pete sighed and fell asleep. Mrs. Bailey, like most folk in that locality, knew something of Pete's earlier life. Rumor had it that Pete was a bad one, a tough kid, that he had even killed two cowboys of the T-Bar T. Mrs. Bailey had never seen Pete until that morning. Yet she immediately formed her own opinion of him, intuition guiding her aright. Young Pete was simply unfortunate, not vicious. She could see that at a glance and he was a manly youngster with a quick, direct eye. He had come to the country looking for work. The men had played their usual pranks, fortunately with no serious consequences. But Bailey should have known better, and she told him so that afternoon in the kitchen, while Pete slumbered blissfully in the next room. And he can help around the place, even if it is slack times, she concluded. That evening was one of the happiest evenings of Pete's life. He had never known the tender solicitude of a woman. Mrs. Bailey treated him as a sort of semi-invalid, waiting on him, silencing the men's good-natured joshing with her sharp tongue, feeding him canned peaches, a rare treat, and finally enthroning him in her own ample rocking chair, somewhat to Pete's embarrassment, and much to the amusement of the men. He sure can ride it, said a cowboy, indicating the rocking chair. Bill Haskins, you need a shave, said Mrs. Bailey. The aforesaid Bill Haskins, unable to see any connection between his remark and the condition of his beard, stared from one to another of his blank-faced companions, grew red, stammered, and felt of his chin. 
I reckon I do, he said weakly, and rising he plodded to the bunkhouse. And if you want to smoke, said Mrs. Bailey, indicating another of the boys who had just rolled and lighted a cigarette, there's all outdoors to do it in. This puncher also grew red, rose, and sauntered out. Bailey and the two remaining cowboys shuffled their feet, wondering who would be the next to suffer the slings and arrows of Ma Bailey's indignation. They considered the blue smoke episode closed. Evidently Ma Bailey did not. Bailey himself wisely suggested that they go over to the bunkhouse. It would be cooler there. The cowboys rose promptly and departed. But they were cowboys and not to be silenced so easily. They loved Ma Bailey and they dearly loved to tease her, strong, rugged, and used to activity, they could not be quiet long. Mrs. Bailey hitched a chair close to Pete and had learned much of his early history, for Pete felt that the least he could do was to answer her kindly questions, and he, in turn, had been feeling quite at home in her evident sympathy, when an unearthly yell shattered the quiet of the summer evening. More yells, and a voice from the darkness stated that someone was hurt bad, to bring a light. Groans, heartrending and hoarse, punctuated the succeeding silence. It's Jim, the voice asserted. Guess his legs broke. The groaning continued. Mrs. Bailey rose and seized the lamp. Pete got up stiffly and followed her out. One of the men was down on all fours, jumping about in ludicrous imitation of a bucking horse, and another was astride him beating him not too gently with a quirt. As Ma Bailey came in sight the other cowboys swung their hats and shouted encouragement to the rider. Bailey was not visible. Stay with him! cried one. Rake him! He's getting played out. Look out! He's going to sunfish! Bust him wide open! It was a huge parody of the afternoon performance, staged for Ma Bailey's special benefit. Suddenly the cowboy who represented Blue Smoke made an astounding buck and his rider bit the dust. Ma Bailey held the lamp aloft and gazed sternly at the two sweating, puffing cowboys. Where's Bailey? She queried sharply. One of the men stepped forward and doffing his hat assumed an attitude of profound gravity. Blue there, he done pitched your husband, ma'am, and broke his leg. Your husband done loped off on three legs, to get the doctor to fix it. Let me catch sight of him and I'll fix it. She snorted. Jim, if you're hiding in that bunk house you come out here, and behave yourself. Lord knows you are old enough to know better. That's right, ma'am. Jim is sure old enough to know better and to behave himself. You feed us so plum good, ma'am, that we just can't set still know how. I reckon it was the pie that done it. Reckon them dried apples kind of turned to cider. Mrs. Bailey swung around with all the dignity of a liner leaving harbor, and headed for the house. Is she gone? Came in a hoarse whisper. You come near this house tonight and you'll find out. Mrs. Bailey advised from the doorway. It's the hay for yours, Jim, comforted a cowboy. Pete hesitated as to which course were better. Finally he decided to throw in with the men. Bailey lighted the hanging lamp in the bunkhouse, and the boys shuffled in grinning sheepishly. You're sure a he witter tonight, said Bill Haskins sympathetically. Bailey grinned. His good wife was used to such pranks. In fact the altogether unexpected and amusing carryings on of the boys did much toward lightening the monotony when times were dull, as they were just then. Had the boys ceased to cut up for any length of time, Ma Bailey would have thought them ill and would have doctored them accordingly. Pete became interested in watching Bill Haskins endeavor to shave himself with cold water by the light of the hanging lamp. Presently Pete's attention was diverted to the cowboy whom Mrs. Bailey had sent outdoors to smoke. He had fished up from somewhere a piece of cardboard and a blue pencil. He was diligently lettering a sign which he eventually showed to his companions with no little pride. It read, No smoking allowed. Pete did not see the joke, but he laughed heartily with the rest. The laughter had just about subsided when a voice came from across the way, Jim, you come right straight to bed. Bailey indicated a bunk for Pete and stepped from the bunk house. Presently the boys heard Mrs. Bailey's voice. Good night, boys. Good night, Ma. They chorused heartily. And good night, Pete, came from the house. Good night, Ma. Shrilled Pete, blushing. I'm plumb sore. Asserted Haskins. Good night. Boys, 
is good enough for us. But did you hear what come after? I can see who gets all the extra pie around this here ranch. I've half a mind to quit. What, Eden pie? Nope. Josh and Ma. Sheila gets the best of us. Chapter 11. Pop Anderson's Boy. Several days after Pete's arrival at the Concho Ranch, Andy White rode in with a companion, dusty, tired, and hungry from a sojourn over near the Apache line. White made his report to the foreman, unsaddled, and was washing with a great deal of splutter and elbow motion, when someone slapped him on the back. He turned a dripping face to behold Pete grinning at him. Andy's eyes lighted with pleasure. He stuck out a wet hand. Did you land a job? With both feet. Good. I was so darn tired I clean forgot you was living. Say, I saw Ole Jose this afternoon. We was crossing the bottom and rode into his camp. He said you had quit him. I asked him if you come up here, but he only shook his head and handed me the usual quin sape. He'll never get a sore throat from talking too much. Say, wait till I get some of this here alkali out of my ears and we'll go and eat and then have a smoke and talk it out. Gee. But I'm glad you landed. How'd you work it? Easy. I rid that there blue smoke hoss, give him an exhibition of real riding and the famine sure fell for my style. Huh. What kind of a fall did you make? Well, I wasn't in shape to know, till I come to. The fellas said I done all right till Olay Smoke done that little double twist and left me standing in the air, only with my feet up. I ain't just loving that hot a whole lot. Andy nodded sagely. I tried him on. So Bailey give you a job, eh? Kind of a job. Mostly peeling potatoes and helping round the house. Ma Bailey says I'm worth any two of the men helping round the house. And I found out one thing, what Ma Bailey says round here goes. You bet. She's the boss. If Ma don't like a guy, he don't work long for the concho. I recollect when Steve Gary quit over the T-bar T and come over here looking for a job. Mashy sized him up, but didn't say nothing right away. But Gary he didn't stay long enough to get a saddle warm. Ma didn't like him, no how. He sure was a top hand, but that didn't help him none. He's over to the T-bar T now. Seen him the other day. He's got some kind of a drag there, for they took him back. Folks says, say, what's bite in you? Nothing. You said Gary? Yes. Why? I was just thinking. Young Andy dried his face on the community towel, emptied the basin with a flourish which drenched the pup and sent him yelping toward the house, attempted to shy the basin so that it would land right side up on the bench, but the basin was wet and soapy and slipped. It sailed through the door of the bunkhouse and caromed off Bill Haskins's head. Andy saw what had happened and, seizing Pete's arm, rushed him across the clearing and into the house, where he grabbed Ma Bailey and kissed her heartily, scrambled backward as she pretended to threaten him with the mammoth coffee pot, and sat down at the table with the remark that he was powerful tired. You act like it, scoffed Mrs. Bailey. Bill Haskins, with a face like black thunder, clumped in and asked Mrs. Bailey if she had any stick and plaster. Cut you, Bill? Bad, said Bill, exhibiting a cut above the ear, the result of Andy's basin throwing. Oh, you go along, said Mrs. Bailey, pushing him away. A skin for stick and plaster for a scratch like that. Bill Haskins growled and grumbled as he took his place at the table. He kept shaking his head like a dog with a sore ear. Vowing that if he found out who thrown that basin there would be an empty chair at the concho board before many days had passed. Andy White glanced at Pete and snickered. Bill Haskins glowered and felt of his head. Liked to scalp me, he asserted. Ma, I just ask you what you would do now, if you was setting peaceful in the bunkhouse pawing over your war bag, looking for a clean shirt, and all of a sudden wing. Along comes a wash basin and takes you right over the ear. Wouldn't you feel like killing somebody? Looking for a clean shirt. Whispered Andy to Pete. Did you get that? Bill got it, and flushed amazingly. I was mean in a clean, clean dress, Mrs. Bailey. A clean dress or stockings, maybe. Bill was looking for a clean dress, snickered Andy. Pete grinned. Bill, I reckon it ain't your ear that needs that stick in plaster. A clean shirt, indeed. I'm surprised at you, William. Gee, 
Ma called him Willem. Whispered Andy. Bill better fade. The men tramped in, nodded to Mrs. Bailey, and sat down. Eating was a serious matter with them. They said little. It was toward the end of the meal, during a lull in the clatter of knives and forks, that Andy White suggested, sotto voce, but intended for the assemblage, that Bill always was scared of a wash basin. This gentle innuendo was lost on the men, but Bill Haskins vowed mighty vengeance. It was evident from the start that Pete and Andy would run in double harness. They were the youngsters of the outfit, liked each other, and as the months went by became known, Ma Bailey had read the book, as the Heavenly Twins. Bailey asked his good wife why Heavenly. He averred that twins was all right, but as for Heavenly, Mrs. Bailey chuckled. I'm calling them Heavenly, Jim, to kind of even up for what the boys call him. I don't use that kind of language. Pete graduated from peeling potatoes and helping about the house to riding line with young Andy, until the fall roundup called for all hands, the loading of the chuck wagon and a farewell to the lazy days at the home ranch. The air was keen with the tang of autumn. The hillside blue of spruce and pine was splashed here and there with the rich gold of the quaking asp. Far vistas grew clearer as the haze of summer heat waned and fled before the stealthy harbingers of winter. In the lower levels of the distant desert, heat waves still pulsed above the grayish-brown reaches of sand and brush, but the desert was fifty, sixty, eighty miles away, spoken of as down there by the riders of the high country. And young Pete, detailed to help gather in some of the most rugged timberland of the blue, would not have changed places with any man. He had been allotted a string of ponies, placed under the supervision of an old hand, entered on the payroll at the nominal salary of $30 a month, and turned out to do his share in the big roundup, wherein riders from the T-Bar T, the Blue, the 808, and the Concho rode with a loose rein and a quick spur, gathering and bunching the large herds over the high country. There was a fly in Pete's coffee, however. Young Andy White had been detailed to ride another section of the country. Bailey had wisely separated these young hopefuls, fearing that competition, for they were always striving to outdo each other, might lead to a hard fall for one or both. Moreover, they were always up to some mischief or other, Andy working the schemes that Pete usually invented for the occasion, up to the time that he arrived at the Concho Ranch, young Pete had never known the joy of good-natured, rough-and-tumble horseplay, that wholesome diversion that tries a man out and either rubs off the ragged edges of his temper or marks him as an undesirable and to be let alone. Pete, while possessing a workable sense of humor, was intense, somewhat quick on the trigger, so to speak. The frequent roughings he experienced served to steady him, and also taught him to distinguish the tentative line between good-natured banter and the veiled insult. Unconsciously he studied his fellows, until he thought he pretty well knew their peculiarities and preferences. Unrealized by Pete, and by themselves, this set him apart from them. They never studied him, but took him for just what he seemed, a bright, quick, and withal industrious youngster, rather quiet at times, but never sullen. Bailey, whose business it was to know and handle men, confided to his wife that he did not quite understand Pete. And Mrs. Bailey, who was really fond of Pete, was consistently feminine when she averred that it wasn't necessary to understand him so long as he attended to his work and behaved himself, which was Mrs. Bailey's way of dodging the issue. She did not understand Pete herself. He does a heap of thinking, for a boy, she told Bailey. He's got something besides cattle on his mind, Bailey asserted. Mrs. Bailey had closed the question for the time being with the rather vague assertion, I should hope so. The first real inkling that Andy White had of Pete's deeper nature was occasioned by an incident during the roundup. The cutting out and branding were about over. The Concho men, camped round their wagon, were fraternizing with visitors from the Blue and T Bar T. Every kind of gossip was afloat. The government was going to make a game preserve of the Blue Range. Old man Dobson, of the 808, had fired one of his men for packing whiskey into the camp. Dobson was drunk himself. Was asserted. One sprightly and inventive son of saddle leather had brought a pair of horse clippers to the roundup. Every suffering puncher in the outfit had been thrown and clipped, including the foreman, and even the cattle inspector. 
Rumor had it that the boys from the Blue intended to widen their scope of operation and clip everybody. The gentleman, described in the vernacular, who started to clip my, also described, Heddle think he's tackled a tree kitty, stated a husky cowboy from the T-Bar T. Old Montoya's name was mentioned by another writer from the T-Bar T. Andy who was lying beside Pete, just within the circle of firelight, nudged him. We run every nester out of this country, and it's about time we started in on the sheep, said this individual, and he spoke not jestingly, but with a vicious meaning in his voice, that silenced the talk. Bailey was there and Hauk, the T-Bar T foreman, Bud Long, foreman of the Blue, and possibly some 15 or 18 visiting cowboys. The strident-till nature of the speaker challenged argument, but the boys were in good humor. What you pickin' on Montoya for? queried a cowboy, laughing. He ain't here. Pete sat up, naturally interested in the answer. He's lucky he ain't, retorted the cowpuncher. You're lucky he ain't, came from Pete's vicinity. Who says so? Andy White tugged at Pete's sleeve. Shut up, Pete. That's Steve Gary talkin'. Don't you go mixin' with Gary. He's right quick with his gun. What say Biden you, anyhow? Who'd you say? queried Pete. Gary, Steve Gary. Reckon you heard of him. Who says I'm lucky he ain't here? Again challenged Gary. Shut up, Steve, said a friendly cowboy. Can't you take a Josh? Who's looking for a row, anyhow? queried another cowboy. I ain't. The men laughed. Pete's face was somber in the firelight. Gary. The man who had led the raid on Pop Annersley's homestead. Pete knew that he would meet Gary someday, and he was curious to see the man who was responsible for the killing of Annersley. He had no definite plan, did not know just what he would do when he met him. Time had dulled the edge of Pete's earlier hatred and experience had taught him to leave well enough alone. But that strident voice, edged with malice, had stirred bitter memories. Pete felt that should he keep silent it would reflect on his loyalty to both Montoya and Annersley. There were men there who knew he had worked for Montoya. They knew, but hardly expected that Pete would take up Gary's general challenge. He was but a youth, hardly more than a boy. The camp was somewhat surprised when Pete got to his feet and stepped toward the fire. I'm the one that said you was lucky Montoya wasn't here, he asserted. And I'm leaving it to my boss, or Bud Long or your own boss and he indicated Hauk with a gesture, if I ain't right. Who in hell are you, anyhow? queried Gary, me? I'm Pop Annersley's boy, Pete. Maybe you recollect you said you'd kill me if I talked about that shootin'. I was a kid then, and I was sure scared of the bunch that busted into the shack, three growed men agin a kid, a threatening what they do to the man that bumped off two of their braves. You was a skin who talked up a while back. It was me. Gary was on his feet and took a step toward Pete when young Andy Rouse. Pete was his bunkie. Andy didn't want to fight, but if Gary pulled his gun. Bailey got up quietly, and turning his back on Gary told Pete and Andy to saddle up and ride out to relieve two of the boys on night herd. It was Bud Long who broke the tension. It's right late for young roosters to be crowing that way, he chuckled. Everybody laughed except Gary. But it ain't too late for full growed roosters to crow. He asserted. Long chuckled again. Nope. I just crowed. Not a man present missed the double meaning, including Gary. And Gary did not want any of Long's game. The genial bud had delicately intimated that his sympathies were with the Concho boys. Then there were Bailey and Bill Haskins and several others among the Concho outfit who would never see one of their own get the worst of it. Gary turned and slunk away toward his own wagon. One after another the T-Bar T-Boys rose and followed. The Annersley raid was not a popular subject with them. Bailey turned to Long. Thanks, bud. Mornin', Jim, said Long facetiously. When'd you get here? Two exceedingly disgruntled young cowboys saddled up and rode out to the night herd. They had worked all day, and now they would have to ride herd the rest of the night, for it was nearing twelve. As relief men they would have to hold their end of the herd until daybreak. I told you to shut up, complained Andy. I wasn't listening to you, said Pete, yes. And this is what we get for your getting redheaded about a Olay Mexican sheepherder. But, honest, Pete, 
you sure come close to getting yours. Gary maybe wouldn't have pulled on you, but he'd have sure trimmed you if Bailey hadn't stepped in. He'd never put a hand on me, stated Pete. You mean you'd have plugged him? I'm mean and I would. But, hell, Pete, you ain't no killer. And they's no use getting started that way. They's plenty as would like to see Gary bumped off, but I don't want to be the man to do it. Suppose Gary did lead that raid on Olay man Annersley. That's over and done. Annersley is dead. You're living, and sure two dead men don't make a live one. What's the good of talking chances like that? I dunno, Andy. All I know is that when Gary started talking about Montoya I commenced to get hot inside. I knowed I was a fool, but I just had to stand up and tell him what he was. It wa not he me doing it. It was just like something big a pulling me onto my feet and making me talk like I did. It was just like you was right in the edge of some steep and bad going and a maverick takes over and you know you got no business to put your hoss down after him. But your saddle is a creakin' and a sayin', go get him exclamation mark and you just knock early go. Can you tell me what makes a fella do the like of that? I dunno, Pete. But chassin mavericks is different. Maybe. But the E-Day is just the same. Well, I'm hoping you don't get many more of them ideas right soon. I'm sure with you to the finish, but I ain't wishful to get mine that way. I ain't a skin new to, said Pete, for he was angry with himself despite the logic of his own argument. They were nearly heard. Andy, who had flushed hotly at Pete's rather ungenerous intimation, spurred his pony round and rode toward a dim figure that nodded in the starlight. Pete whirled his own pony and rode in the opposite direction. Toward dawn, as they circled, they met again. Got the Mackens? queried Pete. Right here, said Andy. As Pete took the little sack of tobacco, their hands touched and gripped. I seen you stand inside of me, said Pete, when I was talking to Gary. You was dreaming laughed Andy. That was your shadow. Maybe, asserted Pete succinctly. But I seen out of the corner of my eye that that their shadow had its hand on its gun. And I sure didn't. Chapter 12. In the Pit. The roundup was over. A trainload of Kincho steers was on its way east, accompanied by four of the Kincho boys. The season had been a good one and prices were fair. Bailey was feeling well. There was no obvious reason for his restlessness. He had eaten a hearty breakfast. The sky was clear, and a thin, fragrant wind ran over the high mesa, a wind as refreshing as a drink of cold mountain water on a hot day. Suddenly it occurred to Bailey that the deer season was open that the hunting winds were loose. Somewhere in the far hills the bucks were running again. A little venison would be a welcome change from a fairly steady diet of beef. Bailey saddled up, and hung his rifle under the stirrup leather. He tucked a compact lunch in his saddle pockets, filled a morale with grain and set off in the direction of the Blue Range. Once on the way and his restlessness evaporated. He did not realize that deer hunting was an excuse to be alone. Jim Bailey however, was not altogether happy. He was worried about young Pete. The incident at the roundup had set him thinking. The T bar T and the Concho men were not over friendly. There were certain questions of grazing and water that had never been definitely settled. The Concho had always claimed the right to run their cattle on the Blue Mesa with the Blue Range as a tentative line of demarcation. The T bar T always claimed the Blue as part of their range. There had been some bickering until the killing of Annersley, when Bailey promptly issued word to his men to keep the Concho cattle north of the homestead. He had refused to have anything to do with the raid, nor did he now intend that his cattle should be in evidence that he had even countenanced it. Young Pete had unwittingly stirred up the old enmity. Any untoward act of a cowboy under such circumstances would be taken as expressive of the policy of the foreman. Even if Pete's quarrel was purely a personal matter there was no telling to what it might lead. The right or wrong of the matter, personally, was not for Bailey to decide. His duty was to keep his cattle where they belonged and his men out of trouble. And because he was known as level-headed and capable he held the position of actual manager of the Concho, owned by an eastern syndicate, but he was too modest and sensible to assume any such title, realizing that as foreman he was in closer touch with his men. They told him things, as foreman, that his manager he would have heard indirectly through a foreman, 
qualified or elaborated as that official might choose. As he jogged along across the levels Bailey thought it all over. He would have a talk with young Pete when he returned and try to show him that his recent attitude toward Gary militated against the Concho's unprinted motto, the fewer quarrels the more beef. Halfway across the mesa there was what was known as the pit, a circular hole in the plain, rock-walled, some forty or fifty yards in diameter and as many yards deep. Its bottom was covered with fine, loose sand, a strange circumstance in a country composed of tufa and volcanic rock. Legend had it that the pit was an old Hopi tank, or waterhole, a huge cistern where that prehistoric tribe conserved the rain. Bits of broken pottery and scattered beads bore out this theory, and round the tank lay the low, crumbling mounds of what had once been a village. The trail on the blue ran close to the pit, and no rider passing it failed to glance down. Cattle occasionally strayed into it and if weak were unable to climb out again without help from horse and rope. As Bailey approached, he heard the unmistakable bark of a six-shooter. He slipped from his horse, strode cautiously to the rim, and peered over. Young Pete had ridden his horse down the ragged trail and was at the moment engaged in six-gun practice. Bailey drew back and sat down. Pete had gathered together some bits of rock and had built a target loosely representing a man. The largest rock, on which was laid a small round, boulder for a head, was spattered with lead. Pete, quite unconscious of an audience, was cutting loose with speed and accuracy. He threw several shots at the place which represented the vitals of his theoretical enemy, punched the shells from his gun, and reloaded. Then he stepped to his horse and led him opposite the target and some twenty feet from it. Crouching, he fired under the horse's belly. The horse balked and circled the enclosure. Pete strode after him, caught him up, and repeated the performance. Each time Pete fired, the horse naturally jumped and ran. Patiently Pete caught him up again. Finally the animal, although trembling and wild-eyed, stood to the gun. Pete patted its neck. Reloading he mounted. Bailey was curious to see what the boy would do next. Pete turned the horse and, spurring him, flung past the target, emptying his gun as he went. Then he dismounted and striding up to within ten yards of the man target holstered his gun and stood for a moment as still as a stone itself. Suddenly his hand flashed to his side. Bailey rubbed his eyes. The gun had not come from the holster, yet the rock target was spattered with five more shots. Bailey could see the lead fly as the blunt slugs flattened on the stone. The young son of a gun, muttered Bailey. Dinged if he ain't shootin' through the open holster. Where in blazes did he learn that badman trick? Thus far Pete had not said a word, even to the horse. But now that he had finished his practice he strode to the rock target and thrust his hand against it. You're dead. He exclaimed. You're plumb salivated. He pushed, and the man target toppled and fell. Ain't you going to bury him? Queried Bailey. Pete whirled. The color ran up his neck and face. Hello, Jim. How'd you know it was me? Bailey stood up. Knowed your voice. Well, come on up. I was wondering who was down there setting off the fireworks. Didn't hear you till I got most on top of you. You sure got some private shoot in gallery. Pete led his pony up the steep trail and squatted beside Bailey. How long you been watching me, Jim? Oh, just since you started shooting under your hoss. What's the idea? Nothing, just practicing. You must have been practicing quite a spell. You handle that smoke wagon like an LA timer. I ain't advertising it. Well, it's all right, Pete. Glad I got a front seat. Never figured you was a top hand with a gun. Now I'm wise. I know enough not to stack up against you. Pete smiled his slow smile and pushed back his hat. I reckon you're right about that. I never did no shootin' in company. Ole Jose Montoya always said to do your practicing by yourself and then nobody knows just how you would play your hand. Bailey frowned and nodded. Well, seen as I'm in on it, Pete, I'd kind of like to know myself. Why, I'm just figuring that some day maybe somebody'll want to hang my hide on the fence. I don't aim to let him. Mean and Gary? The same. I ain't looking for Gary, even if he did shoot down Pop Hanersley, nor I ain't trying to keep out of his way. 
I'm right in this country and I'm like to meet up with him most any time. That's all. Shucks, Pete. You forget Gary. He sure ain't worth getting hung for. Gary ain't going to put you down so long as you ride for the concho. He knows somebody'd get him. You just practice shooting all you like, but tend to business the rest of the time and you live longer. You can figure on one thing, if Gary was to get you he wouldn't live to get out of this country. Your hand me your best card, said Pete. Gary killed Danielsley. The law didn't get Gary. And none of you fellas got him. He's right in this here country yet. And you was telling me to forget him. But that's different, Pete. No one saw Gary shoot Annersley. It was night. Annersley was killed in his cabin, by a shot through the window. Anybody might have fired that shot. Why, you were there yourself, and you can't prove who done it. I can't, eh? Well, between you and me, Jim, I know. One of Gary's own men said that night when they were leaving the cabin, it must have been Steve that drilled the Olay man because Steve was the only puncher who knowed where the window was and fired into it. I didn't know that. So you aim to even up, eh? Nope. I just aim to be ready to even up. Bailey strode back to his horse. I'm going up in the hills and look for a deer. Want to take a little passer with me? Suits me, Jim. Come on, then. They mounted and rode side by side across the noon mesa. The ponies stepped briskly. The air was like a song. Far away the blue hills invited exploration of their timbered and mysterious silences. Makes a fella feel like forgetting everything and everybody, but just this, said Pete, gesturing toward the ranges. The buck'll be on the ridges, remarked Bailey. Chapter 13. Game. They got their buck, a big six point, just before the sun dipped below the flaming skyline. In order to pack the meat in, one or the other would have to walk. Pete volunteered, but Bailey generously offered to toss up for the privilege of riding. He flipped a coin and won. Suits me, said Pete, grinning. It's worth walking from here to the ranch just to see you rope the deer on my hoss. I reckon you'll sweat. It took about all of the foreman's skill and strength, assisted by Pete, to rope the deer on the pony, who had never packed game and who never intended to if he could help it. And it was a nervous horse that Pete led down the long woodland trail as the shadows grew distorted and grim in the swiftly fading light long before they reached the mesa level it was dark. The trail was carpeted with needles of the pine and their going was silent save for the creak of the saddles and the occasional click of a hoof against an uncovered rock. Pete's horse seemed even more nervous as they made the last descent before striking the mesa. Something besides deer is bothering him, said Pete as they worked cautiously down a steep switchback. The horse had stopped and was trembling. Bailey glanced back. Up there, he whispered, gesturing to the trail above them. Pete had also been looking round, and before Bailey could speak again, a sliver of flame split the darkness and the roar of Pete's six gun shattered the eerie silence of the hillside. Bailey's horse plunged off the trail and rocketed straight down the mountain. Pete's horse, rearing from the hurdling shape that lunged from the trail above, tore the rope from his hand and crashed down the hillside, snorting. Something was threshing about the trail and coughing horribly. Pete would have run if he had known which way to run. He had seen two lambent green dots glowing above him and had fired with that quick instinct of placing his shot, the result of long practice. The flopping and coughing ceased. Pete, with cocked gun poked ahead of him, struck a match. In its pale flare he saw the long gray shape of a mountain lean stretched across the trail. Evidently the lion had smelled the blood of the deer, or the odor of the sweating horses. A mountain lion likes horse flesh better than anything else, and had padded down the trail in the darkness, following as close as he dared. The match flamed and spluttered out. Pete wisely backed away a few paces and listened. A little wind whispered in the pines and a branch creaked, but there came no sound of movement from the lion. I reckon I plugged him right, muttered Pete. Wonder what made Jim light out in sicko hurry? And, hey, Jim. He called. From far below came a faint whoo. Hello. Then the words separate and distinct, I, got, your, horse. I, got, a, lion, called Pete shrilly. Who, is lion? Came from the depths below. Pete grinned despite his agitation. 
Come, on, back! shouted Pete. He thought he heard Bailey say something like damn, but it may have been, I am. Pete struck another match and stepped nearer the lion this time. The great, lithe beast was dead. The blunt nose 45 at close range had torn away a part of its skull. I done spiled the head, complained Pete. In the succeeding darkness he heard the faint tinkle of shod feet on the trail. Presently he could distinctly hear the heavy breathing of the horse and the gentle creak of the saddle. Within speaking distance he told the foreman that he had shot a whopper of a lion and it looked as though they would need another pack horse. Bailey said nothing until he had arrived at the angle of the switchback, when he lighted a match and gazed at the great gray cat of the rocks. You get twenty dollars bounty, he told Pete. And you sure stampeded me into the worst piece of down timber I've rode for a long time. Gosh. But you're quick with that smoke wagon of yours. Lost my hat and like to broke my leg gag in a tree, but I run plumb onto your horse during the rope. I tied him down there on the flat. I figure you've saved a dozen calves by killing that kitty cat. Did you know it was a lion when you shot? Nope, or I'd a sure beat the hosses down the grade. I just cut loose at them two green eyes a burnin' in the brush and wump. Down comes Mr. Kitty Cat almost plumb atop me. Maybe I wasn't scared. I was wondering why you set off in sicko hurry. You sure burned the ground down the mountain. Just stayin' with my saddle, laughed Bailey. Old Frisco here ain't lost any lions recent. Will he pack? I dunno. Wish it was daylight. Wish we had another rope, said Pete. My rope is on my hoss and yours is cinchin' the deer on him. And that there lion sure won't lead. He's dead. Way high up in the Mokianas, chanted Bailey. A trippin' down the slope. Laughed Pete. And we ain't got no rope. But say, Jim, can't we kind of hang him across your saddle and steady him down to the flats? I'll see what I can do with the tie strings. I'll hold Frisco. You go ahead and heave him up. Pete approached the lion and tried to lift it, but it weaved and slipped from his arms. Limper and wet rawhide. Asserted Pete. Are you that scared? Shucks, now, Ida thought, the doggone lion, I mean. Every time I heave at him he just folds up and lays egg in me like he was powerful glad to see me. You try him. The horse snorted and shied as the foreman slung the huge carcass across the saddle and tied the lion's fore feet and hind feet with the saddle strings. They made slow progress to the flats below, where they had another lively session with Pete's horse, who had smelled the lion. Finally with their game roped securely they set out on foot for the ranch. The hunting, and especially Pete's kill, had drawn them close together. They laughed and talked making light of high-heeled boots that pinched and blistered as they plodded across the starlit mesa. Let's put one over on the boys. Suggested Pete. We'll drift in quiet, hang the buck in the slaughterhouse, and then pack the kitty cat into the bunkhouse and leave him layin' like he was asleep, by Bill Haskins's bunk. Olay Billilis gets his feet on the floor afore he gets his eyes open. Maybe he won't step high and lively when he sees what he's got his feet on. Bailey, plodding ahead and leading Frisco, chuckled. I'll go you, Pete, but I want you to promise me something. Shoot. Bailey waited for Pete to come alongside. It's this way, Pete, and this here is plain outdoor talk, which you save. Mrs. Bailey and me ain't exactly hatin' you, as you know. But we would hate to see you get into trouble on account of Gary or any of the T-Bar T-Boys. And because you can shoot is a mighty good reason for you to go slow with that gun. T ain't that I give two whoops and a holler what happens to Gary. It's what might happen to you. I was raised right here in this country and I know just how those things go. You're working for the concho. What you do, the concho's got to back up. I couldn't hold the boys if Gary got you, or if you got Gary. They'd be hella poppin' all over the range. Speakin' personal. I'm with you to the finish, for I know how you feel about Pop Anderson. But you ain't growed up yet. You got plenty time to think. If you are a hankerin' for Gary's scalp, when you get to be 21, why, go to it. But you're a kid yet, and a whole lot can happen in five or six years. Maybe somebody'll get Gary afore then. I sure hope they do. But while you're worldly for me, just forget Gary. 
I ain't telling you you got to. I'm talking as your friend. I'll go you, said Pete slowly. But if Steve Gary comes at me, that's different. Let him talk, and you keep still. Keeping still at the right time has saved many a man's hide. Most folks talk too much. Chapter 14 The Kitty Cat Pete and Bailey took off their boots just before they entered the bunkhouse. They lugged the defunct mountain lion in and laid it by Bill Haskins' bunk. Pete propped the lion's head up with one of Haskins' boots. The effect was realistic enough. The lion lay stretched out in a most natural way, apparently gazing languidly at the sleeping cowpuncher. This was more or less accidental, as they dare not light the lamp for fear of waking the men. Bailey stole softly to the door and across to the house. Pete undressed and turned in, to dream of who knows what ghostly lions prowling through the timberlands of the Blue Range. It seemed but a few minutes when he heard the clatter of the pack horse bell that Mrs. Bailey used to call the men to breakfast. The chill gray half-light of early morning discovered him with one cautious eye, gazing across at Haskins, who still snored, despite the bell. Oh, Bill! called Pete. Haskins' snore broke in two as he swallowed the unlaunched half and sat up rubbing his eyes. He swung his feet down and yawned prodigiously. Hey, hell! he exclaimed as his bare feet touched the furry back of the lion. Bill glanced down into those half-closed eyes. His jaw sagged. Then he bounded to the middle of the room. With a whoop he dashed through the doorway, rounded into the open, and sprinted for the corral fence, his bare legs twinkling like the side rods of a speeding locomotive and his shirt tail fluttering in the morning breeze. Andy White leaped from his bunk, saw the dead lion, and started to follow Haskins. Another cowboy, Avery, was dancing on one foot endeavoring to don his overalls. Hank Barley, an old-timer, jumped up with his gun poised, ready for business. Why, he's dead! He exclaimed, poking the lion with the muzzle of his gun. Pete rose languidly and began to dress. What's all the hocus, fellas? Where's Haskins? Bill he done lit out like he lost something, said Barley. Now I wonder what young age did pack the tree catting here last night? Jim said yesterday he was going to do a little looking round. Looks like he sure seen something. Yes, drawled Pete. Jim and me got a buck and this here lion. We didn't have time to get anything else. Too bad you didn't get a bear and a couple of bobcats while you was at it. Hey, boys. Called Dandy from the doorway. Come see Bill. The men crowded to the door. Perched on the top rail of the corral fence sat Bill Haskins shivering and staring at the house. We killed your bedfeller. Called Barley. He done at your pants afore we plugged him. But I can lend you a pair. You had better get a move in afore Ma Bailey, SSH. Whispered Andy White. There's Ma standing in the kitchen door and, she's seen Bill. Bill also realized that he had been seen by Mrs. Bailey. He shivered and shook teetering on the top rail until indecision got the better of his equilibrium. With a wild backward flip he disappeared from the high line of vision. Ma Bailey also disappeared. The boys doubled up and groaned as Bill Haskins crawled on all fours across the corral toward the shelter of the stable. Oh, my gosh! gasped Barley. SSO, body, SH shoot me and put me out of my M misery. A few seconds later Bailey crossed the yard carrying an extra pair of those coverings most essential to male comfort and equanimity. It was a supernaturally grave bevy of cowpunchers that gathered round the table that morning. Ma Bailey's silence was eloquent of suppressed indignation. Bailey also seemed subdued. Pete was as placid as a sleeping cherub. Only Andy White seemed really overwrought. He seemed to suffer internally. The sweat stood out on Bill Haskins' red face, but his appetite was in no way impaired. He ate rapidly and drank much coffee. Ma Bailey was especially gracious to him. Presently from Pete's end of the table came a faint meow. Andy White put down his cup of coffee and excusing himself fled from the room, Pete stared after him as though greatly astonished. Barley the imperturbable seemed to be suffering from internal spasms, and presently left the table. Blaze Andrews, the quietest of the lot, also departed without finishing his breakfast. Ain't you feelin' well, Ma? queried Pete innocently. 
Bailey rose and said he thought he would go see to the horses a very unusual procedure for him. Pete also thought it was about time to depart. He rose and nodded to Bill. Glad to see you back, Bill. Then he went swiftly. Haskins heaved a sigh. I, doggone it, I, you got any sticking plaster, Ma? Yes, William and William because Ma Bailey was still a bit indignant, although she appreciated that Bill was more sinned against than sinning. Yes, William. Did you hurt yourself? Stepped on a nail, er, this morning. I, I wasn't looking where I stepped. What started you out, that way? Queried Mrs. Bailey. Why, hell, Ma, I, wasn't mean in hell, Ma, comma, but somebody, I reckon I know who, planned some mountain lion right aside my bunk last night when I was sleeping. Fust thing this morning I heard that bell and jumped out of my bunk plum onto the cuss. Like to bruck my neck. That there lion was a looking right up into my face, kind of sleepy eyed and smiling like he was hungry. I sure didn't stop to find out. Course, when I got my wind, I knowed it was a joke. I reckon I ought to kill somebody, a lion, Bill. Have you been drinking? Drinking. Why, Ma, I ain't had a drop since, I reckon I better go see what's in that bunk house, said Mrs. Bailey, rising. I'll get you that stick and plaster when I come back. Mrs. Bailey realized that something unusual had started Bill Haskins on his wild career that morning, but she could not quite believe that there was a mountain lion, alive or dead, in the bunkhouse until she saw the great beast with her own amazed eyes. And she could not quite believe that Pete had shot the lion until Bailey himself certified to Pete's story of the hunt. Mrs. Bailey, for some feminine reason, felt that she had been cheated. Bailey had not told her about the lion. She had been indignant with Haskins for his apparently unseemly conduct, and had been still more indignant with Pete when she appreciated that he was at the bottom of the joke. But Haskins was innocent and Pete was now somewhat of a hero. The good woman turned on her husband and rebuked him roundly for allowing such goings on. Bailey took his dressing down silently. He felt that the fun had been worth it. Pete himself was rather proud and obviously afraid he would show it. But the atmosphere settled to normal when the men went to work. Pete was commissioned to skin and cut up the deer. Later in the day he tackled the lion, skinned it, fleshed out the nose, ears, and eyelids, and salted and rolled the hide. Roth, the storekeeper at Concho, was somewhat of a taxidermist and Mrs. Bailey had admired the lion skin. Pete felt that he could have used the $20 bounty, but he was nothing if not generous. That afternoon he rode to Concho with the lion skin tied behind the cantle. He returned to the ranch late at night. Next morning he was mysteriously reticent about the disappearance of the hide. He intended to surprise Ma Bailey with a real Christmas present. No one guessed his intent. Pete was good at keeping his own counsel. A few evenings later the men, loafing outside the bunkhouse, amused themselves by originating titles for the chief actors in the recent range drama. Pete, without question, was the lion tamer, Bailey was big chief not afraid of a buck. Ma Bailey was queen of the pies not analogous to the drama but flattering, and Haskins, after some argument and much suggestion, was entitled Claw Hammer. Such titles as Deerfoot, Railhopper, Backflip Bill, Wind Splitter, and the like were discarded in favor of Claw Hammer for the unfortunate Bill had stepped on a rusty nail in his recent exodus from the lion's den, and was at the time suffering from a swollen and inflamed foot, really a serious injury, although scoffed at by the good-natured Bill himself despite Mrs. Bailey's solicitude and solution of peroxide. Winter, with its thin shifts of snow, its intermittent sunshiny days. Its spiting winds that bored through chaps and heavy gloves, was finally borne away on the reiterant, warm breezes of spring. Mrs. Bailey was the proud and happy possessor of a lion skin rug, Pete's Christmas present to her, proud of the pelt itself and happy because young Pete had foregone the bounty that he might make the present, which was significant of his real affection. Coats and heavy overshoes were discarded. Birds sang among sprouting aspen twigs, and lean mangy looking coyotes lay on the distant hillside soaking in the warmth gaunt cattle lowed in the hollows and spring calves staggered about gazing at this new world with round staring eyes hauk the t bar t foreman 
had discussed with Bailey the advisability of defining a line between the two big ranches. They came to an agreement and both stated that they would send men to roughly survey the line, fix upon landmarks, and make them known to the riders of both outfits. Bailey, who had to ride from Concho to the railroad to meet a Kansas City Commission man, sent word back to the Concho to have two men ride over to Andersley's old homestead the following day. Mrs. Bailey immediately commissioned young Pete and Andy to ride over to the homestead, thinking that Pete was a particularly good choice as he knew the country thereabouts. She cautioned the boys to behave themselves, she always did when Andy and Pete set out together, and giving them a comfortable package of lunch, she turned to her household work. I'm talking blue smoke, stated Pete as Andy packed his saddle to the corral. You're talking chances then, observed Andy. Oh. I got him so he knows which way is north, asserted Pete. I've been getting acquainted with that cayuse, Chico. Yes. I seen you setting on the ground watching him buck your saddle off a couple of times, snorted Andy. Well, seen as this here passer is straight riding I reckon I'll crawl him and turn him loose. He needs exercising. Well, I don't, asserted Andy. Course, some folks has always got to be showing off. If Bailey was here you wouldn't be riding that hoss. And up and down and round and cross, that top boss done his best. Sang Pete as he lugged his saddle into the corral. All hell can't glue you to that hoss when he gets headed west, Andy misquoted for the occasion. You just swing that gate open when I get aboard, suggested Pete. I'm the riding kid from Powder River. Andy laughed. The riding kid from Powder River ain't got no lungs nor airy liver. Some says it was a blue cayuse. Go get you a sack and gather up the Levines, laughed Pete, as he kicked his foot into the stirrup and hit the saddle before Blue Smoke knew what had happened. Andy swung the gate open. The horse headed for the mesa, pitching as he ran. This was not half so bad for Pete as though Blue Smoke had been forced to confine his efforts to the corral. Pete had long since discovered that when Blue Smoke saw space ahead of him, he was not half to pitch hard but rather to take it out in running bucks and then settle down to a high lope, as he did on this occasion, after he had tried with his usual gusto to unseat his rider. There is something admirable in the spirit of a horse that refuses to be ridden, and there was much to be said for blue smoke. He possessed tremendous energy, high courage, and strength, signified by the black stripe down his back and the compact muscles of his flanks and fore legs. Pete had coveted the horse ever since that first and unforgettable experience in the corral. Bailey had said jokingly that he would give Pete the outlaw if Pete would break him. Pete had frequently headed out with blue smoke when the men were away. He had taken Bailey at his word, but as usual had said nothing about riding the animal. Andy watched Pete until he saw that blue smoke had ceased to pitch and was running, when he swung up and loped out after his companion. He overtook him a half mile from the ranch and loped alongside, watching Pete with no little admiration and some envy. It struck Andy that while Pete never made much of his intent or his accomplishment, whatever it might be, he usually succeeded in gaining his end. There was something about Pete that puzzled Andy, a kind of silent forcefulness that emanated neither from bulk nor speech, for Pete was rather lithe and compact than beefy and more inclined to silence than to speech. Yet there was none of the do-or-die attitude about him either. But whatever it was, it was there, evident in Pete's eye as he turned and glanced at Andy, an intenseness of purpose, not manifest in any outward show or form. You sure tamed him, said Andy admiringly. Only for this morning, acknowledged Pete. Tomorrow morning he'll go to it again. But I aim to sweat some of it out of him afore we hit the blue. Got the Mackens? Chapter 15. Four Men. Pete grew silent as he rode with Andy toward the hill trail that led to his old home on the Blue Mesa, where he finally surveyed the traces of old man Annersley's patient toil. The fences had been pulled down and the waterhole enlarged. The cabin, now a rendezvous for occasional riders of the T-Bar T, had suffered from weather and neglect. The door sagging from one hinge, the grimy, cobwebbed windows, the unswept floor, and the litter of tin cans about the yard stirred bitter memories in Pete's heart. Andy spoke of Annersley, a fine old man, but Pete had no comment to make. They loafed outside in the afternoon sunshine, 
momentarily expecting the two men from the tea bar tea. Presently Andy White rose and wandered off toward the spring. Pete sat idly tossing pellets of earth at a tin can. He was thinking of Annersley, of the old man's unvarying kindliness and quaint humor. He wished that Annersley were alive, could know of his success, Pute had done pretty well for a lad of sixteen, and that they could talk together as in the old days. He rose presently and entered the abandoned cabin. The afternoon sunlight flickered palely through the dusty windows. Several window panes had been broken out, but the one marked with two bullet holes, radiating tiny cracks in the glass, was still there. The oilcloth on the table was torn and soiled. The mud of wet weather had been tracked about the floor. The stove was rusted and cracked. Pete wondered why men must invariably abuse things that were patently useful, when those things did not belong to anyone especially, for the stove, the windows, the table, the two homemade chairs showed more than disuse. They had been wantonly broken, hacked, or battered. Someone had pried the damper from the stove, broken it in two, and had used half of it for a lid lifter. A door had been torn from the wall cupboard and split into kindling, as a few painted splinters attested. And someone had shot several holes in the door, evidently endeavoring to make the initial tea with a 45. An old pair of discarded overalls lay in one corner, a worn and useless glove in another. Pete was glad that Annersley would never know of all this, and yet it seemed as though Annersley could see these things, and Pete, standing alone in the room, felt as though he were in some way to blame for this disorder and squalidness. Time and occupation had rather dulled Pete's remembrance of the actual detail of the place, but now its original neatness and orderliness came back to him vividly. He was mentally rehabilitating the cabin when a boot heel crunched on the ground outside and Andy appeared in the doorway. The tea bar tea boys are coming. Seen em drifting down the ranger trail. They was to be here this morning, said Pete. Reckon they aim to bush here all night and ride tomorrow. Hope they brought some grub along. We got plenty. Come on outside. This hero lay room kinda gets on my nerves. Pete strode out. They stood watching the approaching riders. Suddenly Andy White touched Pete's arm. One of them is Gary. He said, speaking low. Pete stopped and, picking up a clod, jerked it toward a fence post. The clod happened to hit the post and was flicked into dust. That for Gary, said Pete. Andy grinned, but his eyes were grave. We'll be right busy, he said in a sort of tentative way. Pete nodded and hitched up his chaps. One of the approaching horsemen waved a hand. Andy acknowledged the salute. The tea bar team men rode in and dismounted. Where's Bailey? was Gary's first word. Jim sent us to fix up that line with you replied Andy. He's over to and right. Gary glanced at Pete, who stared at him, but made no gesture of greeting. But Pete had read Gary's unspoken thought. Bailey had sent a couple of kids over to the blue to help survey the line. And Pete did not intend to let Gary get by with the idea that his attitude was not understood. Where's Ha Oog? asked Pete, naming the foreman of the tea bar tea. Cotton, Gary's companion, a light-haired, amiable but rather dull youth, stated that Hawk was over to the ranch. I reckon he'd come himself, said Pete. He knows this country better than most. Oh, I dunno, sneered Gary. Some of us been here before. They wasn't no line then, said Pete quietly, but they's going to be one. You making it? queried Gary. Pete smiled. I was sent over here with Andy to do that same thing. But you're sure welcome to hand out any IDs you got, Senior Fahman ain't here. Andy, who saw the inevitable end of this kind of talk, nudged Pete. Let's eat, he said. I reckon we're all willing. Gary, like most of his type, was always anticipating an insult, possibly because his general attitude toward humanity was deliberately intended to provoke argument and recrimination. He was naturally quarrelsome and a bully because of his unquestioned physical courage. He was popular in a way with those of his fellows who looked upon a gunman, a killer, as a kind of hero. The foreman of the tea bar tea found him valuable as a sort of animate scarecrow. Gary's mere presence often served to turn the balance when the tea bar tea riders had occasion to substantiate a bluff or settle a dispute with some other outfit riding the high country. 
and because Gary imagined that Bailey of the Concho had deliberately sent such youngsters as Andy White and young Pete to the Blue Mesa to settle the matter of a boundary line, Gary felt insulted. He was too narrow-minded to reason that Bailey could hardly know whom Hawk of the T-Bar T would send. Gary's ill humor was not improved by the presence of young Pete nor by Pete's pugnacious attitude. Strangely enough, Gary was nervous because he knew that young Pete was not afraid of him. Andy White was keenly aware of this, and found occasion that evening in Gary's temporary absence to caution Pete, who immediately called attention to the fact that they had all hung up their guns except Gary. All the better, asserted Andy. That lets you out if he was to start something. Yes. And it maybe might let me out for good, Andy. Gary is just the kind to shoot a man down without giving him a chanked. It ain't like Gary was scared of me but he's scared of what I know. I hung up my gun cause I told Jim I wouldn't set to look in for a scrap with Gary, or any man. Gary ain't got sand enough to do the same. But there won't be no fuss. I reckon he dasn't draw on me with you two fellas here. Where'd he and Cotton go, anyhow? I dunno, Pete. They moseyed out without saying anything. Looks like Gary wanted to put Cotton wise. Well, if anything starts. I'll sure keep my eye on that cotton hombre, said Andy. He's easy, and slow, stated Pete. He ain't got a fight an eye. Here they come, whispered Andy. I can hear him talking. Pete immediately began to whistle. Andy rose and poked a stick of wood in the stove. She's right cool up here, he remarked. We've been kinda sizing up things, stated Cotton as Gary and he entered the cabin an excuse for their absence that was unnecessary and obviously manufactured. Pete smiled. I got him sized up. Never did cotton to workin' in the dark. Gary paused in the act of unsnapping his chaps. He was about to say something when Andy White interrupted by suggesting that they turn in early and rise early that they might get the work done in daylight and not have to spend another night at the cabin. Gary dragged an old mattress from the bedroom and, dropping it beneath the window, spread his blanket, rolled up in it, and at Cotton's query as to sharing half of the mattress told Cotton to sleep where he damn pleased. He's a friendly cuss, ain't he? remarked Pete. Who? asked Gary, half rising. Why, Cotton, there, replied Pete. You didn't think I was mean on you, did you? Andy nudged Pete in the dark. All right, said Pete, ignoring Andy's meaning. You get your blanket and we'll bush outside. They spread their blankets under a cedar, some distance from the cabin, and lay gazing at the stars. Presently Andy turned to Pete. Pete, he said gravely, you're walking right into trouble. Every time Gary starts to lope, you rein him up mighty short. He's fighting the bit, and first thing you know, I'll get pitched, eh? Well, maybe you're right. I done told Bailey that if I ever did meet Steve Gary I would leave him do the talking but I sure can't stand for his line at talk. He's plumb mean. I'll be mighty glad when we get through with this job, said Andy. Shucks. It won't take three hours. I know every tree and stump on this flat. We'll be drifting home long about four tomorrow. Chapter 16 The Open Holster if there ever was a morning calculated to inspire goodwill and heartiness in a human being it was that morning. The dawn came swiftly, battering through a fleece of clouds and painting the blue mesa in all the gorgeous and utterly indescribable colors of an Arizona sunrise. The air was crisp and so clear that it seemed to sparkle, like water. Andy White whistled as he gathered up the blankets and plodded toward the cabin. Pete felt like whistling, but for some reason he was silent. He followed Andy to the cabin and saw that the cowboy Cotton was making coffee. All we got is cold grub, stated Pete, but we got plenty for everybody. We fetched some coffee and bacon, said Cotton. But he did not invite them to eat. Pete glanced at Andy. Evidently Cotton had had his instructions or was afraid to make any friendly overtures. Gary was still lying on the mattress by the window, apparently asleep. Pete stepped to where his own gun hung and buckled it on. Let's mosey over to the spring and wash, he suggested to Andy. I ain't no dude, but I kinda like to wash before I eat. Here, too, said Andy. Maybe we can locate the horses on the way. When they returned to the cabin, Gary and Cotton were eating breakfast. 
P flung a pair of broken hobbles on the floor. Somebody's cayuse got rid of these, he stated casually. He knew that they had been on Gary's horse, as he had seen Gary hobble him. P turned and strode out. Andy was unwrapping their lunch. Presently Gary and Cotton appeared and picked up their ropes. Andy White, who had seen his own easily caught pony, graciously offered the use of it in hunting the strayed horse, but Gary declined the offer gruffly. He's so doggone mean his face hurts him, stated Pete, as Gary and Cotton set off together. We'll lose some time if his hoss has lit out for home, said Andy. Gary's doing all he can to make a job of it, declared Pete. But I don't wait for him. Soon's we finish eating I'm going to locate Blue Smoke and get to work. We can run that line without any help from them. Let him walk till they're tired. And what do you think of a couple of punchers, punchers, mind you, that sit down and eat bacon and drink coffee and don't as much as say come in? I don't waste time thinking about such, Andy. You finish up the grub. I got all I want. Shucks. This ain't all. We ain't touched the grub in your saddle pockets yet. Ma Bailey sure fixed us up right. That'll do for noon, said Pete. I'll run your hoss in, when I get blue smoke. Your hoss'll follow, anyway. Just a minute till I get my rope. Nope, you stay here. That blue smoke hoss knows me. If he spots two of us comin' he's like to get excited and mebby bust his hobbles and light out. I'll catch him all right. Just as you say, Pete. The sun was warming the air and it was pleasant to sit and watch the light clouds trail along the far horizon. Andy leaned back against the cedar and rolled a cigarette. He grinned as he recalled how Pete had called Gary at every turn, and yet had given the other no chance to find excuse for a quarrel. Pete was certainly a cool hand, for a kid. White, several years Pete's senior, always thought of him as not much more than a boy. Meanwhile Pete, who knew every foot of ground on the homestead, trailed through the scrub toward the spring. Down an occasional opening he could see the distant forest that edged the mesa, and once he thought he saw a horse's head behind a bush, but it turned out to be the stub of a fallen tree. The brush hid the cabin as he worked toward the timber. Presently he discovered blue smoke tracks and followed them down into a shallow hollow where the brush was thick. He wound in and out, keeping the tracks in sight and casually noting where the horse had stopped to graze. Near the bottom of the hollow he heard voices. He had been so intent on tracking the horse that he had forgotten Gary and Cotton. The tracks led toward the voices. Pete instinctively paused and listened, then shrugged his shoulders and stepped forward. A thick partition of brush separated him from the unseen speaker. Pete stopped midway in his stride. If you squat down here you can see the winder, right under this bush. The moon was shining. It was a plum easy shot. And it sure stopped homesteading in this end of the country. Gary was speaking. Pete drew a step nearer. You ain't saying who fired that shot, and Cotton laughed obsequiously. Pete stepped from behind the bush. Gary was facing toward the cabin. Cotton was squatting nearby smoking a cigarette. Tell him, said Pete. I want to know myself. What's it to you? Snarled Gary, and he stepped back. Gary's very attitude was a challenge. Pete knew that he could not drop his rope and pull his own gun quick enough to save himself. He saw Gary's hand move almost imperceptibly toward his holster. I reckon I made a mistake, said Pete slowly, and he let the rope slip from his hand as though utterly unnerved. I, I talked kinda quick, he stammered. Well, you won't make no more mistakes, sneered Gary, and he dropped his hand to his gun. You want to know who plugged that old hoss thief, Annersley? Eh? Well, what you goin' to say when I tell you it was me? Pete saw that Gary was working himself up to the pitch when he would kill. And Pete knew that he had but one chance in a thousand of breaking even with the killer. He would not have time to draw, but Montoya had taught him the trick of shooting through the open holster. Cotton heard Pete's hand strike the butt of his gun as the holster tilted up. Pete fired wise. Staring as though hypnotized. Gary clutched at his shirt over his chest with his free hand. He gave at the knees and his body wilted and settled down, even as he threw a desperate shot at Pete in a last venomous effort to kill. You seen it was an even break, said Pete, turning to Cotton, who immediately sank to his knees and implored Pete not to kill him. 
but I reckon you'd lie, anyhow, continued Pete, paying no attention to the other's mouthings. Honey your cayuse, and get a move on. Cotton understood that. Glancing over his shoulder at Gary he turned and ran toward the timber. Pete stepped to the crumpled figure and gazed at the bubbling hole in the chest. Then he stepped hack and mechanically holstered his gun which he had pulled as he spoke to Cotton. They'll get me for this, he whispered to himself. It was an even break, but they'll get me. Pete fought back his fear with a peculiar pride, the pride that scorned to appear frightened before his chum, Andy White. The quarrel had occurred so unexpectedly and terminated so suddenly, that Pete could not yet realize the full extent of the tragedy. While quite conscious of what he was doing and intended to do, he felt as though he were walking in a horrible dream from which he would never awaken. His instincts were as keen as ever, for he was already planning his next move, but his sensibilities had suffered a blunt shock, were numb to all external influence. He knew that the sun was shining, yet he did not feel its warmth. He was walking toward the cabin, and toward Andy. He stumbled as he walked, taking no account of the irregularities of the ground. He could hardly believe that he had killed Gary. To convince himself against his own will he mechanically drew his gun and glanced at the two empty shells. Three and two is five, he muttered. I shot Twicked. He did not realize that Gary had shot at him, that a shred of his flannel shirt was dangling from his sleeve where Gary's bullet had cut it. Wonder if Andy heard? He kept asking himself. I got to tell Andy. Almost before he realized it he was standing under the cedar and Andy was speaking. Thought I heard someone shoot, over toward the woods. As Pete did not answer, Andy thought that the horse had got away from him. Did you get him? He queried. Pete nodded dully. I got him. He's over there, in the brush. Why didn't you fetch him in? Did he get the best of you? You look like he give you a tussle. I got him, twicked, said Pete. Twicked. Say, Pete, are you loco? What's Alan new, anyhow? Nothing. Me and Gary just had it out. He's over there, in the brush. Gary. Yes. I reckon I got him. Hell. The ruddy color sank from Mandy's face. He had supposed that Gary and Cotton were by this time tracking this trade horses toward the T-Bar T. Where's Cotton? He asked. I told him to fan it. But, Pete. I know. They's no use talking, Andy. I come back to tell you and to get your rope. Mine's over by Gary. What you going to do, Pete? Me? Why, I'm going to drift as soon as I can get a saddle on Blue. Cotton he seen the shootin', but that don't do me no good. He'll swear that I pulled first. He'd say most anything, he was too scared to know what come off. Gary's hand was on his gun when I let him have it, twicked. Andy noticed then Pete's torn sleeve. I reckon that's right. Look at that. Pete turned his head and glanced at his sleeve. Never knowed he shot, it was all done so quick. He seemed to awaken suddenly to the significance of his position. I'll take your rope and go get smoke. Then I'm going to drift. But where? You're my partner, Andy, but I ain't saying. Then you won't have to lie. You'll have to tell Jim, and tell him it was like I said, if Gary come at me, that would be different. I'm leaving it to you to square me with Jim Bailey. Pete picked up the rope and started toward the spring. I'm going with you, said White, and catch my hoss. I aim to see you through with this. In an hour they were back at the cabin with the horses. Andy White glanced at his watch. Cotton is afoot, for I seen his hoss over there. But he can make it to the tea bar at tea in three hours. That'll give us a start of two hours, anyhow. I don't know which way you aim to ride, but, I'm playing this hand alone, stated Pete as he saddled blue smoke. No use your getting bad. White made no comment, but cinched up his pony. Pete stepped to him and held out his hand. So long, Andy. You been a mighty square partner. Nothing doing. Exclaimed Andy. I'm with you to the finish. Nope, Andy. If we was both to light out, you'd be in it as bad as me. Then what do you say if we both ride down to Concho and report to the sheriff? I tried that onct, when they killed Pop Hanersley. I know how that would work. But what you going to do? I'm riding, 
and Pete swung to his horse. Blue smoke pitched across the clearing under the spur and rain that finally turned him toward the south. Pete's sombrero flew off as he headed for the timber. Andy, reining round his horse, that fretted to follow, swung down and caught up Pete's hat on the run. Pete had pulled up near the edge of the timber. Andy, as he was about to give Pete his hat, suddenly changed it for his own. For luck. He cried, as Pete slackened rain and blue smoke shot down the dim forest trail. Pete, perhaps influenced by Montoya's example, always wore a high crown black sombrero. Andy's hat was the usual gray. In the excitement of leaving, Pete had not thought of that, but as he rode, he suspected Andy's motive, and glanced back. But Andy was not following, or if he were, he was riding slowly. Meanwhile Landy cheerfully put himself in the way of assisting Pete to escape. He knew the country and thought he knew where Pete was headed for. Before nightfall a posse would be riding the high country hunting the slayer of Gary. They would look for a cowboy wearing a black sombrero. Realizing the risk that he ran, and yet as careless of that risk as though he rode to a fiesta, young Andy deliberately turned back to where Gary lay, he had not yet been to that spot, and, dismounting, picked up Pete's rope. He glanced at Gary, shivered, and swung to his horse. Riding so that his trail would be easy to read he set off toward the open country, east. The fact that he had no food with him, and that the country was arid and that water was scarce, did not trouble him. All he hoped for was to delay or mislead the posse long enough to enable Pete to reach the southern desert. There Pete might have one chance in twenty of making his final escape. Perhaps it was a foolish thing to do, but Annie White, inspired by a motive of which there is no finer, did not stop to reason about it. He that giveth his life for a friend. Andy knew nothing of such a quotation. He was riding into the desert, quite conscious of the natural hazards of the trail, and keen to the possibilities that might follow in the form of an excited posse not too discriminating, in their eagerness to capture an outlaw, yet he rode with a light heart. After all, Pete was not guilty of murder. He had but defended his own life. Andy's heart was light because of the tang of adventure, and a certain appreciation of what a disappointed posse might feel and express, and because romance ran lightly beside him, hardening him on his way, romance, whose ears are deaf to all moral considerations and whose eyes see only the true adventurer, be he priest or pirate, romance whose eyes are blind to those who fear to dare. Chapter 17 a false trail. Sure he's dead. Reiterated Cotton. Didn't I see them two holes plumb through him and the blood soak in his shirt when I turned him over? If I'd a had my gun on me that young Pete would be right side of Steve, right now. But I couldn't do nothing without a gun. Pete Annersley was plumb scared. That's why he killed Steve. Just you give me a gun and watch me ride him down. I aim to settle with that Jay. Cotton was talking to Hawk of the T Bar T, blending fact and fiction in a blustering attempt to make himself believe he had played the man. During his long, foot-weary journey to the ranch he had roughly invented this speech and tried to memorize it. Through repetition he came to believe that he was telling the truth. Incidentally he had not paused to catch up his horse, which was a slight oversight, considering the trail from the blue to his home ranch. What's the matter with the gun you're packing? asked Ha Oog. Cotton had forgotten his own gun. I, it was like this, Bill. After young Pete killed Gary, I went back to the shack and got my gun. At first, Andy White wasn't going to leave me have it, but I tells him to fan it. I reckon he's pretty nigh home by now. Thought you said you didn't see White after the shooting, that he forked his horse and rode for the concho. Cotton, you're lying so fast you're like to choke. Honest. Bill. If I'd a had my gun. Oh, hell. Don't try to swing that bluff. Where's your horse? I couldn't catch him, honest. Thought you said you caught him in the brush and tied him to a tree and young Annersley threatened to kill you if you went for your saddle. That's right, honest, Bill, that's what he said. Then how is it that Bobby Lent caught your horse straying in Morin a hour ago? Damn if I believe a word you say. You're plumb crazy. Honest, Bill. I hope to die if Steve Gary ain't layin' over there with two holes in him. He's sure dead. 
Do you think I footed it all the way just because I like walking? Hawk frowned and shook his head. You say him and young Pete had come to words? Yep, about a layman Annersley. Steve was telling me about the raid when Pete steps up and tells him to say it over again. Steve started to talk when Pete cuts down on him, twicked. My God, he was quick. I never even seen him draw. Did Gary say he was the one that plugged Annersley? Yep. Said he did it, and asked Pete what he was going to do about it. Then Steve was drunk or crazy. You go get a horse and burn the trail to Kuncho. Tell Sutton that young Pete Annersley killed Gary, up to the Blue Mesa. Tell him we're out after young Pete. Can you get that straight? What if the sheriff was to pinch me for being in that scrap? You. In a gunfight? No. He wouldn't believe that if you told him so. You just tell Sutton what I said, and get going. Don't lie to him, or he'll spot it and pinch you damn quick. With Cotton gone, Hawk saddled up and rode out to where one of his men was mending fence. Take your horse and get all the boys you can reach before night. Young Pete Annersley shot Steve over to the blue this morning. The cowboy, unlike Cotton, whistled his surprise, dropped his tools, mounted, and was off before Hawk had reined back toward the ranch house. It was near twelve that night when a quiet band of riders dismounted at the Annersley cabin, separated, and trailed off in the darkness to look for Gary. One of them found him where he had fallen and signaled with his gun. They carried Gary to the cabin. In the flickering light of the open stove they saw that he was still alive. There was one chance in a thousand that he could recover. They washed his wounds and one of the men set out toward Concho, to telephone to and write for a doctor. The rest grouped around the stove and talked in low tones, waiting for daylight. Chances are the kid went south, said Hawk, half to himself. How about young White? queried a cowboy. I dunno. Either he rode with Pete Annersley or he's back at the Kuncho. Daylight'll tell. If Steve could talk, said the cowboy. I guess Steve is done for, said Hawk. I knew young Pete was a tough kid, but I didn't figure he'd try to down Steve. Supposing they both had a hand in it, White and young Pete? Hawk shook his head. Anybody got any whiskey? He asked. Someone produced a flask. Hawk knelt and raised Gary's head tilting the flask carefully. Presently Gary's lips moved and his chest heaved. Who is it? White? Questioned Hawk. Gary moved his head in the negative. Young Pete? Gary's white lips shaped to a faint whisper, yes. One of the men folded a slicker and put it under Gary's head. Hawk stood up. I guess it's up to us to get Pete Annersley. You can count me out, said a cowboy immediately. Steve was a less hunt in trouble and it looks like he found it this trip. They's plenty without me to ride down the kid. Young Pete may be bad, but I figure he had a damn good excuse when he plugged Steve, here. You can count me out. And me, said another. If young Pete was a growed man, same here, interrupted the third. Any kid that's got nerve enough to down Steve has got a right to get away with it. If you corner him he's going to fight and get bumped off by a bunch of growed men, maybe four to one. That ain't my style. Hawk turns to several cowboys who had not spoken. They were Gary's friends, of his kind, in a measure. How is it, boys? asked Hawk. We stick, said one, and the others nodded. Then you boys and Hawk indicated the first group, can ride back to the ranch. Or, here, Larkin, you can stay with Steve till the doc shows up. The rest of you can drift. Without waiting for dawn the men who had refused to go out after Pete rode back along the hill trail to the ranch. But before they left, Hawk took what hastily packed food they had and distributed it among the posse, who packed it in their saddle pockets. The remaining cowboys lay down for a brief sleep. They were up at dawn, and after a hasty breakfast set out looking for tracks. Hawk himself discovered Andy White's tracks leading from the spot where Gary had been found, and calling the others together, set off across the eastern mesa. Meanwhile Andy White was sleeping soundly in a coulee many miles from the homestead, and just within sight of a desert ranch, to which he had planned to ride at daybreak, ask for food and depart, leaving the impression that he was Pete Annersley in haste to get beyond the reach of the law.
He had stopped at the coulee because he had found grass and water for his horse and because he did not want to risk being found at the ranch house. A posse would naturally head for the ranch to search and ask questions. Fed and housed he might oversleep and be caught. Then his service to Pete would amount to little. But if he rode in at daybreak, ahead of the posse, ate and departed, leaving a hint as to his assumed identity, he could mislead them a day longer at least. He built all his reasoning on the hope that the posse would find and follow his tracks. Under the silent stars he slept, his head on his saddle, and near him lay Pete's black sombrero. In the disillusioning light of morning, that which Andy had taken to be a ranch house dwindled to a goat herder's shack fronted by a brush-roofed lean-to. Near it was a diminutive corral and a sun-faded tent. The old Indian herder seemed in no way surprised to see a young rider dismount and approach cautiously, for Andy had entered into the spirit of the thing. He paused to glance apprehensively back and survey the western horizon. Andy greeted the Indian, who grunted his acknowledgement in the patois of the plains. Any vaqueros ride by here this morning? queried Andy. The herder shook his head. Well, I guess I got time to eat, said Andy. A faint twinkle touched the old Indian's eyes, but his face was as expressionless as a dried apple. See, he said. But not a whole lot of time, asserted Andy. The Indian rose and fetched a pail of goat's milk and some tortillas from the shack. He shuffled back to his hermitage and reappeared with a tin cup. Andy, who meanwhile had consumed one leathery tortilla, shook his head. Never mind the cup, amigo. He tilted the pail and drank paused for a breath, and drank again. He set the pail down empty. I was some dry, he said, smiling. Got any more of these rawhide flapjacks? The herder nodded, stooped to enter the shack, and came out with a half dozen of the tortillas, which Andy rolled and stuffed in his saddle pocket. Mighty good trail bread, he said enthusiastically. You can't wear them out. Again the herder nodded covertly studying this young rider who did not look like an outlaw, whose eye was clear and untroubled. Well, what did it matter question mark a man must eat? The old Indian had given unquestioningly from his poverty, with the simple dignity of true hospitality. As for who this stranger was, of what he had done, that was none of his affair. A man must eat. I am paying for this, and Andy proffered a silver dollar. The other turned the piece round in his fingers as though hesitating to accept it. See. But has not the senor some little money? That's all right, amigo. Keep it. The herder shook his head, and held up two fingers. Andy smiled. I get you. You don't aim to bank all your wealth in one lump. Let me see. All I got left is a couple of two-bit pieces. Want em? The herder nodded and took the two coins and handed back the dollar. Then he padded stolidly to the shack and reappeared, bearing a purple velvet jacket which was ornamented with buttons made from silver quarters. He held it up, indicating that two of the buttons were missing. Makaka, he grunted, pointing toward the south. I get you. Your girl is out looking after the goats, and you aim to kind of surprise her with a full set of buttons when she gets back. She'll ask you right quick where you got them, eh? A faint grin touched the old Indian's mouth. The young vaquero was of the country. He understood. Well, it beats me, said Andy. Now, a white man is all for the big money. He'd take the dollar, get it changed, and be two bits ahead, every time. But I got to drift along. Say, amigo, if any of my friends come a boil line down this way, just tell him that Pete, that's me, was in a hurry, and headed east. Sabe? See. Pete, with the black sombrero. Andy touched his hat. See. Pete. Adios. Wished I could take a goat along. That milk was sure comfortin'. The herder watched Andy mount and ride away. Then he plodded back to the shack and busied himself patiently soldering tiny rings on the silver pieces, that the set of buttons for his daughter's jacket might be complete. He knew that the young stranger must be a fugitive. Otherwise he would not have written into the desert so hurriedly. He had not inquired about water, nor as to feed for his horse. Truly he was in great haste. Life meant but three things to the old Indian. Food, sleep, and physical freedom. 
he had once been in jail and had suffered as only those used to the open sky suffer when imprisoned. The young vaquero had eaten, and had food with him. His eyes had shown that he was not in need of sleep. Yet he had all but said there would be men looking for him. The old Indian rose and picked up a blanket. In the doorway he paused, surveying the western horizon. Satisfied that no one was in sight, he padded out to where Andy had tied his horse and swept the blanket across the tracks in the loose sand. Walking backwards he drew the blanket after him, obliterating the hoof prints until he came to a rise where the ground was rocky. Without haste he returned and squatted in the shack. He was patiently working on a silver piece when someone called out peremptorily. The old Indian's face was expressionless as he nodded to the posse of cowboys. Seen anything of a young fella right in a blue roan and sporting a black hat? Asked Ha Oog. The Indian shook his head. He's lying, asserted a cowboy. Comes as natural as breathing to him. We trailed a hoss to this here wiki up the hot lust of the man hunt was in the cowboy's eyes as he swung down, and we aimed to see who was riding him. Hawk and his three companions sat their horses as the fourth member of the posse shouldered the old Indian aside and entered the shack. Nothing in there, he said, as he reappeared, but somebody's been here this morning. And he pointed to the imprint of a high-heeled boot in the sand of the yard. Which way did he ride? Asked Hawk, indicating the footprint. The old herder shook his head. Queen Sabe? He grunted, shrugging his shoulders. Who knows, eh? Well, you know, for one. And you're going to say, or there'll be a heap of big bonfire right here where your shack is. Meanwhile one of the men, who had pushed out into the desert and was riding in a circle, hallooed and waved his arm. He headed this way, he called. Some one dragged a blanket over his trail. The cowboy who was afoot strode up to the herder. We'll learn you to play hoss with this outfit. He swung his quirt and struck the Indian across the face. The old Indian stepped back and stiffened. His sunken eyes blazed with hatred, but he made no sound or sign. He knew that if he as much as lifted his hand the men would kill him. To him they were the law, searching for a fugitive. The welt across his face burned like the sear of fire, the cowardly brand of hatred on the impassive face of primitive fortitude. This because he had fed a hungry man and delayed his pursuers. Long after the posse had disappeared down the far reaches of the desert, the old Indian stood gazing toward the east, vaguely wondering what would have happened to him had he struck a white man across the face with a quirt. He would have been shot down, and his slayer would have gone unpunished. He shook his head, unable to understand the white man's law. His primitive soul knew a better law, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth a law that knew no caste and was as old as the sun-swept spaces of his native land. He was glad that his daughter had not been there. The white men might have threatened and insulted her. If they had, the old herder padded to his shack and squatted down, to finish soldering the tiny rings on the buttons for his daughter's jacket. Chapter 18 The Black Sombrero When Andy had ridden far enough to feel secure in turning and riding north, in fact, his plan was to work back to the Concho in a wide circle, he reined in and dismounted. From a low ridge he surveyed the western desert, approximated his bearings, and had his foot in the stirrup when he saw four tiny dots that bobbed up and down on the distant skyline of the west. He had left an easy trail to follow and the pursuers were riding hard. They were still a long distance from him. He led his horse down the far side of the ridge and mounted. He rode straight east for perhaps a quarter of a mile. Then he turned and at right angles to his trail sped north behind the long, low, sandy ridge. He could not be seen until the posse had topped it, and even then it was probable they would fling down the slope, following his tracks until they came to where he had turned. Straight ahead of him the ridge swung to the left. In half an hour or so he would again cross it, which he hoped to do before he was discovered. Once over the ridge, he would head for the Concho. To follow him would mean that his pursuers would be riding directly away from Pete's trail. Many long desert miles lay between Andy and the Concho, but he argued that his horse was as fresh as the horses of his pursuers. He would give them a good run. If they overtook him before they reached the ranch, the most they could do would be to curse him for misleading them. He reasoned that the posse was from the T-Bar-T, 
that at best the sheriff could not have been advised of the shooting in time to join them. They would have no official right to detain him or interfere with his progress, once they knew who he was. A trot, a lope, then back to a swing and trot again, and as yet no riders had appeared on the hills. Andy was making good time. The crest of the ridge shimmered in the noon sun. At this pace he would be over and down the western side before they saw him. When the posse finally caught sight of the man they were after far out across the level and riding toward the west, they knew at once that he was making for the concho and what protection his fellows might afford him under the circumstances. This did not fit into their scheme. The manhunt had tuned their pulses to a high pitch. They wanted to lay hands on Gary's slayer, to disarm him and bring him into the town of Kincho themselves, or, if he showed fight, to get him. They forgot that he was little more than a boy. He was an enemy, and potently dangerous. It's young Pete, said a cowboy. I know him by that black hat. Plying quirt and spur the posse flung down the ridge and out across the plain below. They would ride their quarry down before he reached the boundary of the Kincho before he got among his friends. And he turned and glanced back. They were gaining on him. He knew that his own horse was doing his best. Again he glanced back. The riders were forcing their horses to a terrific pace that could not last long. In a mile or so they would be close enough to use their rifles. But the harder they rode the better Andy liked it. They would be in sorry shape to make the long ride south after Pete, when they realized that they were chasing the wrong man. If he could get out of it without getting shot, he would consider himself lucky. Ahead of him lay a flat of brushless land offering no shelter. He hoped that his horse would not be killed by a chance shot. In that event his pride would force him to retaliate, until he was either killed or captured. He had about made up his mind to rein up and surrender when he heard the singing with zip of a bullet that sprayed sand ahead of him. Then came the faint pop of a rifle far behind. He pulled up swiftly unbuckled his belt, and hung his gun on the saddle horn. Then he stepped away from his horse, an unconsciously fine thing to do, and turned toward the distant posse. Again came that shrill, sinister whiz-zip and he was standing bareheaded in the glaring sun as the black sombrero spun round and settled lightly in the sand beside him. He wisely thrust up his hands, arguing that if the posse could see to shoot with such accuracy they could see and possibly appreciate his attitude. He felt outraged, and wanted to fight. He did not realize at the moment that his pursuers were acting in good faith according to their viewpoint. Meanwhile they flung toward him, spreading out fanwise in case of some possible treachery. Without moving a muscle Andy stood with his hands raised, blinkingly trying to identify each individual rider. There was Hunk on his big gray cow horse. To the left rode Simpson, known all over the range as Gary's close friend. Andy half expected to see Cotton with the posse, but Cotton was not there. He did not recognize the two riders on the wings of the posse. Mornin', fellas. He called as the cowboys swept up. What's the idea? This. Snarled Simpson as he took out his rope. Hold on. Cried Hauk, dismounting and covering White. This ain't our man. It's young Andy White. You might have found that out before you started shootin', said Andy lowering his hands. My gun's on the saddle there. Despite the fact that it was Andy White, Hawk took no chances, but searched him. Then, what in hell was your idea? Me? Why, I was riding to the Concho when one of you guys shot my hat off. I reckoned it was about time to pull up. Riding to the Concho, eh? I suppose you'll say next that you got lost and thought the Concho was over this way? Nope. I was riding to the Concho to report the shooting of Steve Gary to my boss. Hauk, who had imagined that White would disclaim any knowledge of the shooting until forced to admit it, took a new tack. Where's Pete Annersley? That's just what I was wondering. Last time I see him he was fanning at East. I took out after him, but I must have missed him. That'll do to tell the sheriff. We want to know what you know about the shooting up of Steve. Nothing. I was over by the shack waiting for Pete when I thought I heard a couple of shots. Didn't pay no attention to that, cause Pete was always popping his gun at something. Then pretty soon Pete walks in, and I go out with him and help him catch his hoss. He don't say much, and I don't. 
Then first thing I know he lights on that little buckskin hoss of his, and forgets his hat, interrupted Hawk. Nope. He was wearing a hat the last I seen of him. And riding the buckskin cayuse, eh? Now Cotton says it was a blue roan. And he laughed. That hombre Cotton's got mighty poor eyesight. Why, he couldn't see good enough to catch up his own hoss. Pew told me Cotton set out for home afoot. I didn't see him, but I'd take Pete's word against Cotton's any time. Maybe you think we're talking your word about young Pete, and the shootin'? Why not? We can make you talk. Threatened Simpson. I reckon you could, said Andy easily. Four to one, and my gun hangin' over there on the saddle horn. But suppose you did? How are you going to know I'll talk straight or lie to you? You ain't throwed any big scare into me yet and Andy stooped and caught up his hat and thrust his finger through the hole in the crown, because I ain't done nothing to be scared about. I ain't shot nobody and I ain't seen nobody get shot. Cotton coulda told you that. That's right, asserted Hawk reluctantly. White here had nothing to do with the shootin'. Cotton said that. We lost some time trail and new Hawk turns to Andy, but we don't aim to lose any more. Which way did young Pete ride? Andy laughed. You would say I lied if I told you. But I'm going to tell you straight. Young Pete took the old ranger trail south, through the timber. And I want to tell you gentlemen he was going like hell a smokin' when I seen him last. Maybe you don't believe that? And there's something else, that old ranger trail forks three times this side of Sheenigas, and she forks twice afore she crosses the line. She's a dim trail when she's doing her best across to the rocks, and they's places in her where she's as blind as a dead ox. Water is as scarce as cow punchers at a camp meeting and they ain't no feed this side of showdown. And showdown never tore its shirt trying to be polite to strangers. I've been there. Course, when it comes to rustlers and card sharps and killers, but you fellas know how that is. I, come on, boys, said Hawk, reining round. White here is putting up a talk to hold us, and young Pete's using the time. Andy watched them ride away, a queer expression lighting his face. They hate like the Ole Scratch to believe me, and they are hating themselves for having to. He pulled off Pete's hat and turned it over, gazing at the two little round holes curiously. Pete, old scout, he said, smiling whimsically, here's hoping they never come closer to get a new than they did to get in me. Keep a ridin'. For you sure got to be that ridin' kid from Powder River this journey, and then some. And he turned the black sombrero round in his hands. All this here hocus comes of the killin' of a old man that never lifted a finger against nobody, and as game a kid as ever raked a hoss with a spur. But one killin' always means more. I ain't no gunman, or no killer. But, by cracky. Some of my ideas has changed since I got that hole in my hat. I wish I'd a road with Pete. I wouldn't ask nothing better right now than to stand back to back with him, out in the open somewhere and let him come. Because why? Because the only law that a man's got in this country is his self, and if he's right, why, crossin' over with his gun explainin' his ideas ain't the worst way to go. Anyhow, it ain't any worse than gettin' throwed from a bronc and getting his neck broke or gettin' stomped out in a stampede. Them's just regular common ways of going out. I just wonder how Pete is making it. Andy put on his hat, glanced at the sun, and strode to his pony. Far across the eastern desert he saw the posse, a mere moving dot against the blue. Wolf hungry to make a killin' because they're fooling themselves that they're actin' out the law. Well, come on, Chico, old hoss, we got to make home before sundown. Chapter 19 The Spider Where the Old Ranger Trail Crossing the Blue Mesa, leaves the High Mesa and meanders off into the desert, there is a fork which leads southwest, to the Apache country, a grim and waterless land, and finally swings south toward the border. Pew dismounted at this fork, pulled up his slackened cinches, and making certain that he was leaving a plain track, rode down the main trail for half a mile. Then he reined his pony to a bare spot on the grass dot a tufa, and again dismounted. He looped Blue Smoke's four feet, then threw him, and pulled his shoes with a pair of wire nippers, and stowed the shoes in his saddle pockets. He again rode directly down the trail, 
surmising that the occasional track of a barefoot horse would appear natural enough should the posse, whom he knew would follow him, split up and ride both trails. Farther on he again swung from the trail to the tufa, never slackening pace, and rode across the broken ground for several miles. He had often seen the unshodden and branded ponies of the high country run along a trail for a mile or so and then dash off across the open. Of course, if the posse took the direct trail to the border, paying no attention to tracks, they would eventually overtake him. Pete was done with the companionship of men who allowed the wanton killing of a man like Annersley to go unpunished. He knew that if he were caught, he would most probably be hanged or imprisoned for the shooting of Gary if he were not killed in being taken. The t bar -t interests ruled the courts. Moreover, his reputation was against him. Ever since the raid on Annersley's place Pete had been pointed out as the kid who stood off the raiders and got two of them. And Pete knew that the very folk who seemed proud of the fact would be the first to condemn him for the killing of Gary. He was outlawed, not for avenging the death of his foster father, but actually because he had defended his own life a fact difficult to establish in court and which would weigh little against the evidence of the six or eight men who had heard him challenge Gary at the roundup. Jim Bailey had been right. Men talked too much as a usual thing. Gary had talked too much. Pete realized that his loyalty to the memory of Annersley had earned him disrepute. He resented the injustice of this, and all his old hatred of the law revived. Yet despite all logic of justice as against law, he could see Gary's hand clutching against his chest, his staring eyes, and the red ooze starting through those tense fingers, Pete reasoned that had he not been so skilled and quick with a gun, he would be in Gary's place now. As it was, he was alive and had a good horse between his knees. To ride an unshod horse in the southern desert is to invite disaster. Toward evening, Pete pulled up at a waterhole, straightened the nails in the horseshoes and tacked them on again with a piece of rock. They would hold until he reached the desert town of Showdown, a place of ill repute and a rendezvous for outlawry and crime. He rode on until he came within sight of the town, a dim huddle of low buildings in the starlight. He swung off the trail, hobbled his horse, fastened his rope to the hobbles, and tied that in turn to a long, heavy slab of rock, and turned in. He would not risk losing his horse in this desert land. At best a posse could not reach showdown before noon the next day, and rather than blunder into showdown at night and take unnecessary risks, he decided to rest, and ride in a sunup, when he would be able to see what he was doing and better estimate the possibilities of getting food for himself and his horse and of finding refuge in some out-of-the-way ranch or homestead. In spite of his vivid imaginings he slept well. At dawn he caught up his pony and rode into town. Showdown boasted some fifteen or eighteen low-roofed adobes, the most pretentious being the saloon. These all faced a straggling road which ran east and west, disappearing at either end of the town as though anxious to obliterate itself in the clean sand of the desert. The environs of Showdown were garnished with tin cans and trash, dirt and desolation. Unlike the ordinary cow town this place was not sprightly, but morose, with an aspect of hating itself for existing. Even the railroad swung many miles to the south as though anxious to leave the town to its own pernicious isolation. The fixed population consisted of a few Mexicans and one white man, known as the Spider, who ran the saloon and consequently owned Showdown Body and, but Showdown had no soul. Men arrived and departed along the several desert trails that led in and out of the town. These men seldom tarried long. And they usually came alone, perchance from the blue the Gila, the t bar -t, or from below the border, for their business was with the border rustlers and parasites. Sheriffs of four counties seldom disturbed the place, because a man who had got as far south as Showdown was pretty hard to apprehend. From there to the border lay a trackless desert. Showdown was a rendezvous for that inglorious legion, the men who can't come back, renegades who went below the line worked machine guns for whichever side of the argument promised the more loot. Horse and cattle thieves, killers, escaped convicts, came and went, ominous birds of passage, the scavengers of war and banditry. The spider was lean, with legs warped by long years in the saddle. He was called the spider because of his physical attributes as well as because of his attitude toward life. He never went anywhere 
yet he accumulated sustenance. He usually had a victim tangled in his web. It was said that the spider never let a wounded outlaw die for a lack of proper tension if he considered the outlaw worth saving, as an investment. And possibly this was the secret of his power, for he was ever ready to grub steak or doctor any gentleman in need or wounded in a desert affair, and he had had a large experience in caring for gunshot wounds. Pete, dismounting at the worn hitching rail, entered the saloon, nodded casually to the spider, and called for a drink. The spider, who always officiated at the bar for politic reasons, aside from the selling of liquor, noticed that the young stranger's eyes were clear and steady, that he showed no trace of hard night riding, yet he had arrived in showdown at sunup. As Pete drank, the spider sized up his horse, which looked fresh. He had already noticed that Pete's gun hung well down and handy, and assumed correctly that it was not worn for ornament. The spider knew that the drink was a mere formality that the stranger was not a drinking man in the larger sense. Neither spoke until a Mexican, quite evidently in haste, rode up and entered the saloon. The Mexican bore the strange news that four riders were expected to reach showdown that day, perhaps by noon. Then the spider spoke, and Pete was startled by the voice, which was pitched in a high key yet was little more than a whisper. The Mexican began to expostulate shrilly. The spider had cursed him for a loud-mouthed fool. Again came that sinister whisper, like the rush of a high wind in the reeds. The Mexican turned and silently left the room. When Pete, who had pretended absorption in thought, glanced up, the spider's eyes were fixed on Pete's horse, which had swung around as the Mexican departed. The spider's deep-set eyes shifted to Pete, who smiled. The spider nodded. Interpreted this would have read, I see you ride a horse with the Kincho brand. And Pete's eyes had retorted, I sure do. I was waiting for you to say that. Still the spider had not addressed his new guest nor had Pete uttered a word. It was a sort of cool, deliberate duel of willpower. Pete turned his head and surveyed the long room leisurely. The spider pushed the bottle toward him, silently inviting him to drink again. Pete shook his head. The spider hobbled from behind the bar and moving quickly across the room flung open the back door, discovering a patio set with tables and chairs. Pew nodded. They were establishing a tentative understanding without speech. The test was hard for Pete. The spider was uncanny, though quick of movement and shifty of eye, intensely alive with all. As for the spider himself, he was not displeased. This was but a youth yet a youth who was not unfamiliar with the fine points of a rendezvous. The back door opened on a patio and the door in the wall of the patio opened on a corral. The corral bars opened to the desert, Pete had almost sensed that, without seeing farther than the patio, and had nodded his approval, without speaking. The spider considered this highly commendable. Pete knew at a glance that the spider was absolutely without honor, that his soul was as crooked as his badly bowed legs and that he called no man friend and meant it. And the spider knew, without other evidence than his own eyes found, that this young stranger would not hesitate to kill him if sufficient provocation offered. Nor did this displease the autocrat of showdown in the least. He was accustomed to dealing with such men. Yet one thing bothered him. Had the stranger made a getaway that would bring a posse to showdown, as the Mexican had intimated? If so the sooner the visitor left, the better. If he were merely some cowboy looking for easy money and excitement, that was a different matter. Or perhaps he had but stolen a horse, or butchered and sold beef that bore a neighbor's brand. Yet there was something about Pete that impressed the spider more deeply than mere horse or cattle stealing could. The youth's eye was not the eye of a thief. He had not come to show down to consort with rustlers. He was somewhat of a puzzled, but the spider, true to his name, was silently patient. Meanwhile the desert sun rolled upward and onward, blazing down on the huddled adobes, and slowly filtering into the room. With his back to the bar, Pete idly flicked bits of a broken match at a nut hole in the floor. Tired of that, he rolled a cigarette with one hand, and swiftly. Pete's hands were compact, of medium size, with the finger joints lightly defined, the hands of a conjurer, or, as the spider thought, of a born gunman and Pete was always doing something with his hands, even when apparently oblivious to everything around him. 
a novice at reading men would have considered him nervous. He was far from nervous. This was proven to the spider's satisfaction when Malve entered, bull Malve, red-headed, bluff and huge, of a gaunt frame, with large knuckled hands and big feet. Malve tossed a coin on the bar noisily, and in that one act Peter read him for what he was, a man who bullied his way through life with much bluster and profanity, but a man who, if he boasted, would make good his boast. What appeared to be hearty good nature in Malve was in reality a certain blatantly boisterous vigor, a vigor utterly soulless, and masking a nature at bottom as treacherous as the spider's, but in contrast squalid and mean. Malve would steal five dollars. The spider would not touch a job for less than five hundred. While cruel, treacherous, and a killer, the spider had nothing small or mean about him. And subtle to a degree, he hated the blunt spoken blustering mouth, but for reasons unadvertised, called him friend. Have a drink? Thanks. And Pete poured himself a noticeably small quantity. This is mouth, bull mouth, said the spider, hesitating for Pete to name himself. Pete's my name. I left the rest of it to home. Malve laughed. That goes. How's things over to the concho? I ain't been there since yesterday. The spider blinked which was a sign that he was pleased. He never laughed. Malve winked at the spider. You ain't riding back that way today, mebby? I'd like to send word, Pete shook his head. Nope. I aim to stay right here a spell. If you're intending to keep that horse out there, perhaps you'd like to feed him. And the spider indicated the direction of the corral with a twist of the head. Which is correct, said Pete. Help yourself, said the spider. I get you said pete significantly and he turned and strode out what in hell is he talking about query malve his horse malve frowned some smooth kid eh the spider nodded pete appreciated that his own absence was desired that these men were quietly curious to find out who he was and what he had done that brought him to showdown but malve knew nothing about pete nor of any recent trouble over kincho way and pete Unsaddling his pony, knew that he would either make good with the spider or else he would make a mistake, and then there would be no need for further subterfuge. Pete surveyed the corral and outbuildings. The whole arrangement was cleverly planned. He calculated from the position of the sun that it lacked about three hours of noon. Well, so far he had played his hand with all the cards on the table, card for card with the spider alone. Now there would be a new deal. Pete would have to play accordingly. When he again entered the saloon, from the rear, the spider and Malve were standing out in the road, gazing toward the north. I see only three of them, he heard the spider say in his peculiar, high-pitched voice. And Pete knew that the speech was intended for his ear. Nope. Four. Said Malve positively. Pete leaned his elbow on the bar and watched them. Malve was obviously acting his part, but the spider's attitude seemed sincere. Pete, he called. Malve says there are four riders drifting in from the north. I make it three. You're both wrong and you got about three hours to find it out in, said Pete. Malve and the spider glanced at one another. Evidently Pete was more shrewd than they had suspected. And evidently he would be followed to show down. It's a killing, whispered the spider. I thought that it was. How do you size him up? Pretty smooth, for a kid, said Malve. Worth a blanket? Queried the spider, which meant, worth hiding from the law until such time as vertical bar blanket was not necessary. I'd say so. They turned and entered the saloon. The spider crept from the middle of his web and made plain his immediate desire. Strangers are welcome in showdown, riding single, he told Pete. We aren't hooked up to entertain a crowd. If you got friends coming, friends that are suffering to see you, why, you ain't here when they come and you ain't been here. If nobody is following your smoke, why, take your time. I'll be talking my hoss when he gets done feed, stated Pete. The spider nodded approval. Showdown had troubles of its own. Malve, did you say you were riding south? Huh. Kinda funny, but I was heading south myself, said Pete. Being a stranger I might get lost alone. Which wouldn't scare you none, guffawed, Malve. Which wouldn't scare me none, said Pete. But a crowd of friends, riding in sudden, 
suggested the spider. I'd be plumb scared to death, said Pete. I got your number, asserted the spider. Then hang her on the rack. But hang her on the right hook. One, two, or three? queried the spider. Make it three, said Pete. The spider glanced sharply at Pete, who met his eye with a gaze in which there was both a challenge and a confession. Yet there was no boastful pride in the confession. It was as though Pete had stated the simple fact that he had killed a man in self-defense, perhaps more than one man, and had earned the hatred of those who had the power to make him pay with his life, whether he were actually guilty or not. If this young stranger had three notches in his gun, and thus far had managed to evade the law, there was a possibility of his becoming a satellite among the spider's henchmen. Not that the spider cared in the least what became of Pete, save that if he gave promise of becoming useful, it would be worthwhile helping him to evade his pursuers this once at least. He knew that if he once earned Pete's gratitude, he would have one staunch friend. Moreover, the spider was exceedingly crafty, always avoiding trouble when possible to do so. So he set about weaving the blanket that was to hide Pete from anyone who might become too solicitous about his welfare and so disturb the present piece of showdown. The spider's plan was simple, and his instructions to Malv brief. While Pete saddled his horse, the spider talked with Malv. Take him south, to Flores's rancho. Tell Flores he is a friend of mine. When you get a chance, take his horse, and fan it over to Blake's. Leave the horse there. I want you to set him afoot at Flores's. When I'm ready, I'll send for him. What do I get out of it? Why, the horse. Blake'll give you a hundred for that guy use, if I am any judge of a good animal. He'll give me fifty, maybe. Blake ain't paying too much for any hosses that I fetch in. Then I'll give you the other fifty and settle with Blake later. That goes, spider. The spider and Malv stepped out as Pete headed out with blue smoke in front of the saloon. We're riding, said Malv, as Pete spurred his pony to the rail. Pete leaned forward and offered his hand to the spider. I'll make this right with you, said Pete. Forget it, said the spider. Showdown dozed in the desert heat. The street was deserted. The Mexican who helped about the saloon was asleep in the patio. The spider opened a new pack of cards, shuffled them and began a game of solitaire. Occasionally he glanced out into the glare, blinking and muttering to himself. Malvin Pete had been gone about an hour when a lean dog that had lain across from the hitching rail, rose, shook himself, and turned to gaze up the street. The spider called to the man in the patio. He came quickly. I'm expecting visitors, said the spider in Mexican. The other started toward the front doorway, but the spider called him back with a word and gestured to the door back of the bar, the doorway to the spider's private room. The Mexican entered the room and closed the door softly, drew up a chair, and sat close to the door in the attitude of one who listens. Presently he heard the patter of hooves, the grunt of horses pulled up sharply, and the tread of men entering the saloon. The Mexican drew his gun and rested his forearm across his knees, the gun hanging easily in his half-closed hand. He did not know who the men were nor how the spider had known that they were coming, but he knew what was expected of him in case of trouble. The spider sat directly across from the door behind the bar. Anyone talking with him would be between him and the door. Guess we'll have a drink, and talk later, said Hauk. The spider glanced up from his card game, and nodded casually. The sound of shuffling feet, and the Mexican knew that the strangers were facing the bar. He softly holstered his gun. While he could not understand English, he knew by the tone of the conversation that these men were not the enemies of his wizened master. Seen anything of a kind of dark-complected young fellow wearing a black Stetson and riding a blue roan? Queried Hawk. Where was he from? Counter the spider. The Concho, and riding a hoss with the Concho brand. Wanted bad? Yes, a whole lot. He shot Steve Gary yesterday. Gary of the T. Bar T? The same and a friend of mine, interpolated the cowboy Simpson. Huh. You say he's young, just a kid? Yes. But a damn tough kid. Pete Annersley, eh? Not the young Pete that was mixed up in that raid a few years ago? The same. No, I didn't see anything of him, said the spider. We trailed him down this way. The spider nodded. 
and we mean to keep right on riding, till we find him, blurted Simpson. Hawk realized that the spider knew more than he cared to tell. Simpson had blundered in stating their future plans, Hawk tried to cover the blunder. We like to get some chuck, enough to carry us back to the ranch. I'm short on chuck, said the spider. If you men were deputies, sworn in regular, why, I'd have to give it to you. Simpson was inclined to argue, but Hawk stopped him. Guess we can make it all right, he said easily. Come on, boys. Hawk, wiser than his companions, realized the uselessness of searching farther, a fact obvious even to the hot-headed Simpson when at the edge of the town they tried to buy provisions from a Mexican and were met with a shrug and a reiterated no save. And that just about settles it, said Hawk as he reined his pony round and faced north. Chapter 20 Bull Malve. Malve, when not operating a machine gun for Mexican bandits, was usually busy evading a posse on the American side of the border. Needless to say, he knew the country well, and the country knew him only too well. He had friends, of a kind, and he had enemies of every description and color from the swart, black eyed gullies of Sonora to the ruddy, blue eyed rangers of Texas. He trusted no man, and no man who knew him trusted him. Not even the spider, though he could have sent Malv to the penitentiary on any one of several counts. Malv had no subtlety. He simply knew the game and possessed a tremendous amount of nerve. Like most red-headed men, he rode a rough shot and aggressively to his goal. He bowled his way through, when more capable men of equal nerve failed. Riding beside him across the southern desert, young Pete could not help noticing Malv's hands, huge knuckled and freckled and Pete surmised correctly that this man was not quick with a gun. Pete also noticed that Malv roughed his horse unnecessarily, that he was a good rider, but a poor horseman. Pete wondered that desert life had not taught Malv to take better care of his horse. As yet Pete knew nothing of their destination, nor did he care. It was good to be out in the open, again with a good horse under him. The atmosphere of the Spider's saloon had been too tense for comfort. Pete simply wanted to vacate showdown until such time as he might return safely. He had no plan, but he did believe that showdown would know him again. He could not say why. And it was significant of young Pete's descent to the lower plane that he should consider showdown safe at any time. Pete was in reality never more unsafe than at the present time. While space and a swift pony between his knees argued of bodily freedom, he felt uneasy. Perhaps because of Malv's occasional covert glance and blue smoke, for Pete saw much that he did not appear to see. Pete became cautious forthwith, studying the lay of the land. It was a bad country to travel, being so alike in its general aspect of butte and arroyo, sand and cacti, that there was little to lay hold upon as a landmark. A faint line of hills edged the far southern horizon and there were distant hills to the east and west. They journeyed across an immense basin sun-smitten, desolate, unpromising. Just plain hell, said Malv as though reading Pete's thought. You act like you was to home all right, laughed Pete. Malv glanced quickly at his companion, alive to an implied insult, but he saw only a young, smooth-cheeked rider in whose dark eyes shone neither animosity nor friendliness. They jogged on, neither speaking for many miles. When Malv did speak, his manner was the least bit patronizing. He could not quite understand Pete, yet the spider had seemed to understand him. As Pete had said nothing about the trouble that had driven him to the desert, Malv considered silence on that subject emanated from a lack of trust. He wanted to gain Pete's confidence, for the time being at least. It would make it that much easier to follow the spider's instructions in regard to Pete's horse. But to all Malv's hints Pete was either silent or jestingly unresponsive. As the journey thinned the possibilities of Pete's capture, it became monotonous, even to Malv, who set about planning how he could steal Pete's horse with the least risk to himself. Aside from the spider's instructions Malv coveted the pony, a far better horse than his own, and he was of two minds as to whether he should not keep the pony for his own use. The concho was a long cry from showdown, while the horse Malv rode had been stolen from a more immediate neighborhood. As for setting this young stranger afoot in the desert, that did not bother Malv in the least. No posse would ride farther south than Showdown, and with Pete afoot at Flores's rancho, 
Mav would be free to follow his own will, either to Blake's ranch or farther south and across the border. Whether Pete returned to showdown or not was none of Mav's affair. To get away with the horse might require some scheming. Mav made no further attempt to draw Pete out, but rode on in silence. They came upon the cannon suddenly, so suddenly that Pete's horse shied and circled. Mav, leading, put his own pony down a steep and winding trail. Pete followed, fixing his eyes on a far green spot at the bottom of the cannon, and the thin thread of smoke above the trees that told of a habitation. At a bend in the trail, Mav turned in the saddle, we'll bush down here. Friends of mine. Pete nodded. They watered their horses at the thin trickle of water in the cannon bed and then rode slowly past a weirdly fenced field. Presently they came to a rude adobe stable and scrub cedar corral. A few yards beyond, and hidden by the bushes, was the house. A pockmarked Mexican greeted Malv gruffly. The spider's name was mentioned, and Pete was introduced as his friend. The horses were corralled and fed. As Pete entered the adobe, a thin, listless Mexican woman, Flores's wife, called to someone in an inner room. Presently Flores's daughter appeared, supple of movement and smiling. She greeted Malv as though he were an old friend, cast down her eyes at Pete's direct gaze, and straightway disappeared again. From the inner room came the sound of a song. The young stranger with Malv was good-looking, quite worth changing her dress for. She hoped he would think her pretty. Most men admired her. She was really beautiful in her dark, southern way, and some of them had given her presents, a cheap ring, a handkerchief from old Mexico, a pink and, to her, wonderful brush and comb. Boca d'Alzura, or pretty mouth of the Flores Rancho, cared for no man, but she liked men, especially when they gave her presents. When she came from her room, Malv laughingly accused her of fixing up because of Pete, as he teased her about her gay rebosa and her crimson sash. She affected scorn for his talk, but was naturally pleased. And the young stranger was staring at her, which pleased her still more. This here hombre is Pete, said Malv. He left his other name to home. And he laughed raucously. Pete bowed, taking the introduction quite seriously. Boca was piqued. This young caballero did not seem anxious to know her, like the other men. He did not smile. Pete, she lisped with a tinge of mockery in her voice. Pete has not learned to talk yet, he is so young. Malv slapped his thigh and guffawed. Pete stood solemnly eyeing him for a moment. Then he turned to the girl. I ain't used to talking to women, especially pretty ones, like you. Boca clapped her hands. There. Boo Malv has never said anything so clever as that. Boo Malv frowned. But he was hungry, and Flores's wife was preparing supper. Despite Boca's pretty mouth and fine dark eyes, which invited to conversation, Pete felt very much alone, very much of a stranger in this out-of-the-way household. He thought of his chum Andy White, and of Ma Bailey and Jim, and the boys of the Concho. He wondered what they were doing, if they were talking about him, and Gary. It seemed a long time since he had thrown his hat in the corner and pulled up his chair to the Concho table. He wished that he might talk with someone. He was thinking of Jim Bailey, and tell him just what there had been to the shooting. But with these folks, the shadows were lengthening. Already the lamp on Flores's table was lighted, there in the kitchen where Malv was drinking wine with the old Mexican. Pete had forgotten Boca, almost forgotten where he was for the moment, when something touched his arm. He turned a startled face to the girl. She smiled and then whispered quickly, It is that I hate that bull Malv. He is bad. Of what are you thinking, senor? Pete blinked and hesitated. Of my folks, back there, he said. Boca darted from him as her mother called her to help set the table. Pete's lips were drawn in a queer line. He had no folks back there or anywhere. It was her eyes made me feel that way, he thought. And, doggone it, I'm living, anyhow. From the general conversation at the table that evening Pete gathered that queer visitors came to this place frequently. It was a kind of isolated, halfway house between the border and showdown. He heard the name of Scarface, White Eye, Sonora Jim, Shio Verdugo, a rare assortment of border vagabonds known by name to the cowboys of the high country. The spider was frequently mentioned. 
It was evident that he had some peculiar influence over the Flory's household, from the respectful manner in which his name was received by the whole family. And Pete, unfamiliar with the goings and comings of those men, their quarrels, friendships, and sinister escapades, ate and listened in silence, realizing that he too had earned a tentative place among them. He found himself listening with keen interest to Malv's account of a machine gun duel between two white men, comma, renegades and leaders and opposing factions below the border, comma, and how one of them, shot through and through, stuck to his gun until he had swept the plaza of enemy sharpshooters and had then crawled on hands and knees to the other machine gun, killed its wounded operator with the six shooter, and turned the machine gun on his fleeing foes shooting until the Mexicans of his own company had taken courage enough to return and rescue him. And he's in El Paso now, concluded Malf, at the hospital. He writ to the spider for money, and the spider sure sent it to him. Who was he fighting for? queried Pete, interested in spite of himself. Fighting for? For his self. Because he likes the game. You don't want to get the idea that any white man is down there fighting just to help a lot of dirty greasers on either side of the scrap. A quick and significant glance shot from Boca's eyes to her mother's. Old Flores ate stolidly. If he had heard he showed no evidence of it. Bull Mouth. A darn good name for him, thought Pete. And he felt a strange sense of shame at being in his company. He wondered if Flores were afraid of Malv or simply indifferent to his raw talk. And Pete, who had never gone out of his way to make a friend decided to be as careful of what he said as Malv was careless. Pete had never lacked nerve, but he was endowed with considerable caution, a fact that the spider had realized and so had considered him worth the trouble of hiding, as an experiment. After supper the men sat out beneath the vine-covered portal, Malv and Flores with a wicker-covered demijohn of wine between them, and Pete lounging on the doorstep, smoking and gazing across the cannon at the faint stars of an early evening. With the wine, old Flores's manner changed from surly indifference to a superficial politeness which in no way deceived Pete. And Malf, whose intent was plainly to get drunk, boasted of his doings on either side of the line. He hinted that he had put more than one Mexican out of the way, and he slapped Flores on the back, and Flores laughed. He spoke of raids on the horse herds of white men, and through some queer perversity inspired in his drink openly asserted that he was the slickest hoss thief in Arizona, turning to Pete as he spoke. I'll take your word for it, said Pete. But what's the use of sitting out here like a couple of damn buzzards when the ladies are waiting for us in there? queried Malf, and be leered at Flores. The old Mexican grunted and rose stiffly. They entered the dobe, Malf insisting that Pete come in and hear Boca sing. I can listen out here. Pete was beginning to hate Malf, with the cold. Deliberate hatred born of instinct. As for old Flores, Pete despised him heartily. A man that could hear his countrymen called a dirty bunch of greasers, and have nothing to say, was a pretty poor sort of a man. Disgusted with Malv's loud talk and his raw attitude toward Boca, Pete sat in the moon flung shadows of the portal and smoked and gazed at the stars. He was half asleep when he heard Boca tell Malv that he was a pig and the son of a pig. Malv laughed. There came the sound of a scuffle. Pete glanced over his shoulder. Malv had his arm around the girl and was trying to kiss her. Flores was watching them, grinning in a kind of drunken indifference. Pete hesitated. He was there on sufferance, a stranger. After all, this was none of his business. Boca's father and mother were also there. Boca screamed. Malv let go of her and swung round as Pete stepped up. What's the ide, Malv? You don't draw no cards in this deal, snarled Malv. Then we shuffle and cut for a new deal, said Pete. Malv's loose mouth hardened as he backed toward the corner of the room, where Boca cringed, her hands covering her face. Suddenly the girl sprang up and caught Malv's arm, no. No. She cried. He flung her aside and reached for his gun, but Pete was too quick for him. They crashed down and rolled across the room. Pete wriggled free and rose. In a flash he realized that he was no match for Malv's brute strength. He had no desire to kill Malv, but he did not intend that Malv should kill him. Pete jerked his gun loose as Malv staggered to his feet, but Pete dared not shoot on account of Boca. He saw Malv's hand touch the butt of his gun, 
when something crashed down from behind. Pute dimly remembered Boca's white face, and the room went black. Malv strode forward. Old Flores dropped the neck of the shattered bottle and stood gazing down at Pete. The good wine is gone. I break the bottle, said Flores, grinning. To hell with the wine. Let's pack this young tin horn out where he won't be in the way. But as Malv stooped, Boca flung herself in front of him. Pig. She flamed. She turned furiously on her father, whose vacuous grin faded as she cursed him shrilly for a coward. Listless and heavy-eyed came Boca's mother. Without the slightest trace of emotion she examined Pete's wound, fetched water and washed it, binding it up with a handkerchief. Quite as listlessly she spoke to her husband, telling him to leave the wine and go to bed. Flores mumbled a protest. Malv asked him if he let the women run the place. Boca's mother turned to Malv. You will go, she said quietly. Malv cursed as he stepped from the room. He could face Boca's fury, or face any man in a quarrel, but there was something in the death-like quietness of the sad-eyed Mexican woman that chilled his blood. He did not know what would happen if he refused to go, yet he knew that something would happen. It was not the first time that Flores's wife had interfered in quarrels of the border outlaws sojourning at the ranch. In showdown men said that she would as soon knife a man as not. Malv, who had lived much in old Mexico, had seen women use the knife. He went without a word. Boca heard him speak sharply to his horse, as she and her mother lifted Pete and carried him to the bedroom. Chapter 21 Boca del Zura Just before dawn Pete became conscious that someone was sitting near him and occasionally bathing his head with cool water. He tried to sit up. A slender hand pushed him gently back. It is good that you rest, said a voice. The room was dark, he could not see, but he knew that Boca was there and he felt uncomfortable. He was not accustomed to being waited upon, especially by a woman. Where's Mal? He asked. I do not know. He is gone. Again Pete tried to sit up, but sank back as a shower of fiery dots whirled before his eyes. He realized that he had been hit pretty hard, that he could do nothing but keep still just then. The hot pain subsided as the wet cloth again touched his forehead and he drifted to sleep. When he awakened at midday he was alone. He rose, and steadying himself along the wall, finally reached the doorway. Old Flores was working in the distant garden patch. Beyond him, Boca and her mother were pulling beans. Pete stepped out dizzily and glanced toward the corral. His horse was not there. Pete was a bit hasty in concluding that the squalid drama of the previous evening, the cringing girl, the drunkenly indifferent father, and the malevolent Malv, had been staged entirely for his benefit. The fact was that Malv had been only too sincere in his burishness toward Boca. Flory's equally sincere in his indifference, and Boca herself actually frightened by the turn Malv's drink had taken. That old Flory's had knocked Pete out with a bottle was the one and extravagant act that even Malv himself could hardly have anticipated had the whole miserable affair been prearranged. In his drunken stupidity Flory's blindly imagined that the young stranger was the cause of the quarrel. Pete, however, saw in it a frame-up to knock him out and make away with his horse. And back of it all he saw the spider's craftily flung web that held him prisoner, afoot and among strangers. They worked it slick, he muttered. Boca happened to glance up. Pete was standing bareheaded in the noon sunlight. With an exclamation Boca rose and hastened to him. Young Pete's eyes were sullen as she begged him to seek the shade of the portal. Where is my horse? He challenged, ignoring her solicitude. She shook her head. I do not know. Malv is gone. That's a cinch. You sure worked it slick. I do not understand. Well, I do. Pute studied her face. Despite his natural distrust, he realized that the girl was innocent of plotting against him. He decided to confide in her, even play the lover if necessary, and he hated pretense, to win her sympathy and help, for he knew that if he ever needed a friend it was now. Boca studied him to the bench just outside the doorway and fetched water. He drank and felt better. Then she carefully unrolled the bandage, washed the clotted blood from the wound and bound it up again. It is bad that you come here, she told him. Well, I got one friend, anyhow, said Pete. See, I am your friend, 
she murmured. I ain't what you'd call hungry, but I reckon some coffee would kind of stop my head from swimming round, suggested Pete. See, I will get it. Pete wondered how far he could trust the girl, whether she would really help him or whether her kindness were such as any human being would extend to one injured or in distress, same as a dog with his leg broke, thought Pete. But after he drank the coffee he ceased worrying about the future and decided to take things and they came and make the best of them. Perhaps it is that you have killed a man? Ventured Boca, curious to know why he was there, Pete hesitated, as he eyed her sharply. There seemed to be no motive behind her question other than simple curiosity. I've put better men than Malv out of business, he asserted. Boca eyed him with a new interest. She had thought that perhaps this young senor had but stolen a horse or two, a most natural inference in view of his recent associate. So this young vaquero was a boy in years only question mark and outlawed. No doubt there was a reward for his capture. Boca had lightly fancied young Pete the evening before, but now she felt a much deeper interest. She quickly cautioned him to say nothing to her father about the real reason for his being there. Rather Pete was to say, if questioned, that he had stolen a horse about which Malv and he had quarreled. Pete scowled. I'm no low-down hoss thief. He flared. Boca smiled. Now it is that I know you have killed a man. Pete was surprised that the idea seemed to please her. But my father she continued, he would sell you, for money. So it is that you will say that you have stolen a horse. I reckon he would, and Pete gently felt the back of his head. So I'll tell him like you say. I'm depending a whole lot on you, to get me out of this, he added. You will rest, she told him, and turned to go back to her work. I am your friend, she whispered, pausing with her finger to her lips. Pete understood and nodded. So far he had done pretty well, he argued. Later, when he felt able to ride, he would ask Boca to find a horse for him. He knew that there must be saddle stock somewhere in the cannon. Men like Flores always kept several good horses handy for an emergency. Meanwhile Pete determined to rest and gain strength, even while he pretended that he was unfit to ride. When he did leave, he would leave in a hurry and before old Flores could play him another trick. For a while Pete watched the three figures puttering about the bean patch. Presently he got up and stepped into the house, drank some coffee, and came out again. He sat down on the bench and took mental stock of his own belongings. He had a few dollars in silver, his erratic watch, and his gun. Suddenly he bethought him of his saddle. The sun made his head swim as he stepped out toward the corral. Yes, his saddle and bridle hung on the corral bars just where he had left them. He was about to return to the shade of the portal when he noticed the tracks of unshod horses in the dust. So old Flores had other horses in the cannon? Well, in a day or so Pete would show the Mexican a trick with a large round hole in it, the hole representing the space recently occupied by one of his ponies. Incidentally Pete realized that he was getting deeper and deeper into the meshes of the spider's web, and the thought spurred him to a keener vigilance. So far he had killed three men actually in self-defense. But when he met up with Malv, and Pete promised himself that pleasure, he would not wait for Malv to open the argument. Got to kill to live, he told himself. Well, I got the name, and I might as well have the game. It's nobody's funeral but mine, anyhow. He felt, mistakenly, that his friends had all gone back on him a condition of mind occasioned by his misfortunes rather than by any logical thought, for at that very moment Jim Bailey was searching high and low for Pete in order to tell him that Gary was not dead, but had been taken to the railroad hospital adding right, operated on, and now lay, minus the fragments of three or four ribs, as malevolent as ever, and slowly recovering from a wound that had at first been considered fatal. Young Pete was not to know of this until long after the knowledge could have had any value in shaping his career. Bailey, with two of his men, traced Pete as far as showdown, where the trail went blind, ending with the spider's apparently sincere assertion that he knew nothing whatever of Peter's whereabouts. Paradoxically, those very qualities which won him friends now kept Pete from those friends. The last place toward which he would have chosen to ride would have been the Concho and the last man he would have asked for help would have been Jim Bailey. 
Pewt felt that he was doing pretty well at creating trouble for himself without entangling his best friends. Got to kill to live, he reiterated. Comus the, senor? Old Flores had just stepped from behind the crumbling dobe wall of the stable. Well, it ain't your fault I ain't a furnish in a argument for the coyotes. The senor would insult Boca. He was drunk, said Flores. Hold on there. Don't you go cantilipping off with any little ole idea like that sewed up in your hat. Which senor was drunk? Flores shrugged his shoulders. Who may say? He half whined. Well, I can, for one, asserted Pete. You was drunk and Malv was drunk, and the two of you damn near fixed me. But that don't count, now. Where's my hoss? Queen Sabe? You make me sick, said Pete in English. Flores caught the word sick and thought Pete was complaining of his physical condition. The senor is welcome to rest and get well. What is done is done, and cannot be mended. But when the senor would ride, I can find a horse, a good horse and not a very great price. I'm willing to pay, said Pete, who thought that he had already pretty well paid for anything he might need. And a good saddle, continued Flores. I'm using my own rig, stated Pete. It is the saddle, there, that I would sell to the senor. The old Mexican gestured toward Pete's own saddle. Pete was about to retort hastily when he reconsidered. The only way to meet trickery was with trickery. All right, he said indifferently. You'll sure get all that is coming to you. Chapter 22 A dress, or a ring, perhaps. All that day Pete lay in the shade of the doby feigning indifference to Boca as she brought him water and food until even she was deceived by his listlessness, fearing that he had been seriously injured. Not until evening did he show any sign of interest in her presence. With the shadows it grew cooler. Old Flores sat in the doorway smoking. His wife sat beside him, gazing at the far rim of the evening cannon. Presently she rose and stepped round to where Pete and Boca were talking. You will go, said Boca's mother abruptly. Boca shall find a horse for you. Pete, taken by surprise comma Boca's mother had spoken just when Pete had asked Boca where her father kept the horses comma stammered in acknowledgement of her presence, but the Mexican woman did not seem to hear him. Tonight, she continued, Boca will find a horse. It is good that you go, but not that you go to show down. I sure want to thank you both. But, honest, I wouldn't know where else to go but to show down. Besides, I got a hunch Malv was headed that way. That is as a man speaks, said the senora. My man was like that once, but now, I'm broke, no dineros, said Pete. It is my horse that he shall have, Boca began. But her mother interrupted quietly. The young senora will return, and there are many ways to pay. We are poor. You will not forget us. You will come again, alone in the night. And it is not Malv that will show you the way. Not if I see him first. Senora. You jest, but even now you would kill Malv if he were here. You sure are telling Malv's fortune, laughed Pete. Can you tell mine? Again you jest, but I will speak. You will not kill Malv, yet you shall find your own horse. You will be hunted by men, but you will not always be as you are now. Some day you will have wealth, and then it is that you will remember this night. You will come again at night, and alone, but Boca will not be here. You will grow weary of life from much suffering, even as I then it is that you will think of these days and many days to come, and these days shall be as wine in your old age, Boca's mother paused as though listening. But like wine, and again she paused. Headache? queried Pete. Well, I know how that feels, without the wine. That fortune sounds good to me, all except that about Boca. Now, maybe you could tell me which way Malv was headed? He has ridden to show down. So that red-headed hoss thief fanned it right back to his boss, eh? He must have thought I was fixed for good. It is his way. Men spake truly when they called him the bull. He is big, but he is as a child. Well, there's going to be one mighty sick child for somebody to nurse, right soon, stated Pete. I have said that it is bad that you ride to show down. But you will go there, and he whom men call the spider, he shall be your friend, even with his life. As quietly as she came the Mexican woman departed, 
leaving Boca and Pete gazing at each other in the dusk. She makes me afraid sometimes, whispered Boca. Sounds like she could just plumb see what she was talking about. Kind of second sight, I reckon. Wonder why she didn't put me wise to Malv when I live in here with him? It woulda saved a heap of trouble. It is the dream, said Boca. These things she has seen in a dream. I ain't got nothing against your all a, your mother, Boca, but by the way I'm feeling, she's sure due to have a bad one, right soon. You do not believe? queried Boca quite seriously. Kind of, half. I don't aim to know everything. She said you would come back, and Boca smiled. That dream will sure come true. I ain't forgetting. But I ain't going to wait till you're gone. Boca touched Pete's hand. And you will bring me a present. A dress, or a ring, perhaps? You can just bank on that. I don't aim to travel where they make them regular, but you sure get that present, after I settle with Malv. That is the way with men, pouted Boca. They think only of the quarrel. You got me wrong, senorita. I don't want to kill nobody. The big day is to keep from getting bumped off myself. Now you'd think a whole lot of me if I was to ride off and forget all about what Malv done? I would go with you, said Boca softly. Honest? Well, you'd sure make a good partner. Pete eyed the girl with a new interest. Then he shook his head. I, you'd sure make a good partner, but it would be mighty tough for you. I'd do most anything, but that. You see, Chisida, I'm in bad. I'm like to get mine most any time. And I ain't no ladies man, no how, but you will come back? queried Boca anxiously. As sure as you're living. Only you want to kinda educate your layman to handle bottles more easy like. He ought to know what they're made for. Your head, it is cool said Boca, reaching up and touching Pete's forehead. Oh, I'm feeling fine, considering. Then I am happy, said Boca. Pete never knew just how he happened to find Boca's hand in his own. But he knew that she had a very pretty mouth, and fine eyes, eyes that glowed softly in the dusk. Before he realized what had happened, Boca was in his arms, and he was telling her again and again that he sure would come back. She murmured her happiness as he kissed her awkwardly and quickly, as though bidding her a hasty farewell. But she would not let him go with that. Mi amor. Mi corazon. She whispered, as she clasped her hands behind his head and gently drew his mouth to hers. Pete felt embarrassed, but his embarrassment melted in the soft warmth of her affection and he returned her kisses with all the ardor of youth. Suddenly she pushed him away and rose. Her mother had called her. About twelve, whispered Pete. Tell your Ole man I'll bush out here. It's a heap cooler. She nodded and left him. Pete heard Flores speak to her gruffly. Somebody ought to put that Ole side of bacon in the well, soliloquized Pete. I could stand for the Ole lady, all right, and Boca sure is a lily, but I was forgetting I got to ride to showdown tonight. Chapter 23 The Devil Wind As Pete lay planning his departure, he wondered if Boca would think to find him a canteen and food for his long ride. The stars, hitherto clear-edged and brilliant, became blurred as though an almost invisible mist had drifted between them and the earth. He rubbed his eyes. Yes, there was no mistake about it. He was wide awake, and the sky was changing. That which had seemed a mist now appeared more like a fine dust, that swept across the heavens and dimmed the desert sky. It occurred to him that he was at the bottom of a fairly deep cannon and that that impalpable dust meant wind, a little later he heard it come at first to faint, far away sound like the whisper of many voices, then a soft, steady hiss as when wind-driven sand runs over sand. A hot wind sprang up suddenly and swept with a rush down the night-walled cannon. It was the devil wind of the desert, the wind that curls the leaf and shrivels the vine, even in the hours when there is no sun. When the devil wind drives, men lie naked beneath the sky in sleepless misery. Horses and cattle stand with heads lowered and flanks drawn in, suffering an invisible torture from which there is no escape. The dawn brings no relief, no freshening of the air. The heat drives on, three days, say those who know the southern desert, and no man rides the trails, but seeks what shade may be, and lies torpid and silent, or if he speaks, it is to curse the land. 
Pete knew that this devil wind would make old Flory's restless. He stepped round to the doorway and asked for water. From the darkness within the adobe came Flores's voice and the sound of a match against wood. The Mexican appeared with a candle. My head feels queer, stated Pete, as an excuse for disturbing Flores. I can't find the alma, and I'm dead for a drink. Then we shall drink this, said Flores, fetching a jug of wine from beneath the bench. Not for mine. I'm dizzy enough, without that. It is the devil wind. One may get drunk and forget. One may then sleep. And if one sleeps, it is not so bad. Pete shook his head, but tasted the wine that Flores poured for him. If the old man would only get drunk enough to go to sleep. The Mexican's oily, pockmarked face glistened in the flickering candlelight. He drank and smacked his lips. If one is to die of the heat, one might as well die drunk, he laughed. Drink, senor. Pete sipped the wine and watched the other as he filled and emptied his glass again. It is the good wine, said Flores. The candlelight cast a huge, distorted shadow of the Mexican's head and shoulders on the farther wall. The faint drone of the hot wind came to them from the plains above. The candle flame fluttered. Flores reached down for the jug and set it on the table. All night we shall drink of the good wine, for no man may sleep, I'm with you, said Pete. Only I ain't so swift. No man may sleep, reiterated Flores, again emptying his tumbler. How about the women folks? queried Pete. Flores waved his hand in a gesture indicative of supreme indifference to what the women folks did. He noticed that Pete was not drinking and insisted that he drink and refill his glass. Pete downed the raw red wine and presently complained of feeling sleepy. Flores grinned. I do not sleep, he asserted. Not until this is gone and he struck the jug with his knuckles. Pete felt that he was in for a long session, and inwardly cursed his luck. Flores's eyes brightened and he grew talkative. He spoke of his youth in old Mexico, of the cattle and the women of that land. Pete feigned a heaviness that he did not feel. Presently Flores's talk grew disconnected, his eye became dull and his swarthy face was mottled with yellow. The sweat which had rolled down his cheeks and dripped from his nose, now seemed to coagulate in tiny, oily globules. He put down a half-empty tumbler and stared at Pete. No man sleeps, he mumbled, as his lids drooped. Slowly his chin sank to his chest and he slumped forward against the table. Pete started to get up. Flores raised his head. Drink, senor, he murmured, and slumped forward, knocking the tumbler over. A dark red line streaked the table and dripped to the floor. Something moved in the kitchen doorway. Pete glanced up to see Boca staring at him. He gestured toward her father. She nodded indifferently and beckoned Pete to follow her. I knew that you would think me a lie if I did not come, she told him, as they stood near the old corral, Pete's impatience to be gone evident, as he shouldered his saddle. But you will not ride tonight. You would die. It's some hot but I aim to go through. But no, not tonight. For three days will it be like this. It is terrible. And you have been ill. She pressed close to him and touched his arm. Have I not been your friend? You sure have. But honest, Boca, I got a hunch that it's time to fan it. T ain't that I'm sore at your old man now, or want to leave you. But I got a hunch something is going to happen. You think only of that mouth. You do not think of me complained Boca. I'm sure thinking of you every minute. It ain't mouth that's bothering me now. Then why do you not rest, and wait? Because resting and waiting is worse than talking to Chanked. I got to go. You must go? Pew nodded. But what if I will not find a horse for you? Then I reckon you been fooling me right along. That is not so. Boca's hand dropped to her side and she turned from him. Course it ain't. And say, Boca. I'll make it through all right. All I want is a good hoss, and a canteen and some grub. I have made ready the food and have a canteen for you, in my room. Then let's go hunt up that cayuse. It is that you will die, she began, but Pete, irritated by argument and the burning wind that droned through the cannon, put an end to it all by dropping the saddle and taking her swiftly in his arms. He kissed her, rather perfunctorily. My little pardonor, he whispered. Boca, 
although sixteen and mature in a sense, was in reality little more than a child. When P chose to assert himself, he had much the stronger will. She felt that all pleading would be useless. You have the riata? She queried, and turning led him past the corral and along the fence until they came to the stream. A few hundred yards down the stream she turned, and cautioning him to follow closely, entered a sort of lateral cannon, a veritable box at whose farther end was Flores's cache of horses, kept in this hidden pasture for any immediate need. Pete heard the quick trampling of hooves and the snort of startled horses. We will drive them on into the corral, said Boca. Pete could see but dimly, but he sensed the situation at once. The cannon was a box, narrowing to a natural enclosure with the open end fenced. He had seen such places, called traps by men who made a business of catching wild horses. Several dim shapes sponged in the small enclosure, plunging and circling as Pete found and closed the bars. The yellow horses of the desert, and very strong, said Boca. They all look alike to me, laughed Pete. It's mighty dark, right now. He slipped through the bars and shook out his rope. The horses crowded away from him as he followed. A shape reared and backed. Pete flipped the noose and set his heels as the rope snapped taut. He held barely enough slack to make the snubbing post, but finally took a turn round it and fought the horse up. Blamed if he ain't the buckskin, panted Pete. The sweat dripped from his face as he bridled and saddled the half-wild animal. It was doubly hard work in the dark. Then he came to the corral bars where Boca stood. I'm all hooked up, Boca. Then I shall go back for the cantina and the food. I'll go right along with you. I'll wait at the other corral. Pete followed her and sat a nervous horse until she reappeared, with the canteen and package of food. The hot wind purred and whispered round them. Above, the stars struggled dimly through the haze. Peter reached down and took her hand. She had barely touched his fingers when the horse shied and reared. If mouth he kill you, I shall kill him. She whispered fiercely. I'm coming back, said Pete. A shadow flung across the night, and Boca was standing gazing into the black wall through which the shadow had plunged. Far up the trail she could hear quick hoofbeats, and presently above the drone of the wind came a faint musical adios. Adios. She dared not call back to him for fear of waking her father, in spite of the fact that she knew he was drugged beyond all feeling and sound. And she had her own good reason for caution. When Flores discovered his best horse gone, there would be no evidence that would entangle her or her mother in wordy argument with him for having helped the young vaquero to leave, and against the direct commands of the spider, who had sent word to Flores through Malv that Pete was to remain at the rancho till sent for. At the top of the cannon trail Pete reined in and tried to get his bearings. But the horse, fighting the bit, seemed to have a clear idea of going somewhere and in the general direction of showdown. You ought to know the trail to showdown, said Pete. And you ain't trying to get back home, so go to it. I'll be right with you. The heavy, hot wind seethed round him and he bent his head, tying his bandana across his nose and mouth. The boxkin bored into the night, his unshod hooves pattering softly on the desert trail. His first fine frenzy done, he settled to a swinging trot that ate into the miles ceaselessly. Twice during the ride Pete raised the canteen and moistened his burning throat. Slowly he grew numb to the heat and the bite of the whipping sand, and rode as one in a horrible dream. He had been a fool to ride from comparative safety into this blind furnace of burning wind. Why had he done so? And again and again he asked himself this question, wondering if he were going mad. It had been years and years since he had left the Flores Rancho. There was a girl there, Boca Dalzura, or had he dreamed of such a girl? Pete felt the back of his head. No. It was not a dream, he told himself. A ghastly dawn burned into showdown, bearing the town's ugliness as it crept from doby to doby as though in search of some living thing to torture with slow fire. The street was a windswept emptiness, smooth with fine sand. Pete rode to the hitching rail. The spider's place was dumb to his knocking. He staggered round to the western side of the saloon and squatted on his heels. Water that pony after a while, he muttered. Strange flashes of light danced before his eyes. His head pained dully and he ached all over for a lack of sleep. A sudden trampling brought him to his feet. 
He turned the corner of the saloon just in time to see the buckskin lunge back. The reins snapped like a thread. The pony shook its head and trotted away, circling. Pete followed, hoping that the tangle of dragging rein might stop him. Half dazed, Pete followed doggedly, but the horse started to run. Pete staggered back to the hitching rail, untied the end of the broken rein and tossed it across the street. He did not know why he did this, he simply did it mechanically. He was again afoot, weak and exhausted from his night's ride. I reckon that Olay Mexican woman, was right, he muttered. But I got one partner yet, anyhow, and his hand slid to his holster. You and me agin the whole damn town. God, it's hot. He slumped to the corner of the saloon and squatted, leaning against the wall. He thought of Boca. He could hear her speak his name distinctly. A shadow drifted across his blurred vision. He glanced up. The spider, naked to the waist, stood looking down at him, leanly grotesque in the dawn light. You were going strong, said the spider. I want mouth, whispered Pete. The spider's lips twitched. You'll get some coffee and beans first. Any man that's got enough sand to foot it from Flory's here, can camp on me any time, coming or going. I'm working this case myself, stated Pete sullenly. You play your own hand, said the spider. And for once he meant it. He could scarcely believe that young Pete had made it across the desert on foot, yet there was no horse in sight. If young Pete could force himself to such a pace and survive he would become a mighty useful tool. Did Mouth play you? queried the spider. You ought to know. He said you were sick, down at Flores's rancho. Then he's here. And Pete's stalling eyes brightened. Well, I ain't as sick as he's going to be, spider. Chapter 24 A rider stood at the lamplit bar. Pete was surprised to find the darkened saloon cooler than the open desert, even at dawn, and he realized, after glancing about, that the spider had closed the doors and windows during the night to shut out the heat. In here, said the spider, opening the door back of the bar. Pete followed, groping his way into the spider's room. He started back as a match flared. The spider lighted a lamp. In the sudden soft glow Pete beheld a veritable storehouse of plunder, gorgeous serapes from old Mexico, blankets from Duantepec and Oaxaca, reboses of woven silk and linen and wool, the cruder colorings of the Navajo and Hopi saddle blankets, war bags and buckskin garments heavy with the beadwork of the Utes and black feet, a buffalo hide shield, an Apache bow and quiver of arrows, skins of the mountain lion and lynx, and hanging from the beam and a silver mounted saddle and bridle and above it a Mexican sombrero heavy with golden filigree. You've rambled some, commented Pete. Some. What's the matter with your head? Your friend Flory's handed me one, from behind, said Pete. The spider gestured toward a blanket-covered couch against the wall. Lay down there. No, on your face. Huh. Wait till I get some water. Pete closed his eyes. Presently he felt the light touch of fingers and then a soothing coolness. He heard the spider moving about the room. The door closed softly. Pete raised his head. The room was dark. He thought of Malv and he wondered at the spider's apparent solicitude. He was in the spider's hands, for good or ill. Sleep blotted out all sense of being. Late that afternoon he awoke to realize that there was someone in the room. He raised on his elbow and turned to see the spider gazing down at him with a peculiar expression, as though he were questioning himself and awaiting an answer from some outside source. Pete stretched and yawned and grinned lazily. Hello, Pardnor. I was dreaming of a friend of mine when I come to and saw Pete hesitated, sat up and yawned again, another friend that I wa and he dreamin' about, he concluded. What makes you think I'm your friend? queried the spider. Oh, hell, I dunno, said Pete, rubbing the back of his head and grinning boyishly. But there's no law agin my feelin' that way, is there? Dog on it, I'm plumb empty. Feel like my insides had been talking a day off and had come back just pawing the air to get to work. Mouths in town. Pete's mouth hardened, then relaxed to a grin. Well, if he's as hungry as I am he ain't worrying about me. He's got your horse. That don't worry me none. I told Mouth to get your horse from you and set you afoot at Flory's. And he sure made a good job of it, didn't he? 
but I don't save your game and hog tying me down to Flores's place. I figured you'd be safer if foot till you kind of cooled down. Pete tried to read the spider's face, but it was as impersonal as the desert itself. Maybe you figured to hold me there till you was good and ready to use me, said Pete. The spider nodded. Well, there's nothing doing. I ain't no killer or no hoss thief looking for a job. I got in bad up north, but I ain't looking for no more trouble. If Malv and me lock horns, that's my business. But you got me wrong if you reckon I'm going to throw in with your outfit. I can pay for what I eat a couple of times, anyhow. But I ain't hiring out to no man. Go back in the patio and Juan will get you some chuck, said the spider abruptly. Which I'm paying for, said Pete. Which you're paying for, said the spider. Following its usual course, the devil wind died down suddenly at dusk of the third day. A few Mexicans drifted into the saloon that evening and following them several white men up from the border. Pete, who sat in the patio where he could watch the outer doorway of the saloon, smoked and endeavored to shape a plan for his future. He was vaguely surprised that a posse had not yet ridden into showdown, for the spider had said nothing of Hawk and his men, and Pete was alert to that contingency, in that he had planned to slip quietly from the patio to the corral at the back, in case they did ride in estimating that he would have time to saddle a horse and get away before they could search the premises, even if they went that far, and he doubted that they would risk that much without the spider's consent. Would the spider give such consent? Pew doubted it, not because he trusted the spider so much, but rather because the deliberate searching of premises by a posse would break an established precedent, observed in more than one desert rendezvous. That simple and eloquent statement go right ahead and search, but you'll search her in smoke, had backed down more than one posse, as Pete knew. Already the monotony of loafing at the spider's place had begun to wear on Pete, who had slept much for two days and nights, and he was itching to do something. He had thought of riding down and across the border and had said so to the spider, who had advised him against it. During their talk Malv's name was mentioned. Pete wondered why that individual had chosen to keep from sight so long, not aware that the spider had sent word to Malv, who was at Mescalero's ranch, a few miles east of Showdown, that a posse from the Blue had ridden in and might be somewhere in the vicinity. Little by little Pete began to realize that his present as well as his future welfare depended on caution quite as much as upon sheer courage. Insidiously the spider's influence was working upon Pete who saw in him a gambler who played for big stakes with a coldness and soullessness that was amazing, and yet Pete realized that there was something hidden deep in the spider's cosmos that was intensely human. For instance, when Pete had given up the idea of crossing the border and had expressed, as much by his countenance as his speech, his imperative need to be out and earning a living, the spider had offered to put him to work on his ranch, which he told Pete was of considerable extent and lay just north of the national boundary and well out of the way of chance visitors. Cattle the spider had said, and some horses. Pete thought he knew about how that ranch had been stocked, and why it was located where it was. But then, cattle stealing was not confined to any one locality. Any of the boys riding for the Blue or the Concho or the Chibarti were only too eager to brand a stray calf and consider that they were but serving their employer's interests knowing that their strays were quite as apt to be branded by a rival outfit. So it went among men supposed to be living under the law. The spider's proffer of work was accepted, but Pete asserted that he would not leave showdown until he had got his horse. I'll see that you get him, said the spider. Thanks. But I aim to get him myself. And it was shortly after this understanding that Pete sat in the patio back of the saloon, waiting impatiently for Malv to show up and half inclined to go out and look for him. But experience had taught Pete the folly of hot-headed haste, so, like the spider, he withdrew into himself, apparently indifferent to the loud talk of the men in the saloon, the raw jokes and the truculent swaggering, with the implication, voiced loudly by one half-drunken renegade, that the stranger was a shorthorn and naturally afraid to herd in with the bunch. He's got business of his own, said the spider. That's different. I pledge-ish. The men laughed, and the bibulous outlaw straightway considered himself a wit. But those who carried their liquor better knew that the spider's interruption was significant. 
the young stranger was playing a lone hand, and the rules of the game called for strict attention to their own business. Presently a Mexican strode in and spoke to the spider. The spider called to a man at one of the tables. The noisy talk ceased suddenly. One, said the spider. From the south. Pete heard and he shifted his position a little, approximating the distance between himself and the outer doorway. Card games were resumed as before when a figure filled the doorway. Pete's hand slid slowly to his hip. His fingers stiffened, then relaxed, as he got to his feet. It was Boca, alone, and smiling in the soft glow of lamplight. The spider hobbled from behind the bar. Some one called a laughing greeting. It's Boca, boys. We'll sure cut loose tonight. When Boca comes to town the bars is down. Pete heard, and anger and surprise darkened his face. These men seemed to know Boca too well. One of them had risen, leaving his card game, and was shaking hands with her. Another asked her to sing La Paloma. Even the spider seemed gracious to her. Pete, leaning against the doorway of the patio, stared at her as though offended by her presence. She nodded to him and smiled. He raised his hat awkwardly. Boca read jealousy in his eye. She was happy. She wanted him to care. I brought your saddle, senor, she said nodding again. The men laughed, turning to glance at Pete. Still Pete did not quite realize the significance of her coming. Thanks, he said abruptly. Boca deliberately turned her back on him and talked with the spider. She was hurt, and a little angry. Surely she had been his good friend. Was Pete so stupid that he did not realize why she had ridden to show it down? The spider, who had just learned why she was there, called to his Mexican who presently set a table in the patio. Slowly it dawned on Pete that Boca had made a long ride, that she must be tired and hungry. He felt ashamed of himself. She had been a friend to him when he sorely needed a friend. And of course these men knew her. No doubt they had seen her often at the Flores Rancho. She had brought his saddle back, which meant that she had found the buckskin, riderless, and fearing that something serious had happened had caught up the pony and ridden to show down, alone, and no doubt against the wishes of her father and mother. It was mighty fine of her. He had never realized that girls did such things. Well, doggone it. He would let her know that he was mighty proud to have such a partner. The spider hobbled to the patio and placed a chair for Boca, who brushed past Pete as though he had not been there. That's right. Laughed Pete. But say, Boca. What made me sore was the way the mom braze out there got fresh, Josh and Uindis can knew to sing, just like they had a rope on you, you think of that mouth. Well, I ain't for jittin' the way he, Boca's eyes flashed. Yes. But here it is different. The spider, he is my friend. It is that when I have rested and eaten he will ask me to sing. Manuel O will play the guitar. I shall sing and laugh, for I am no longer tired. I am happy. Perhaps I shall sing the song of the outlaw, and for you. I'll be listenin', every minute, Boca. Maybe if I ain't just lookin' at you, it'll be because, see. Even like the caballero of whom I shall sing. And Boca hummed a tune, gazing at Pete with unreadable eyes, half smiling, half sad. How young, smooth-cheeked, and boyish he was, as he glanced up and returned her smile. Yet how quickly his face changed as he turned his head toward the doorway, ever alert for a possible surprise. Boca pushed back her chair. The guitar, she called, nodding to the spider. Manuel brought the guitar, tuned it, and sat back in the corner of the patio. The men in the saloon rose and shuffled to where Boca stood, seating themselves round about in various attitudes of expectancy. Pete, who had risen, recalled the spider's terse warning and stepped over to the patio doorway. Manuel had just swept the silver strings in a sounding prelude, when the spider, behind the bar, gestured to Pete. No, it ain't mouth, said the spider, as Pete answered his abrupt summons. Here, take a drink while I talk. Keep your eye on the front. Don't move your hands off the bar, for there's three men out there, afoot, just beyond the hitching rail. There was five, a minute ago. I figure two of them have gone round to the back. Go ahead, drink a little, and set your glass down, natural. I'm joshin' with you, see. 
And the spider grinned hideously. Smile. Don't make a break for the patio. The boys out there wouldn't understand, and Boca might get hurt. She's going to sing. You turn slow, and listen. When your back's turned, those hombres out there will step in. The spider laughed, as though at something Pete had said. You're mighty surprised to see him and you start to talk. Leave the rest to me. Pete nodded and lifted his glass. From the patio came the sound of Boca's voice and the soft strumming of the guitar. Pete heard but hardly realized the significance of the first line or two of the song, and then, a rider stood at the lamplit bar, tugging the knot of his neck scarf loose, while someone sang to the silver strings, in the moonlight patio. It was the song of the outlaw. Pete turned slowly and faced the patio. Manuel swept the strings in a melodious interlude. Boca, her vivid lips parted, smiled at Pete even as she began to sing again. Pete could almost feel the presence of men behind him. He knew that he was trapped, but he kept his gaze fixed on Boca's face. The spider spoke to someone, a word of surprised greeting. In spite of his hold on himself Pete felt the sweat start on his lip and forehead. He was curious as to what these men would look like, as to whether he would know them. Perhaps they were not after him, but after some of the men in the patio, Annersley. Pete swung round, his hands up. He recognized two of the men, deputies of Sheriff Sutton of Kuncho. The third man was unknown to him. You're under arrest for the killing of Steve Gary. How's that? queried the spider. Steve Gary. This kid shot him, over to the blue. We don't want any trouble about this, continued the deputy. We've got a couple of men out back, there won't be any trouble, said the spider. No, there won't be any trouble, asserted Pete. Give me a drink, spider. No, you don't, said the deputy. You got too many friends out there, and he gestured toward the patio with his gun. Not my friends, said Pete. Boca's song ended abruptly as she turned from her audience to glance in Pete's direction. She saw him standing with upraised hands, and in front of him three men, strangers to show down. Came the shuffling of feet as the men in the patio turned to see what she was staring at. Sit still. Called the spider. This ain't your deal, boys. They got the man they want. But Boca, wide-eyed and trembling, stepped through the doorway. That's close enough called a deputy. She paused, summoning all of her courage and wit to force a laugh. See, si, senor. But you are mistaken. It is not that I care what you do with him. I do but come for the wine for which I have asked, but there was no one to bring it to me, and she stepped past the end of the bar into the spider's room. She reappeared almost instantly with a bottle of wine. I will open that for you, said the spider. Never mind said one of the deputies. The lady seems to know how. Boca took a glass from the counter. I will drink in the patio with my friends. But as she passed round the end of the bar and directly beneath the hanging lamp, she turned and paused. But no. I will drink once to the young vaquero, with whom is my heart and my life. And she filled the glass and, bowing to Pete, put the glass to her lips. The deputy nearest Pete shrugged his shoulder. This ain't a show. Of a truth, no, said Boca, and she swung the bottle. It shivered against the lamp. With the instant darkness came a streak of red and the close roar of a shot. Pete, with his gun out and going, leapt straight into the foremost deputy. They crashed down. Staggering to his feet, Pete broke for the outer doorway. Behind him the room was a pit of flame and smoke. Boca's pony reared as Pete jerked the reins loose, swept into the saddle, and down the moonlit street. He heard a shot and turned his head. In the patch of moonlight round the spider's place he saw the dim, hurrying forms of men and horses. He leaned forward and quirted the pony with the rein ends. Back in the spider's place men grouped round a huddled something on the floor. The spider, who had fetched a lamp from his room, stooped and peered into the upturned face of Boca. A dull, black coo spread and spread across the floor. Boca. He shrilled, and his face was hideous. Did them coyotes get her? Who is it? Where's the kid? The spider straightened and held the lamp high. Take her in there, and he gestured toward his room. 
Two of the men carried her to the couch and covered her with the folds of the serapi which had slipped from her shoulders as she fell. Say the word, spider, and we'll ride him down. It was Scarface who spoke, a man notorious even among his kind. The spider, strangely quiet, shook his head. They'll ride back here. They were after young Pete. She smashed the lamp to give him a chance to shoot his way out. They figured he'd break for the back, but he went right into him. They don't know yet that they got her, and he don't know it. He hobbled round to the back of the bar. Have a drink, boys, and then I'm going to close up till, and he indicated his room with a movement of the head. Young Pete, riding into the night, listened for the sound of running horses. Finally he pulled his pony to a walk. He had ridden north, up the trail which the posse had taken to show down, and directly away from where they were searching the desert for him. And as Pete rode, he thought continually of Boca. Unaware of what had happened, yet he realized that she had been in great danger. This worried him, an uncertainty that became an obsession, until he could no longer master it with reason. He had written free from present hazard, unscratched and footloose, with many hours of darkness before him in which to evade the posse. He would be a fool to turn back. And yet he did, slowly as though an invisible hand were on his bridle rein, forcing him to ride against his judgment and his will. He reasoned, shrewdly, that the posse would be anywhere but at the spider's place, just then. In an hour he had returned and was knocking at the door, surprised that the saloon was closed. At Pete's word, the door opened. The spider, ghastly white in the lamplight, blinked his surprise. Play in a hunch, stated Pete. And, Boca here? he queried, as he entered. In there, said the spider, and he took the lamp from the bar. What's the use of waking her? said Pete. I come back, I got a hunch, that something happened when I made my getaway. But if she's all right, you won't wake her, said the spider, and his voice sounded strange and far away. You better go in there. A hot flash shot through Pete. Then came the cold sweat of a dread anticipation. He followed the spider to where Boca lay on the couch, as though asleep. Pete turned swiftly, questioning with his eyes. The spider set the lamp on the table and backed from the room. Breathing hard, Pete stepped forward and lifted a corner of the serape. Boca's pretty mouth smiled up at him, but her eyes were as dead pools in the night. The full significance of that white face and those dull, unseen eyes, swept through him like a flame. Pardnor he whispered, and flung himself on his knees beside her, his shadow falling across her head and shoulders. In the dim light she seemed to be breathing. Long he gazed at her, recalling her manner as she had raised her glass, I drink to the young Vecuero, with whom is my heart, and my life. Dolly Pete wondered why such things should happen, why he had not been killed instead of the girl, and which one of the three deputies had fired the shot that had killed her. But no one could ever know that for the men had all fired at him when the lamp crashed down, yet he, closer to them than Boca, had broken through their blundering fusillade. He knew that Boca had taken a great risk, and that she must have known it also. And she had taken that risk that he might win free. Too stunned and shaken to reason it out to any definite conclusion, Pete characteristically accepted the facts as they were as he thrust aside all thought of right or wrong and gave himself over to tearless mourning for that which Boca had been. That dead thing with dark, staring eyes and faintly smiling lips was not Boca. But where was she then? Slowly the lamplight paled as dawn fought through the heavy shadows of the room. The door swung open noiselessly. The spider glanced in and softly closed the door again. The spider, he of the shriveled heart and body, did the most human thing he had done for years. At the little table opposite the bar he sat with brandy and a glass and deliberately drank until he felt neither the ache of his old wounds nor the sting of this fresh thrust of fate. Then he knew that he was drunk, but that his keen, crooked mind would obey his will, unfeelingly, yet with no hesitation and no stumbling. He rose and hobbled to the outer door. A vagrant breeze stirred the stale air in the room. Back in the patio his Mexican, Manuelo, lay snoring wrapped in a tattered blanket. The spider turned from the doorway and gazed at the sanded spot on the floor, leaning against the bar and drumming on its edge with his nervous fingers. He'll see her in every night fire when he's alone, 
and he'll talk to her. He will see her face among the girls in the halls, and he'll go cold and speak her name, and then some girl will laugh. He will eat out his heart thinking of her, and what she did for him. He's just a kid, but when he comes out of that room, he won't give a damn if he's bumped off or not. He'll play fast, and go through every time. God! I ought to know. The spider turned and gazed across the morning desert. Far out rode a group of men. One of them led a riderless horse. The spider's thin lips twisted in a smile. Chapter 25 Planted, out there. Malve, loafing at the ranch of Mescalero, received the spider's message about the posse with affected indifference. He had Pete's horse in his possession, which in itself would make trouble should he be seen. When he learned from the messenger that young Pete was in showdown, he fumed and blustered until evening, when he saddled Blue Smoke and rode south toward the Flores Rancho. From Flores's place he would ride on south, across the line to where he could always find employment for his particular talents. Experience had taught him that it was useless to go against the spider, whose warning, whether it were based on fact or not, was a hint to leave the country. The posse from Concho. After circling the midnight desert and failing to find any trace of Pete, finally drew together and decided to wait until daylight made it possible to track him. As they talked together, they saw a dim figure coming toward them. Swinging from their course, they rode abruptly down a draw. Four of them dismounted. The fifth, the chief deputy, volunteered to ride out and interview the horsemen. The four men on foot covered the opening of a draw, where the trail passed and waited. The deputy sat his horse, as though waiting for someone. Malv at once thought of young Pete, then of the spider's warning, and finally that the solitary horseman might be some companion from below the border, cautiously awaiting his approach. Half inclined to ride wide, he hesitated, then loosening his gun he spurred his restless pony toward the other, prepared to bowl through if questioned too closely. Within thirty feet of the deputy Malv reined in. You're riding late, he said, with a forced friendliness in his voice. This the trail to show it down? Queried the deputy. This is her. Looking for anybody in particular? Nope. And I reckon nobody is looking for me. I'm riding my own horse. It was a chance shot intended to open the way to a parley, and identify the strange horseman by his voice, if possible. It also was a challenge, if the unknown cared to accept it as such. Malv's slow mind awakened to the situation. A streak of red flashed from his hand as he spurred straight for the deputy, who slipped from his saddle and began firing over it, shielded by his pony. A rifle snarled in the draw. Malv jerked straight as a soft-nosed slug tore through him. Another slug shattered his thigh. Cursing, he lunged sideways, as blue smoke bucked. Malv toppled and fell, an inert bulk in the dim light of the stars. The chief deputy struck a match and stooped. We got the wrong man, he called to his companions. It's Bull Mouth, said one of the deputies as the match flickered out. I knew him in Phoenix. Heard of him. He was a wild one, said another deputy. Comin' and goin'. One of the spiders bunch, and a hoss thief right. I reckon we done a good job. He went for his gun, said the chief. We had him covered from the start, asserted a deputy. He sure won't steal no more hosses. Catch up his cayuse, commanded the chief deputy. Two of them, after a hard ride, finally put blue smoke within reach of a rope. He was led back to where Malv lay. Concho brand. Exclaimed the chief. Young Pete's horse, asserted another. There'll be hell to pay if showdown gets wise to what happened to Bull Malv, said the deputy, who recognized the dead outlaw. Dawn was just breaking when the chief deputy disgusted with what he termed their luck, finally evolved a plan out of the many discussed by his companions. We got the cayuse, which will look good to the T-Bar T-Boys. We ain't down here for our health and we been up against it from start to finish, and so far as I care, this is the finish. Get it right afore we start. Young Pete is dead. We got his horse. He paused and glanced sharply at Blue Smoke. He's got the Concho brand he exclaimed. Young Pete's horse was a blue roan, said a deputy. I guess this is him, blue roan with a white blaze on his nose, so Cotton told me. Looks like it. 
said the chief deputy. Well, say we got his horse, then. We're in luck for once. Now it's easy to get down there in the draw. And it's getting daylight fast. I reckon that's Mal's saddle and bridle on the blue roan. We'll just cover up all evidence of who was riding this hoss, drift into showdown and eat, and then ride along up north and collect that reward. We'll split her even, and who's going to say we didn't earn it? Suits me, said a deputy. His companions nodded. Then let's get busy. The sand's loose here. We can drag a blanket over this, and leave the rest to the coyotes. They scraped a long, shallow hole in the arroyo bed and buried Malvin along with his saddle and bridle. The spider smiled as he saw them coming. He was still smiling as he watched them ride up the street and tie their tired ponies to the hitching rail. He identified the lead horse as the one Malv had stolen from Pete. I see you got him, he said in his high-pitched voice. The chief deputy nodded. He's planted, out there. I meant the horse, said the spider. Ordinarily, the spider was a strange man. The posse thought him unusually queer just then. His eyes seemed dulled with a peculiar faint, bluish film. His manner was over-deliberate. There was something back of it all that they could not fathom. Moreover, the place was darkened. Someone had hung blankets over the windows. The deputies, four of them, followed the spider into the saloon. I guess you boys want to eat, said the spider. We sure do. All right. I'll have Manuel get you something. And he called to the Mexican, telling him to place a table in the private room, the spider's own room, back of the bar. While the Mexican prepared breakfast, the posse accepted their chief's invitation to have a drink, which they felt they needed. Presently the spider led the way to his room. The deputies, somewhat suspicious, hesitated on the threshold as they peered in. A lamp was burning on the table. There were plates, knives and forks, a coffee pot, a platter of bacon. Beyond the lamp stood young Pete, his back toward the couch and facing them. His eyes were like the eyes of one who walks in his sleep. The spider held up his hand. You're planted, out there. These gentlemen say so. So you ain't here. Pete's belt and gun lay on the floor. The spider was in his shirt sleeves and apparently unarmed. The chief deputy sized up the situation in a flash and pulled his gun. I guess we got you, this trip, Pete. No, said the spider. You're wrong. He's planted out there. What you staring at, boys? Pete, stand over there. Come right in, boys. Come on in. I got something to show you. Watch the door, Jim, said the chief. Ed, you keep your eye on the spider. The chief deputy stepped to the table and peered across it at a huddled something on the couch, over which was thrown a shimmering serape. He stepped round the table and lifted a corner of the serape. Boca's sightless eyes stared up at him. Christ! He whispered. It's the girl. And even as he spoke he knew what had happened, that he and his men were responsible for this. His hand shook as he turned toward the spider. She, she ran into it when she, it's pretty tough, but, your breakfast is waiting, said the spider. This was accidental, said the deputy, recovering himself, and glancing from one to another of his men. Then he turned to Pete. Pete, you'll have to ride back with us. No, said the spider with a peculiar stubborn shrug of his shoulders. He's planted out there. You said so. That's all right, spider. We made a mistake. This is the man we want. Then who is planted out there? queried the spider in a soft, sing-song voice, high-pitched and startling. That's our business, stated the deputy. No, mine. The spider glanced past the deputy, who turned to face a Mexican standing in the doorway. The Mexican's hands were held belt high and they were both filled. Get the first man that moves, said the spider in Mexican. And as he spoke his own hand flashed to his armpit, and out again like the stroke of a snake. Behind his gun gleamed a pair of black, beady eyes, as cold as the eyes of a rattler. The deputy read his own doom and the death of at least two of his men should he move a muscle. He had young Pete covered and could have shot him down, Pete was unarmed. The deputy lowered his gun. Pete blinked and drew a deep breath. Give me a gun, spider, and we'll shoot it out with him, 
right here. The spider laughed. No. You're planted out there. These gents say so. I'm working this layout. Put up your gun, Ed, said the chief, addressing the deputy who had the spider covered. He's fooled us, proper. Let him out, one at a time, and the spider gestured to the Mexican, Manuelo. And tell your friends, he continued, addressing the chief deputy, that showdown is run peaceful and that I run here. When they were gone the spider turned to Pete. Want to ride back to Kincho? Pete, who had followed the spider to the saloon, did not seem to hear the question. Manuelo was already sweeping out with a broom which he had dipped in a water bucket, as casually busy as though he had never had a gun in his hand. Something in the Mexican supreme indifference touched Pete's sense of humor. He shrugged his shoulders. Who's going to tell her father? He queried, gesturing toward the inner room. She knows, said the spider, who stood staring at the Mexican. You're drunk, said Pete. Maybe I'm drunk, echoed the spider. But I'm her father. Pete stepped forward and gazed into the spidery scarred and lined face. Hell. Then he thrust out his hand. Spider, I reckon I'll throw in with you. Chapter 26 The Allah The spider's system of bookkeeping was simple, requiring neither pen nor paper, journal nor daybook. He kept a kind of mental loose-leaf ledger with considerable accuracy, auditing his accounts with impartiality. For example, Scarface and three companions just up from the border recently had been credited with twenty head of Mexican cattle which were now grazing on the spider's border ranch, the Ala. Scarface had attempted to sell the cattle to the leader of a Mexican faction whose only assets at the time were ammunition and hope. Scarface had met this chieftain by appointment at an abandoned ranch house. Argument ensued. The Mexican talked grandiloquently of liberty, fraternity, and equality. Scarface held out for cash. The Mexican leader needed beef. Scarface needed money. As he had rather carelessly informed the Mexican that he could deliver the cattle immediately, and realizing his mistake comma for he knew that the Mexican would straightway summon his retainers and take the cattle in the name of liberty, fraternity, and equality, Scarface promptly shot this self-appointed savior of Mexico mortally wounded one of his two companions, and finally persuaded the other to help drift the cattle north with a promise of a share of the profits of the enterprise. The surviving Mexican rode to showdown with Scarface and his companions, received his share of the sale in cash, comma, which he squandered at the spider's place, comma, and straightaway rode back across the border to rejoin his captainless comrades and appoint himself their leader gently insinuating that he himself had shot the captain whom he had apprehended in the treachery of betraying them to a rival aggregation of ragged liberties, fraternities, and equalities. The spidery mental ledger read, Scarface, debit, chuck, liquor, and lodging an account of long standing, and forty dollars in cash. Credit, twenty head of cattle, brand unknown. Scarface's account was squared, for the time being. Pete was also on the spider's books, and according to the spider's system of accounts, Pete was heavily in debt to him. Not that the spider would have ever mentioned this, or have tried to collect. But when he offered Pete a job on his ranch he shrewdly put Pete in the way of meeting his obligations. Cattle were in demand, especially in Mexico, so ravaged by lawless soldiery that there was nothing left to steal. One outlaw chieftain, however, was so well established financially that his agents were able to secure supplies from a mysterious source and pay for them with gold, which also came from an equally mysterious source, and it was with these agents that the spider had had his dealings. His bank account in El Paso was rolling up fast. Thus far he had been able to supply beef to the hungry liberators of Mexico, but beef on the hoof was becoming scarce on both sides of the border. Even before Pete had come to show down, the spider had perfected a plan to raid the herds of the northern ranches. Occasional cowboys drifting to showdown had given him considerable information regarding the physical characteristics of the country round about these ranches, the water holes, trails, and grazing. The spider knew that he could make only one such raid, with any chance of success. If he made a drive at all, it would be on a big scale. The cattlemen would eventually trail the first stolen herd to his ranch. True, they would not find it there. He would see to it that the cattle were pushed across the border without delay. 
but a second attempt would be out of the question. The chief factor in the success of the scheme would be the prompt handling of the herd upon its arrival. He had cowboys in his employ who would steal the cattle. What he needed was a man whom he could rely upon to check the tally and turn the herd over to the agents of the Mexican soldiery and collect the money on the spot, while his cowboys guarded the herd from a possible raid by the Mexicans themselves. He knew that should the northern ranchmen happen to organize quickly and in force, they would not hesitate to promptly lynch the raiders, burn his buildings, take all his horses worth taking, and generally put the ranch out of business. Thus far the ranch had paid well as a sort of isolated clearinghouse for the spiders' vicarious accounts. The cowboys who worked there were picked men, each of whom received a straight salary, asked no questions, and rode with a high-power rifle under his knee and a keen eye toward the southern ranches. Pete, riding south, bore an unsigned letter from the spider, with instructions to hand it to the foreman of the Allah and receive further instructions from that gentleman. Pete knew nothing of the contemplated raid, the spider shrewdly surmising that Pete would balk at the prospect of stealing cattle from his own countrymen. And it was because of this very fact that the spider had entrusted Pete, by letter to the foreman, with the even greater responsibility of receiving the money for the cattle and depositing it in a certain bank in El Paso. Heretofore, such payments had been made to the spider's representative in that city, the president of the Stockman Security and Savings Bank who had but recently notified the spider that he could no longer act in the capacity of agent on account of local suspicion, already voiced in the current newspapers. Hereafter the spider would have to deal directly with the Mexican agents. And the spider unhesitatingly chose Pete as his representative, realizing that Pete was shrewdly capable, fearless, and to be trusted. Toward evening of the third day out of showdown, Pete came upon a most unexpected barrier to his progress. A wire fence stretching east and west, a seemingly endless succession of diminishing posts. He estimated that there must be at least 40,000 acres under fence. According to location, this was the spider's ranch. The Ola, P trained around and rode along the fence for a mile or so, searching for a gateway, but the taut barbed wire ran on and on, toward a sun that was rounding swiftly down to the western horizon. He dismounted and pulled the staples from several lengths of wire until he had enough slack to allow the top wire to touch the ground. He stood on the wires and jockeyed blue smoke across, tied him to a post, and tacked the wire back in place. Headed south again, he had just passed a clump of chaparral when up from the draw came a tall, muscular cowboy, riding a big horse, and a fast one, thought Pete. Evening, drawled the cowboy, a slow-speaking Texan who was evidently waiting for Pete to explain his presence. How exclamation mark is this here the Ola Ranch? One end of her. I'm looking for the foreman. What name did you say? I didn't say. What's your business down this way? queried the cowboy. It's mine. I don't know as it's any of yours. So? Now, that's mighty queer. Looking for the foreman, eh? Well, go ahead and look, they's plenty of room. Too much, laughed Pete. Reckon I got to bush here and do my huntin' in the mornin', only and Pete eyed the other significantly, I kind of hate to bush on the ground. I was bit by a spider onked, a spider, eh? Now that's right comical. What kind of a spider was it that bit you? Trap door spider. Only this here one was always home. So? drawled the Texan. Now, that's right funny. I was bit by a rattler once. Got the marks on my arm yet? Well, if it comes to a showdown, that there spider bite, the ranch house is yonder, said the Texan. Just you ride along the way you're headed. That's a pretty horse you're setting on. If it wa and he so dark I'd say he carried the Concho brand. That's him, said Pete. He's a long jump from home, friend. And good for twice that distance, neighbor. You sure please me most to death, drawled the Texan. Then I reckon you might call in that there coyote in the brush over there that's been holding a gun on me ever since we've been talking, and Pete gestured with his bridle hand toward the clump of chaparral. Sam, called the Texan, he says he don't like our way of welcoming strangers down here. He's right friendly, meeting one man at a time, but he don't like a crowd, no how. A figure loomed in the dusk, a man on foot who carried a rifle across his arm. 
Pete could not distinguish his features, but he saw that the man was tall, booted and spurred, and evidently a line rider with a Texan. This here young stinging lizard says he wants to see the famine, Sam. Can you help him out? Go ahead and speak your piece, said the man with the rifle. She spoke, said Pete. I'm the man you're hunting, asserted the other. You foreman? The same. Thought you was just a hand, right fence, maybe. And as Pete spoke he rolled a cigarette. His pony shied at the flare of the match, but Pete caught an instant glimpse of a lean-faced, powerfully built man of perhaps fifty years or more who answered the spider's description of the foreman. I got a letter here for Sam Brent, foreman of the Allah, said Pete. Now you're talking business. His business, laughed the Texan. Nope, the spiders, asserted Pete. Your letter will keep, said the foreman. Ed, you drift on along down the fence till you meet Harper. Tell him it's all right. And the foreman disappeared in the dusk to return astride a big cow horse. We'll ride over to the house, said he. Pete estimated that they had covered three or four miles before the ranch buildings came in sight, a dim huddle of angles against the starlit sky. To his surprise the central building was roomy and furnished with a big table, many chairs, and a phonograph, while the floor was carpeted with Navajo blankets, and a big shaded hanging lamp illumined the table on which were scattered many dog-eared magazines and a few newspapers. Pete had remarked upon the stables while turning his own horse into the corral. We got some fast ones, was all that the foreman chose to say, just then. Pete and the foreman had something to eat in the chuck house, and returned to the larger building. Brandt read the spider's letter, rolled the end of his silver-gray mustache between his thumb and forefinger, and finally glanced up. So, you're Pete Andersley. That's my name. Have a chair. You're right young to be riding alone. How did you come to throw in with the spider? Pete hesitated. Why should he tell this man anything other than that he had been sent by the spider with the letter which, he had been told, would explain his presence and embody his instructions? Don't he say in that letter? queried Pete. He says you were mixed up in a bank robbery over to and right, stated the foreman. That's a damn lie. flared Pete. I reckon you'll do, said Brent, as he folded the letter. The spider had made that very statement in his letter to Brent for the purpose of finding out, through the foreman, whether or not Pete had taken it upon himself to read the letter before delivering it. And Brent, aware of the spider's methods, realized at once why his chief had misstated the facts. It was evident that Pete had not read the letter, otherwise he would most probably have taken his cue from the spider's assertion about the bank robbery and found himself in difficulties. For directly after the word and write was a tiny XA code letter which meant this is not so. Reckon I'll do what? queried Pete. Let the spider or anybody like him run a whizzer on me after I run a good hoss ragged to get here with his doggone letter, and then get stuck up like I was a hoss thief? You got another guess, uncle. The old cowman's eyes twinkled. You speak right out in meetin', don't you, son? His drawl was easy and somehow reminded Pete of Pop Annersley. Now there's some wouldn't like that kind of talk, even from a kid. I'd say it to the spider as quick as I would to you, asserted Pete. Which might be talking a chance, both ways. Say and Pete smiled. I guess I've been talking pretty fast, I was some head up. The spider used me as white as he could use anybody, I reckon. But ever since that killin' up to his place. I been sore at the whole doggone outfit run in this here world. What does a fella get, anyhow, for sticking up for himself, if he runs against a killer? He gets bumped off, or maybe he kills the other fella and gets run out of the country or hung. Partner stick, don't they? Well, how would it get you if you had a partner that, well, maybe was a girl and she got killed by a bunch of deputies just because she was quick enough to spoil their game? Would you feel like shaking hands with every doggone hombre you met up with, or like telling him to go to hell and send him there if he was looking to argue with you? I dunno. Maybe I'm wrong, from the start, but I figure all a fella gets out of this game is a throw down, coming or going, for the deck is stacked and the wheel is crooked. I was 56 last February, said Brent. And how many notches you got on your gun? queried Pete. Oh, maybe two. Three, drawled the foreman. 
That's it. Say you started and calling yourself a grown man when you was 20. Every 10 years you had to hand some fella his finish to keep from making yours. Got to kill to live, is right. Son, you got a good horse, and yonder is the whole state of Texas, where a man can sure lose himself without trying hard. There's plenty of work down there for a good cow hand. And a man's name ain't printed on his face. Nobody's got a rope on you. I get you, said Pete. But I throwed in with the spider, and that goes. That's your business, and as you was saying your business ain't mine. But throwing a fast gun won't do you no good round here. Oh, I don't claim to be so doggone fast, stated Pete. Faster than Steve Gary? Pete's easy glance centered to a curious, tense gaze which was fixed on the third button of Brent's shirt. What about Steve Gary? Asked Pete, and even Brent, old hand as he was, felt the sinister significance in that slow question. The spider's letter had said to give him a tryout, which might have meant almost anything to a casual reader, but to Brent it meant just what he had been doing that evening, seeking for a weak spot in Pete's makeup, if there were such, before hiring him. My gun is in the bedroom, said Brent easily. Well, Gary's wasn't, said Pete. We ain't had a gun fight on this ranch since I been foreman, said Brent. And we got some right fast men, at that. Seen you're going to work for me a spell, I'm going to kind of give you a line on things. You can pick your own string of horses, anything that you can get your rope on that ain't branded J.E. apostrophe, which is pet stock and no good at working cattle. You met up with Ed Brevoort this evening. Well, you can ride fence with Ed and he'll show you the high spots and hollows, and the line, south. If you run onto any strangers riding too close to the line, find out what they want. If you can't find out, get word to me. That goes for strangers. But if you get to arguing with any of my boys, talk all you like, but don't start a smoke, for you won't get away with it. The spider rained paying guns to shoot up his own outfit. If you're looking for real trouble, all you got to do is to ride south across to the line, and you'll find it. And you're getting a straight hundred a month and your keep as long as you work for the Alla. Which is some different from talking my hoss and fanning it easy for Texas, said Pete, grinning. Some different, said Brent. Chapter 27 Over the Line Few cattle grazed across the Alla's well fenced takers and these cattle were of a poor strain, lean Mexican stock that would never run into weight as beef. Pete had expected to see many cattle, and much work to be done. Instead, there were few cattle, and as for work, he had been put to riding line with Big Ed Brevoort. For two weeks he had done nothing else. Slowly it dawned upon Pete that the spider's ranch was little more than a thoroughfare for the quick handling of occasional small bands of cattle from one question of owner to another. He saw many brands, and few of them were alike, and among them none that were familiar. Evidently the cattle were from the south line. The saddle stock was branded J.E. and Viala. These brands appeared on none of the cattle that Pete had seen. About a month after his arrival, and while he was drifting slowly along the fence with Brevoort, Pete caught sight of a number of horsemen, far out beyond the ranch line, riding slowly toward the north. He spoke to Brevoort who nodded. We're like to be right busy soon. Brevoort and Pete rode to the ranch house that evening to get supplies for their line check. The place was all but deserted. The cook was there, and the Mexican Jose who looked after the fast ones in the stables, but Brent, Harper, Sandy Bell, and the rest of the men were gone. Pete thought of the horsemen that he had seen, and of Brevoort's remark, that they would be right busy soon. Pete wondered how soon and how busy. The day after the departure of the men, Brevoort told Pete that they would take turn about riding the north line, in an eight-hour shift, and he cautioned Pete to be on the lookout for a messenger riding a bay horse. Not a cow horse, but a thoroughbred. This was at the line check. Several nights later, as Pete was riding his line, he noticed that blue smoke occasionally stopped and sniffed, and always toward the north. Near the northwestern angle of the fence. Pete thought he could hear the distant drumming of hooves. Blue smoke fretted and fought the bit. Pete dismounted and peered into the darkness. The rhythmic stride of a running horse came to him, not the quick patter of a cowpony, but the long, 
sweeping stride of a racer. Then out of a night burst a rider on a foam-flecked horse that reared almost into the gate, which Pete unlocked and dragged back. That you, Brevart, called the horseman. He's at the shack, Pete shouted, as the other swept past. Looks like we're going to be right busy, reflected Pete as he swung to the saddle. We'll just jog over to the shack and report. When he arrived at the line shack, Brevort was talking with the hard-riding messenger. Near them stood the thoroughbred his flanks heaving, his neck sweat blackened, his sides quivering with fatigue. He had covered fifty miles in five hours. And counting the concho stuff, I'd say something like two hundred head, the messenger was saying. Brent'll be in tomorrow, long bout noon. So far, she worked slick. No trouble and a show of getting through without any trouble. Not much young stock, so they're driving fast. Breve or turned to Pete. Take this horse over to the corral. Tell Moody that Harper is in, and that the boys will be here in a couple of days. He'll know what to do. Pete rode at a high lope, leading the thoroughbred, and wondering why the messenger had not gone on to the corral. Moody, the cook, a grizzled, heavy-featured man, too old for hard riding, expressed no surprise at Pete's message, but awakened the Mexican stableman and told him to fetch up a real one, which the Mexican did with alertness returning to the house leading another sleek and powerful thoroughbred. Take him over to the shack, said Moody. Harper wants him. And he gave Pete a package of food which he had been preparing while the Mexican was at the stable. When Pete returned to the line shack he found Brave Ort sitting in the doorway smoking, and the messenger asleep on the ground, his head on his saddle. Here's your horse, said Brave Ort, and some chuck. Harper sat up quickly too quickly for a man who had ridden as far as he had. Pete wondered at the other's hardihood and grit, for Harper was instantly on his feet and saddling the fresh horse, and incidentally cursing the Allah, Brent, and the universe in general, with a gusto which bespoke plenty of unspoiled vigor. Tell Brent the coast is clear, said Breve Ort as Harper mounted. They could hear his horse getting into his stride long before the sound of his hoofbeats was swallowed up in the abyss of the night. Pete turned in. Breve Ort rode out to drift along the line fence until daylight. And Pete dreamed strange dreams of night riders who came and went swiftly and mysteriously, and of a dusty, shuffling herd that wounded slow way across the desert, hazed by a flitting band of armed riders who continually glanced back as though fearful of pursuit. Suddenly the dream changed. He was lying on a bed in a long, white-walled room dimly lighted by a flickering gas jet, and Boca stood beside him gazing down at him wistfully. He tried to speak to her, but could not. Nor did she speak to him, but laid her hand on his forehead, pressing down his eyelids. Her hand was dry and hot. Pete tried to open his eyes, to raise his hand, to speak. Although his eyes were closed and Boca's hot hand was pressed down on them, Pete knew that roundabout was a light and warmth of noonday. Boca's hand drew back, and Pete lay staring straight into the morning sun which shone through the open doorway. In the distance he could see Breve or riding slowly toward him. Pete raised on his elbow and threw back the blankets. As he rose and pulled on his overalls he thought of the messenger. He knew that somewhere back on the northern trail the men of the Ala were pushing a herd of cattle slowly south comma cattle from the T-Bar-T, the blue, and, he suddenly recalled Harper's remark and counting the concho stuff. Pete thought of Jim Bailey and Andy White, and of pleasant days riding for the concho. But after all, it was none of his affair. He had had no hand in stealing the cattle. He would do well enough to keep his own hide whole. Let the cattlemen who lived under the law take care of their own stock and themselves. And curiously enough, Pete for the first time wondered what had become of Malf, if the posse had actually shot him or if they had simply taken the horse and let Mouth go. The arrival of Brevort put an end to his pondering. Brent will be in today, said Brevort. You stick around here, and call me about noon. The old man ain't talking chances, remarked Pete. You're wrong there, asserted Brevort. He's talking the long chance every time, or he wouldn't be foreman of this outfit. You'll find that out if you stick around here long enough. If you don't call it talking a chance pulling off a trick like this one that's coming, just try it yourself. He handles men easy, asserted Pete, 
recalling Brent's rather fatherly advice in regard to Texas and the opportunity for a young man to go straight. You sure please me most to death, drawled Brevoort. You been a right quiet little partner, and smilin', so I'm going to tell you something that you can keep right on being quiet about. Sam Brent would send you or me or any man into a gunfight, or a posse, or a jail, and never blink his eye, if he thought it was good business for him. He'd do it pleasant, too, just like he was sent new to a dance, or a show. But he'd go just as quick himself, if he had to. Then I guess we got no kick, said Pete. I ain't kickin'. I'm just putting you wise. I ain't for jitting, Ed. Pew turned, following Brief Ort's gaze. The man they were talking about was in sight and riding hard. Presently Brent was close enough to nod to them. Although he had ridden far and fast, he was as casual as sunshine. Neither in his voice nor his bearing was the least trace of fatigue. I'm going to need you, he told Pete. We're short of hands right now. If you need anything over in the line shack, go get it and come along down after Ed and me. Pete took the hint and left Breve Ort and Brent to ride to the house together while he rode over to the shack and warmed up some coffee and beans. In an hour he was at the house. A thoroughbred stood at the hitching rail. Pew noticed that the animal carried Breve Ort's saddle. Evidently there was to be more hard riding. As Pete entered the big room, he also noticed that Breve Ort was heavily armed, and carried an extra belt of cartridges. Brent was examining a rifle when Pete stepped in. You may need this, said Brent, handing the rifle and scabbard to Pete. Go over to the bunkhouse and get another belt and some shells. When Pete returned, Blue Smoke was in the corral and his own saddle was on a big bay that looked like a splendid running mate for Brief Ort's mount. Pute busied himself slinging the rifle, curious as to what his new venture would or could be, yet too proud to show that he was interested. Brief Ort, hitching up his belt, swung to his horse. Without hesitation Pete followed. Well fed, eager and spirited, the horses lunged out into the open and settled into a long, swinging stride a gait that was new to Pete, accustomed as he was to the shorter, quick action of the cowpony. They rode south, across the sunlit expanse of emptiness between the hacienda and the line. A few hundred yards beyond the fence, Breve or trained in. Mexico, he said, gesturing roundabout. Our job is to ride to the Ortez Rancho and get that outfit moving up this way. Going to turn the cattle over to him? queried Pete. Yes and that quick they won't know they got em. It's a big deal, if she goes through. If she don't, it's like to be the finish of the Allah. Meanin' if the T-Bar T and the Concho gets busy, there's like to be some smoke blowin' down this way? The same. Recollect what I was tellin' you this mornin'. About Brent sendin' a man into a fight? Yes. But I wasn't figuring on provin' it to you so quick, drawled the Texan. Hold your horse down to a walk. We'll save speed for a spell. No, I wasn't figuring on this. You see, when I hired out to Brent, I knew what I was doing, so I told him I'd just turn my pay on the white side of the border, but no Mexico for mine. That was the understand. Now he goes to work and sends you and me down into this here country on a job which is only fit for a greaser. I'm going to see it through, but I done made my last tried for the Allah. Brent was saying he was short of hands, suggested Pete. Which is correct. But there's that Jose who knows every foot of the dry spot clean to the Ortez, and he knows every hoss thief in this sun-blasted country. Does he send Jose? No. He sends two white men, telling me that it is too big a deal to trust the Mexican with. And a fine chance of getting bumped off by a lousy bunch of killers calling themselves soldiers, eh? You said it. Well? We got good hosses, anyway. And I saved the Mexican talk. Guess that's why Brent sent you along. He knows I talk mighty little Mexican. And Brief Ort gazed curiously at Pete. Seen as you feel that way about it, Ed, I got something I been milling over in my head. Now, when the spider sent me down here he said he had some important business he wanted me to handle. Brent was to tell me. Now I don't see anything important about riding line or chassin into Mexico to wake up a bunch of greasers and tell them to get busy, Uncle Sammy Brent's got something hid up his sleeve, Ed. Brevoort, riding slowly beside Pete, 
turned from gazing across the desert and looked Pete over from spur to sombrero with a new interest. He thought he knew now why the spider had sent Pete to the ranch and why Brent, in turn, had sent Pete on this dangerous mission. Is the spider much of a friend of yours? queried Breve Ort suddenly. Why, I dunno. Course he acted like he was but you can't tell about him. He he helped me out of a hole on it. Did you ever help him out? Me? No, I never had the chanked. Huh. Well, just you pull in your hoss and run your good eye over this a minute. And Breve Ort drew a folded slip of paper from his shirt pocket and handed it to Pete. It was a brief note addressed to Breve Ort and signed J.E. It instructed Breve Ort to accompany Pete Annersley to El Paso after the sale of the cattle and to see to it that the money which Annersley would have with him was deposited to the credit of James Ewell and the Stockman Security and Savings Bank. Pete had difficulty in reading the note and took some time to read it, finally handing it back to Breve Ort in silence. And then, where did you get it? Who is J.E. Apostrophe? From Harper. J.E. is Jemuel the Spider. So Harper rode to showdown and back? He took word from Brent to the Spider that the boys had started, said Brevoort. And Brent Pete hesitated for fear of committing himself even though he trusted Brevoort. But Brevoort had no hesitation. He anticipated Pete's thought and spoke frankly. Brent figured it fine. I knew why he sent you and me on this ride but I was trying to find out if you was wise or right and blind. If we come back, Brent won't show his hand. If we don't come back he'll collect the dough and vamoose. Can you see a hole in the fence? You're whistling, Ed. It's one crook trying to get the best of another crook. But I woulda said Brent was straight. I say the spider's money goes into that there bank. Same here. I ain't so damn honest that it hurts me, but I quit when it comes to stealing from the man that's paying my wages. Then I reckon you and me is partners in this deal, and Pete, boyishly proffered his hand. Big Ed Breve Ort grasped Pete's hand, and held it till the horses shied apart. To the finish, he said. To the finish, echoed Pete, and with one accord they slackened rein. The thoroughbreds reached out into that long, tireless running stride that brought their riders nearer and nearer to the Ortez Rancho and the Mexican agent of the guerrilla captain whose troops were so sadly in need of beef. Chapter 28. A Gamble. On either side of a faint trail rose the dreary, angling grotesques of the cactus, and the dried and dead stalks of the soapweed. Beyond, to the south, lay a sea of shimmering space, clear to the light blue that edged the skyline. The afternoon sun showed copper red through a faint haze which bespoke a change of weather. The miles between the Allah and the tiny dot on the horizon the Ortez Hacienda seemed endless because of no pronounced landmarks. Pete surmised that it would be dark long before they reached their destination. Incidentally he was amazed by the speed of the thoroughbreds, who ran so easily, yet with a long, reaching stride that ate into the miles. To Pete they seemed more like excellent machines than horses lacking the pert individuality of the cowpony. Stall fed and groomed to a satin smooth glow, stabled and protected from the rain's pets. In Pete's estimation yet he knew that they would run until they dropped, holding that long, even stride to the very end. He reached out and patted his horse on the neck. Instantly the sensitive ears twitched and the stride lengthened. Pete tightened rein gently. A quirt would only make him crazy, he thought, and he grinned as he saw that Breve or its horse had let out a link or two to catch up with its mate. The low sun, touching the rim of the desert, flung long crimson shafts heavenward in hues of rose and amethyst, against the deep umber and the purple of far spaces. From monotonous and burning desolation the desert had become a vast momentary solitude of changing beauty and enchantment. Then all at once the colors vanished, space shrank, and occasional stars trembled in the velvet roof of the night. And one star, brighter than the rest, grew gradually larger, until it became a solitary campfire on the level of the plain. Don't like the looks of that, said Brevoort, as he pulled up his horse. It's out in front of the Dobie and it means the Ortez has got company. Soldiers? Looks like it. Arguilla's men. I reckon so. And they're up pretty close to the line too close to suit me. We'll ride round and do our talking with Ortez. Ain't they friendly? Queried Pete. Friendly, hell. Any one of them would knife you for the hoss you're riding. Hear him sing. 
most like they're all drunk and you know what that means. Just follow along slow, and whatever you run into don't get off your hoss. Ain't them there coyotes friendly to Ortez? As long as he feeds him. But that don't do us no good. Ought to be some of the Ortez riders hangin' round somewhere. They don't mix much with Arguilla's men. She's a lovely layout, said Pete. But I'm with you. Circling the ranch, Brave Ort and Pete rode far out into the desert, until the campfire was hidden by the ranch buildings. Then they angled in cautiously, edging past the dobe outbuildings and the corrals toward the hacienda. Don't see anybody around. Guess they're all out in front drinking with the bunch, whispered Brave Ort. Just as Pete was about to make a suggestion, a figure rose almost beneath the horse's head, and a guttural Mexican voice told him to halt. Pete complied, telling the Mexican that they were from the Ala, that they had a message for Ortez. No use arguing, said Brave Ort and Pete caught Brave Ort's meaning as another man appeared. Ask him if Arguilla is here, said Brave Ort. And Pete knew that these were Arguilla's men, for none of the Ortez vaqueros carried bolt-action rifles. The sentry replied to Pete's question by poking him in the ribs with the muzzle of his rifle, and telling his to get down muy pronto. Tell him our message is for Arguilla not Ortez, suggested Brevoort. There's something wrong here. No use startin' anything, he added hastily, as he dismounted. Ortez is agent for Arguilla's outfit. If you get a chance, watch what they do with our horses. We came to see El Comandante, said Pete as the sentries marched them to the house. We're his friends and you'll be coyote meat before morning if you get too careless with that gun. The sentry grunted and poked Pete in the back with his rifle, informing him in that terse universal idiom that he could tell it to El Comandante. From the outer darkness to the glare of the light in the dobe was a blinding transition. Pete and Brave Ort blinked at the three figures in the main room, Arguilla, who sat at the long table, his heavy features glistening with sweat, his broad face flushed to a dull red, had his hand on a bottle of American whiskey, from which he had just filled his glass. Near him sat the owner of the rancho, Ortez, a man much older, bearded and lean, with face lined and interlined by weather and age. At the closed door stood a sentry. From without came raucous laughter and the singing of the soldiers. The sentry nearest Pete told Arguilla that the gringos had been caught sneaking in at the back of the hacienda. Pete briskly corrected this statement. We're from the Ala about the cattle for your army, added Pete, no whit abashed as he proffered this bit of flattery. See. You would talk with the patron then? And Arguilla gestured toward Ortez. We got orders from Brent he's our boss to make our talk to you said Pete, glancing quickly at Brevoort. How did you know that I was here with my army? queried Arguilla. Shucks. That's easy. It's in all the papers, asserted Pete, rather proud of himself, despite the hazard of the situation. Arguilla's chest swelled noticeably. He rose and strutted up and down the room, as though pondering a grave and weighty question. Presently he turned to Ortez. You have heard, saying your? Ortez nodded. And in that nod Brevoort read the whole story. Ortez was virtually a prisoner on his own ranch. The noble captain of liberty had been known to use his best friends in this way. When will the cattle arrive at the Allah? Asked Arguilla, seating himself. Tomorrow, Senor Comandante. That is the word from Sam Brent. And you have come for the money, then? Pete barely hesitated. No. Brent said there ain't no hurry about that. He said you could figure on 200 head Pete recalled Harper's statement and that you would send your agent over to the Allah with the cash. Arguilla glanced at Ortez. You have heard, saying your? Ortez nodded dejectedly. He had heard, but he dare not speak. As the trusted agent of the financiers backing Arguilla, he had but recently been given the money for the purchase of these supplies, and almost on the heels of the messenger bearing the money had come Arguilla, who at once put Ortez under arrest, conveyed the money to his own coffers, and told the helpless Ortez that he could settle with the gringo Brent according to the understanding between them. Brevoort, silently eyeing Arguilla, saw through the scheme. Arguilla had determined to have both the money and the cattle. This explained his unwanted presence at the Ortez Hacienda. Arguilla took a stiff drink of whiskey, 
wiped his mustache and turned to Brevoort. You have heard? He said. Brevoort knew enough Mexican to understand the question. We'll tell Brent that everything is all right, he said easily. But he's a damn liar, he added in an undertone to Pete. Brevoort had made the mistake of assuming that because he did not understand Mexican, Arguilla did not understand English. Arguilla did not hear all of this Brevoort said, but he caught the one significant word. His broad face darkened. These gringos knew too much. He would hold them until the cattle had been delivered and then they could join his army or be shot. A mere detail, in either event, put these men under arrest. He commanded the sentries. If they escape you are dead men. What's the E day began Pete, but the noble captain waved his hand, dismissing all argument, along with the sentries, who marched their prisoners to the stable and told them plainly that they had much rather shoot them than be bothered with watching them, a hint that Pete translated for brief or its benefit. One of the sentries lighted a dusty lantern and, placing it on the floor of a box stall, relieved his captives of their belts and guns. The sentries squatted at the open end of the stall and talked together while Brevoort and Pete sat each in a corner staring at the lantern. Presently Brevoort raised his head. Find out if either of them save American talk, he whispered. You save my talk? queried Pete. One of the sentries turned to stare at Pete. The Mexican shook his head. You're a liar by the watch and your father was a pig and the son of a pig, wasn't he? asked Pete, smiling pleasantly. See, said the Mexican, grinning as though Pete had made a friendly joke. And the other fella there, with ears like the barn door in a wind, he's just not really a horned toad that likes whiskey and would just as soon knife his mother as he would eat a rattlesnake for supper, eh? And Pete smiled engagingly. See, it is to laugh. You say whiskey? The Mexican shook his head. You say damn fool? Pete's manner was serious as though seeking information. Again the Mexican shook his head. He sure don't, said Pete, turning to breathe or or he'd a just not curly plugged me. If a cola don't know what whiskey or damn fool means, he don't know American. Meanwhile the two guards had turned to the natural expedient of gambling for Pete's belt and gun. The elaborately carved holster had taken their fancy. Pete and his companion watched them for a while. Presently Pete attracted breathe Ort's attention by moving a finger. Hear anything? He whispered. I hear a meeting, said Brevoort. He was afraid to use the word horses. Pete nodded. Speak in a V8 an apostrophe you hungry, Ed? Plum empty. But I didn't know it till you asked me. Well, I been feeling round in the hay and right in my corner is a nest full of eggs. There's so doggone many I figure that some of them is getting kind of ripe. Did you ever get hit in the eye with a ripe egg? Not that I recollect. Well, you would if you had. Now I don't know what that swelled up gent in their figures on doing with us. And I don't aim to hang around to find out. These Hercules is gambling for our hosses, right now. It kind of looks to me like if we stayed round here much longer we ain't going to need any hosses or anything else. I worked for a Mexican on and I say them. You got to kind of feel what they mean, and never mind what they are saying. Now I got a hunch that we don't get back to the Alla, never let we start right now. But how and wait a minute. I'm going to dig round like I was going to take a sleep and find these here eggs. Then I'm going to count them not Carol, and pile them handy to you. Then we rig up a deal like we was gambling for them, to kind of pass the time. If that don't get them two coyotes interested, why, nothing will. Next to gambling Nicola likes to watch gambling better than most anything. When you get to win all my eggs, I make a holler like I'm mad. You been cheatin'. And if them two colas ain't settin' with their mouths open and lookin' at us, why, I don't know colas. They're listenin' right now but they don't save. Go ahead and talk like you was a skin me something. What's your game after we start beefin' about the eggs? You pick up a couple and I pick up a couple. First you want to move round so you can swing your arm. When I call you a doggone bald face shorthorn, just let your cola have the eggs plumb in his eye. If they bust like I figure, we got to chank to jump him but we got to move quick. They's a old single tree layin' right close to your elbow, kind of half under the hay. Maybe it'll come handy. I figure to kick my friend in the face when I jump. 
Do I find them eggs? Dig for them, drawled the Texan. If we miss the first jump, then they shoot, and that'll be our finish. But that's a heap better and getting stood up against adobe wall. I just found them eggs. And Pete uttered an exclamation as he drew his hand from the straw behind him, and produced an egg. The Mexicans glanced up. Pete dug in the straw and fetched up another egg and another. Breve Ort leaned forward as though deeply interested in some sleight of hand trick. Egg after egg came from the abandoned nest. The Mexicans laughed. The supply of eggs seemed to be endless. Finally Pete drew out his hand, empty. Let's count them, he said, and straight away began, placing the eggs in a pile midway between himself and his companion. 28. She was a enterprising hen. I'll match for him, said Brevoort, hitching round and facing Pete. I'll go you. And straight away Brevoort and Pete became absorbed in the game, seemingly oblivious to the Mexicans, who sat watching, with open mouths utterly absorbed in their childish interest. Two gringos were gambling for bad eggs. Pete won for a while. Then he began to lose. They're ripe all right. I can tell by the color. Plum ready to bust. The colors saved that. Watch em grin. They're waiting for one of us to bust an egg. That'll be a big joke, and they'll most die a laugh in apostrophe cause it's a joke and cause we're gringos. Then here's where I bust one said Brevoort. Get a couple in your hand. Act like you was choking to death. I'll laugh. Then I'll kind of get the smell of that lame egg and stand up quick. Ready? Shoot, said Pete. Brevoort tossed an egg on the pile. Several of the eggs broke with a faint plop. Pete wrinkled his nose, and his face expressed such utter astonishment, disgust, even horror, as the full significance of the age of those eggs ascended to him that he did not need to act his part. He got to his feet and backed away from those eggs, even as Brave Ort rose slowly, as though just aware that the eggs were not altogether innocent. The two Mexicans had risen to their knees and rocked back and forth, laughing at the beautiful joke on the gringos. Plop exclamation mark plop exclamation mark plop. And three of the four eggs targeted an accurate twelve o'clock. Pete leaped and kicked viciously. His high heel caught one choking Mexican in the jaw just as Breve Ort jumped and swung the single tree. Pete grabbed up his belt and gun. Breve Ort had no need to strike again. You go see if the horses are saddled. I'll watch the door, said Breve Ort. Arguilla was awakened from a heavy sleep by the sound of a shot and the shrill yelp of one of his men. A soldier entered and saluted. The Americans have gone, he reported. Arguilla's bloated face went from red to purple, and he reached for his gun which lay on the chair near his bed. But the lieutenant who had reported the escape faced his chief fearlessly. Arguilla hesitated. Who guarded them? He asked hoarsely. The lieutenant named the men. Take them out and shoot them at once. But, senor comandante, they may not stand. The Americans have beaten them so that they are as dead. Then shoot them where they lay which will be easier to do. Chapter 29 Query Far out across the starlit gloom the two thoroughbreds raced side by side. They seemed to know what was required of them. A mile, two miles, three miles, and the night fire of Arguilla's men was a flickering dot against the black wall of the night. Breve Ort pulled his horse to a walk. We done left him looking at each other, he drawled. Two of them ain't said Pete succinctly. Breve Ort chuckled. I was trying that hard not to laugh when you smelled them eggs, that I come nigh missing my chanked. You sure are some play actor. Play actor nothing. I was doggone near sick. I can not smell them yet. Say, I'd like to know what'll happen to them two colas. Ain't you satisfied with what we done to em? Yep. But arguilla won't be. I'd hate to be in their boots from the south came the faint, sinister pop pop of rifle shots pete turned quickly toward his companion right now he concluded shrugging his shoulders we got trouble of our own said brevoort brent tried to run his iron on us but he got hold of the wrong iron now the deal will have to go through like the spider figured maybe brent knows that arguilla's men are at the ortez and maybe he don't but we don't say 
We write in and report that Ortez says O.K. that his vaqueros are coming for the cattle and that he is coming with the cash. Brent won't bat an eye. I know him. He'll just tell you to take the dough and ride to Sanborn and take the train for El Paso. Then he'll vamos. How's that? Cause he knows that this is the finish. When he was handling stock from south of the line comma in small bunches, and pushing it through fast comma we was all right. The Mexican punchers was doing the stealing, selling the stuff to Brent. And Brent was selling to Arguilla's agent which is Ortez. All Ortez did was pay for it and turn it over to Arguilla. Mexicans was stealing from Mexicans and selling to Brent cheap, cause he paid cash, and Brent was selling it to Mexicans. The fellas that stole the stuff knew better and to try to sell it to Arguilla. All they woulda got woulda been a promise. So they sells to Brent, who bought mighty cheap, but paid real money. That worked fine. But when Brent starts stealing from white men on his side of the line why? He knows that it is the finish so he figures on a big haul or the spider does kind of takes them ranchers up north by surprise and gets away with a couple of hundred head. But he knows, as sure as he's a foot high, that they'll trail him so he forgets that the spider said you was to collect from Mortez and bank the dough and figures on collecting it himself. Kind of a cold deal, eh, Ed? All crooked deals is cold. But I wonder why Brent didn't send me down to the Ortez alone. What did he ring you in for? Brent figured that I'd get wise to his scheme. You see, the understanding with the spider is, that I'm famine of the Allah, case Brent gets bumped off. Maybe the spider thinks I'm square. Maybe he just plays me against Brent to keep us watching each other. I dunno. You figure Arguilla will send old man Ortez over the line with the cash? Yes. He will now. We done spoiled his game by getting loose. But I don't say that Arguilla won't try to raid the Allah and get that money back, after he's got the cattle moving south. You see the high steppers that are back in Arguilla ain't trusting him with a whole lot of cash, personal. Course, what he loots is his. But their money is going for grub and ammunition. They figure if he gets enough cash, he'll quit. And they don't want him to quit. He thinks he's the big smoke but all he is is hired man to big money. He's been played, right along same as us, eh? Same as us. Well, Ed, I don't mind talking a long chank but I sure don't aim to let any man make a monkey of me. Then you want to quit this game, said Brevoort. Why don't you kind of change hosses and take a fresh start? You ain't been in the game so long but what you can pull out. I was thinking of that. But what's a fella going to do? Here we be, riding straight for the Allah. Right soon the sun'll be shining and the hoss is milling round in the corral and getting warmed up, and Brent'll be telling us he can use us helping push them cattle through to the south end, and I reckon we'll change our saddles and get right to work, thinking all the time of quitting, but keeping along with the job just the same. A fella kind of hates to quit any job till it's done. And I figure this here deal ain't even started to make trouble yet. Wait till the T-bar T-outfit gets a going and maybe the Kuncho, and the Blue Range boys. Hand over your canteen a minute, said Brevoort. I lost mine in the getaway. Don found them inside the south line fence. In an hour they were at the Dobie and clamoring for breakfast. The cook told them that Brent was at the north line camp, and had left no word for them. Brevoort glanced quickly at Pete. Evidently Brent had not expected them to return so soon, if at all. After breakfast they sauntered to the bunkhouse, and pulled off their boots and lay down. It was about noon when the cook called them. The bunch is back, he said. Harper just rode in. He says the old man is sore about something. The spider? queried Brevoort. Nope, Sam. Going to ride over? asked Pete, after the cook had left. No. But I'm going to throw a saddle on one of the never sweats and I'm going to pick a good one. I reckon blue smoke'll do for me. You going to pull your freight, Ed? We got our run in orders. The minute old man Ortez hands over the cash, there'll be a hole in the scenery where we was. That's my E-day. But suppose we make it through to El Paso all right. What do we do next? That's kind of like jumping off the edge of the Grand Canyon and a skin yourself what you're going to do while you're in the air. We ain't lit yet. 
End of the Riding Kid from Powder River Part 1